Block 1 Audiobook Title Resume of a Reincarnated Girl 001 to 200 by Little O Translations Part 1 The Reincarnated Girl's Childhood Farm Village Arc 1 Poverty after reincarnation It seems I've died It also seems I've reincarnated I was quite surprised It was all of a sudden On the usual road home from school Crossing over the lights at green I received a great shock that sent me flying No way People fly that easily I didn't know is what I thought at that time Without the expectation of flying I just fell down on the ground Collapsed I checked my legs which were bending in impossible ways and were startled Unexpectedly I was immediately thrown to the ground I checked my feet and saw them twisted in unimaginable ways A person that came up to me noisily shouted shit Someone got run over The person that ran over cried this is bad A person was hit Looks like I've been struck by a car I see That's how it was Once I understood the situation I slowly closed my eyes I was very sleepy That was the last moment of me The 17 year female high school student 17 And now I'm sucking on an average looking woman's boobs Though I'm sucking amazingly hard The milk just doesn't want to come out If I suck like this My face is bound to look like a turtle's But before that This woman's nipples will become so long that they'll set some Guinness world record Sorry But I'm hungry Still even if I continue to suck any more today, milk probably won't come out. I gave up on it and curled up to conserve energy. This woman is probably my mother in this world. I was taken by the car, died and then apparently reincarnated. This woman is my mama after reincarnating. By looking at my mother, I can tell she's not very well off. Her skin is dehydrated, eyes are lifeless, and cheeks are sunken in. Milk isn't coming out because it seems her nutrition isn't enough for that. The inability to produce milk, spells malnutrition for me. That's the last straw. With not even a year, I put on a distanced look. Zero. The previous world's me was, to be frank, well off. Born as single daughter of a big hospital's director. Her beauty taking after her mother. And not only her face, exercises as well and most of all excellent grades. Foo-foo. It's embarrassing to say that about yourself. Not at all. I'm just stating the truth after all. Oh oh ho ho. I was too high spec, treated like the unattainable goal and didn't date a single boy but I also had few friends. I it's not like I have a bad personality at all. Okay. Well, maybe. At any rate, where the hell is this? As far as further and mother's faces and lifestyles are concerned, this isn't my previous life's Japan. The skin color is a white similar to Japanese skin color, but both mother and father are blonde. Their faces look a bit like they're sculpted, but not to a too strong degree. Like a Japanese with a chiseled face who dyed his hair blonde, that kind of feeling. Looking at our house's structure, it's different from Japanese. The roof is even made of straw. We're living in a house made of wood, earth and straw. They're also wearing sandals similar to Japanese ones. The shoes may be similar to Japanese ones, but the clothes are western style. Their t-shirt like clothes are loose at the shirt tails. By the way, I'm only wearing a cloth on my bottom. Come on, show some more consideration. Just because I'm a baby, pants only, I'm a girl, is what I thought. Closed my eyes and started pondering. The world is wide. The world is really wide. But, was there such a country? The past life's me was really smart. I could remember anything I had seen. That's why I thought that looking at my surroundings would lead me to this place's characteristics. But, first of all the language, since it would reveal the specific region, but I failed. They use some words similar to Japanese so I thought that it was just that. But sometimes there are words I've absolutely never heard before. There is also the way they pronounce the words that's similar to English and most importantly the grammar is different from Japanese. It's been a month since I've been born. By listening in on my family's conversations I've already grasped the language's main structure. Moreover, it's a language I've really never heard before. To the global me, that even mastered Arabian, this came as quite a shock. In the first place, 
Japanese is already quite a peculiar language in the world. A language that closely resembles Japanese like this. I've never heard of that. Maybe I'm in a really far future Japan? Japanese evolved further into the language it's now. Oh well, I'll eventually understand it someday. Once I learn to speak, I'll just ask where is this? And who am I? And it'll be fine. And then, I stopped thinking for a moment and decided to nap to swindle my hunger. Farm village arc 2, my name. Wait, that's strange, mom, that one was pretty close. Please worry a bit more about me. Right now I'm being carried on my mom's back. And while having me on her back, she's simultaneously working the field. Every time she swings her hoe, it's almost like her stick is about to hit me. How scary. Hi mom, I don't think you need to lift up your hose that much. Doesn't that tire you out? Every time the mother lifts her hoe, the baby's eyes suddenly open and get nervous. That's me. Some way or another it'll be four months since I've been born. There are some things I understand, but there are still plenty of things I don't. First of all the things I've understood, it seems we're living in a small farming village, but it also seems like we don't have good harvests here, everyone has become thin. This village's name is Garagari Village.1. Who was it that picked this name? Of course the name should reveal something about the character of our village, but that's way too blatant. Go and pick a name that is a bit of a better feeling. The second thing I've come to understand is my own name. My name is Ryu. My family calls me Ryu Chan. At first I thought that it's a fine name for a girl, with a cool feeling, but after hearing my other siblings' names I shuddered. Starting with the eldest, let's introduce my siblings. The eldest Hajian 2, 13 years old. The second boy, Jiru 3, 12 years old. The third boy, Saburu 4, 10 years old. The fourth boy, Mara 5, 6 years old. The fifth boy, Sha 6, 3 years old. Everyone, have you noticed? They're the eldest of easy to understand and simple names, but the fourth name is Maru. Going with the previous flow, the name should be Shiro 7. Is what I want to say, but Maru. And the next is Sha. And I'm Ryu. I was really taken aback when I noticed it. In other words, the naming sense of my parents spins the following story. At the beginning it was Hajime. Jiru, Saburu, just like you would count. However, with the birth of the fourth, the story changed to let's stop with having kids, and they named him Maru, as in full stop, the punctuation mark. And with the birth of another one, it became this time, please no more kids. And Sha had his name bestowed upon. Nevertheless, another child was born. That's why I'm named Ryu, as in Shari U8. When I noticed this, I was shocked. Cool, I like it is what I first thought about my name. I wish I had never noticed. Damn it, sometimes I hate my own greatness. Oh well, it's no use thinking like this. That's my name. The meaning of the it is one thing, but since it sounds pretty well let's just forget about the meaning. Yay. Even so my parents keep me at their side, with the excuse to keep me from crying, and go at it every night. H hey, I'm right beside you. You know, my eldest brother is watching very excitedly and through the slit at the door as well. It's pointless to say you'll stop in the names of your children, if you don't actually stop. Be a bit more mindful. Just what kind of name is the next child going to get? If a brother or sister does come out, I'll give them a name. With a bit of fame for having an irresponsible naming sense, my parents have an irresponsible lifestyle too. First of all. I don't think they fit the farmer type at all. Their way of growing crops is quite sloppy. That's why growing crops isn't going well in Garigari village and my young self can't do anything about it. How frustrating. Even though I understand the language, without trained muscles I still can't properly pronounce anything. When I tried to talk it only sounded like obu obu. I'm such a burden. Even though my older three brothers are already helping out in the fields. Seems like in this village children enter the workforce around their 10th birthday. So my three oldest brothers are all helping out with fieldwork already, to keep them from becoming a hindrance. All other kids that aren't ten yet play together outside, but a baby like me, that can't play with the others, is bound to her mother's back. You 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 un, I need to start moving, as soon as possible. Hurry, move, my body, wake up, is what I shout in my heart, but it's no use, as to why I'm in such a hurry. 
This family is just truly poor. I do want to help my brothers and parents, but it's ultimately for my own sake. I don't really want to think too much about it, but reducing the mouths to feed, basically getting rid of children that don't pull their own weight, like me, by killing them or selling them. I'm a bit worried about that. It might just be my imagination, but sometimes my mother's look towards me is scary. Seriously, and older than me. It's all boys. My parents don't give a the oh, first time we have a daughter vibe at all either. It's probably because, well it's most likely that kind of thing. That's why I have to appeal my usefulness. Otherwise things might get ugly. Let's start with learning how to walk and talk before my first birthday. So don't be rash mother. I'm a girl who shit scold. 1. This name translates to something along skin and bones village, as in they're severely underweight. I'll be sticking to Garagari though, since there will be a few more name related jokes incoming. Garagari sounds a lot more welcoming than skin and bones village too. This isn't about necromancers after all. 2. This means start or beginning. 3. Written second and son. 4. 5. 6. Means end, final. 7. 8. Farm village arc 3, my first river debut. Another chapter, the longest one so far. Several parts where you shouldn't forget that Garagari and skin and bones mean the same thing tilde. In the middle of being impatient I've finally become 8 months old. Using words, even walking have been a success. Congratulations, me. But when walking, I can't let my guard down since my head is still too heavy. Balance is important, balance is. I'm also still lisping a bit, however my teeth have already grown, so I'm able to properly speak with others. Since passing my first birthday I've been waiting for an opportunity to go outside and called out to the back of my brother that was heading outside. Sh, I want to go outside with my big brother, a blonde-headed child from Garagari village. My brother Shun, is now 4 years old. He's not working yet, but rather plays with the other children and picks up firewood or draws water occasionally. I want to join that group. Hey, you can't do it yet. You'll be tired super fast. While picking his nose, he makes a face like he really doesn't want to do it. This brat, with a show you commie, treat me a little bit more nicely. Oh well, what Sha said is the truth so I can't really say anything back. Sure I can walk. But I've got no endurance, I've just been born after all, it's alright, isn't it? Even if you get tired, I'll just carry you on my back, will you, won't you go outside with me? That's when a warm voice descends from heaven, w what an angel, this angel like child glittering as if he had a halo is Mario, 7 years old, even though you're just skin and bones, you're amazing, after overhearing Sha and my conversation. Throwing me a lifeboat and the making my eyes sparkle I nodded my head. Then mum, today, you is coming with us too. We're off. Whilst mother was already working the field, she called out to her and the sibling trio of the end triumphantly departed, joining with the other kids of the village. We arrived at the riverside. We're about 15 people. The youngest me and the next one would be the snot-nosed kid, she. In general the kids were between 7 and 9 years old. Before me. The youngest was Sha. Usually they play around the outskirts of this river. By the way, right after leaving home my stamina hit its limits and Mario is already carrying me. To her hero. Sha is picking his nose making an I told you so face, while I pretend not to know. He he, coming this far. It's my win! Exclamation mark. After discovering me, the new member, the village children approached me with a very curious impression. How old are you? Can you talk? Wow, my brother can't do it at all, etc, etc and so forth, saying their impressions they touched my little, adorable hands. Foo fa foo, small and adorable ha, huh? I'm missing the usual roundness of a baby, but, I'm also a member of Garagari village, actually, everyone is just skin and bones, maybe you can only join Garagari village if you're Garagari? We're so close to the river. Why not catch some fish? Picking wild herbs could also be possible, since we're close to a mountain. Let's all take in some more nutrition. Hey everyone, what do you do here? Catch some fish? I threw my innocent question at them. However the surrounding kids stare blankly for a second but then break into a huge laughter. No way. The river has deep places and is dangerous, 
Fish are fast and even if you catch them, they're slippery so you can't catch them. You says some interesting things. Why are they laughing at me so much? You're not supposed to catch them with your hands. Nets, fishing lines, you're supposed to use tools. Aren't there some kind tools? No way, there are only tools for fields. Saying that, the girls before me all went right? In sync. G R R R. that right? was cute, but shouldn't you just make some simple tools? Doesn't the village mayor have some tools for catching fish? I don't know who the village mayor is though, it doesn't have to catch many, M maybe try making something simple? I tried asking timidly. I mean, they laugh at me each time I ask a question. Just a baby that doesn't understand anything, that kind of look, exclamation mark. I'm just saying it. But mentally I'm actually older than you. I might look like a child, but I've got the brains of an adult. Amazing, huh? And just as thought, the village children break into laughter after hearing my question. Looks like it'll be skipping school, or rather skipping river. Ha ha ha. Great. Making tools. Great. You wants to become a magician. Amazing. Magician, huh? They're totally making fun of me. I don't want to particularly become one anyway. And I never said anything like that, I'm not stupid. I I'll become timid at this rate. Seeing my slightly displeased face and being unable to just stand by, Maru patted my head. Thank you Maru. Thank you, Sniff. This kindness brings me to tears. It's only been a year since Ryu has been born. Don't bully her too much. And listen, yesterday I asked the village mayor and he said it seems that a magician will come by soon. With the shocking and brief words of the nice Maru. HMPF. What kind of magician? Is even my brother going to poke fun at me? Even though he patted my head? Just toying with me? Fine. I'll scram. Ignoring my even more sulky face, the tension of the other kids suddenly rose. Really? Awesome. Well, last time they were here was about two years ago. So it's slowly that time again. The village kids were swelling with excitement. A, eh, what's the meaning of this? What's this? A, eh, bullying? Seeing my baby brows wrinkled, my brother Mario explained it to me. Apparently, this world has the job of magicians, that try to be useful to everyone livelihood. It seems that until now when magicians came, they built a water tank, made slow crops grow up and even watered the fields during draft. Amazing people who solved the troubles of our village. Those are magicians. Hired by the country, settling the problems is even free of charge. In case of personal requests of villagers. They also take care of those if provided with payments. Oh, seriously, they exist, magicians. Awesome, awesome, magicians, is what you thought I'd say? I won't be deceived. Their magicians are probably just people with advanced technology. Don't you agree? I guess it's like that, that magicians would exist, really everyone you're such children, and you just laughed at me, aren't you the childish ones? Isn't that right? Pew pew pew, magicians. But this is a chance. I can finally figure out where this place actually is. I asked further about the name of this country before and his answer was Kasar. What's that? I've never heard that before. Or rather, it doesn't exist. As such, I didn't figure out anything. But people with advanced technology probably know a lot about the world. I should just ask them. Ask about the things I don't understand. And that soon. Ah, won't you hurry, magicians. Pew pew dot won't you come? Ah, but before that let's make some tools for catching fish, as well as baskets to fill with mountain herbs. I hate being hungry. Farm village arc 4, anti-hunger plan. Geez, it took me forever to translate this one. The link and the footnote are two different things, please keep that in mind. I still haven't solved these things in an elegant way. Enjoy. Farm Village Arc 4. Anti-Hunger Plan. The next day Maru asked me if I wanted to go to the riverside again, but I politely refused. I it's not like I'm being bullied at all, alright? It's because I still have things to do, but eight-year-old girls are kinda scary. Sniff. I'm just a precious young girl. After that, I sent my two elder brothers off and entered the storehouse, right next to us, saying excuse me and opening the door. Jiru was threshing the previously harvested rice with a rock. He's really threshing the rice with a rock, leaving a near of rice on a large rock and holding another big one in his hand. 
He's shaving the rice off. The first time I saw this spectacle was when mother was carrying me on her back. I was shocked. What's this? The Stone Age, is what I thought. I kinda guessed by looking that there aren't any electronic goods, like no telephone poles, but I did assume they would have a thousand seed thresher. That's why the previous harvest still isn't threshed. Just what is with this village? As if they threw away all their civilized convenience. Just when I thought that, I looked left and right in the village and thought how was that made? For example, a water tank. Everyone calls it stone for water. A one meter square, carved into the stone that catches rain water for domestic use. Particularly surprising was, that it wasn't made of concrete but basalt like hard stone and seemed gouged out. Which reminds me of what the girls said, that it was someone calling themselves magician that made this tank. This time, let's ask the so-called magician, Pew Pew Pew, casually asking about things things they don't understand is a child's right after all. But before the magician comes, I've still got things to do. Calling out to the diligently threshing Jeru I said, can I have some straw? Oh, and can I be here too? Upon which Jeru looked at me with a bewildered face and nodded deeply. Jeru doesn't really talk much. Even though we live together, I haven't really heard his voice that often. He's the silent kind of boy. He's got blonde hair, but otherwise looks simple. I've gotten permission. So I grabbed some threshed straw bundles and just sat down where I could. The goal is making a tool to catch fish, if I'm not mistaken, making something with small holes that open and setting it up in the river would allow fish to come in, then making it so that they can't get out again should be a trap for small fish. Making something like that should be easy. Even though I can imagine the complete thing, I've never made anything with straw. So first I'll make a pair of straw sandals. I've made cloth sandals in elementary school once after all. That time it was cloth, but doing the same with straw should work. Once I've gotten used to knitting straw, I'll make fish traps, chaotically pursuing trial and error, then losing strength because of an empty belly. It took about 10 days to make one trap for small fish, one small basket for carrying mountain herbs and a straw hat. It wasn't a huge trouble. But as a one-year-old child I've used up my strength countless times and slept like a log. Actually I mainly slept. After all, sleeping brings up a child well. So sleeping totally my job. And with that, I asked Maru to take me to the riverside again. With the new straw sandals and straw hat. Since it's a rice straw hat, it's hard compared to a wheat straw hat and it's irritatingly pickling. I might have failed. Concerning the fish basket. Everyone in my family asked what it was. That's what the reaction was, but as for the sandals and the basket they were greatly shocked and father even asked me to make a few for him. Whenever those are needed, they buy from from peddling merchants. They've got straw right at their feet, what a waste. Usually they use straw to reinforce the houses, since they're made of straw, laying it on top like mats and it seems the rest is just burned. If the Martini ghost one comes out. It's not my problem. So when we, the sibling trio of the end arrived at the riverside, most other village children were there as well. Looking at my sandals and hat they were chattering about them. My sandals got in our that's nice kind of jealous reaction, but my hat didn't. Well, I got to admit it's pretty uncool. This thing, it doesn't do anything, other than being irritating. It's kinda shaped like Kasajisu's hat too. Still, to keep my skin white. A tan is taboo. A woman that doesn't choose her ways for beauty, that's me, you, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. After enjoying the opinion meeting on my sandals and hat, I set up the traps in the river. The traps are of course my night shift less traps for small fish. I put some stones into them and sunk them into the river. When I come again tomorrow, they will be full with small fish. Probably. Listen Mario. I want to go to the mountains. After reaching the first stage of catching fish, I called out to my kind brother. Sha is playing something like tag with the other kids. Mountains? Why do you want to go to the mountains? I want to catch some things to eat at the mountains. Put them into the new baskets. I tried looking with the best upturned and encouraging eyes. Well I probably don't have to. My kind brother Maru will probably come with me anyway. That's what I thought. However, what? I was refused. The mountains are dangerous. Kids can't go there alone. There are monsters there after all. 
That's the point my brother made. What? Monsters? Is some more fantasy mixed in there? Like with the magicians, it's probably just wild dogs or a bear, right? Saying something like monsters. Pura puri. This is supposed to sound angry. Well, either way a place with bears or wild dogs might be dangerous for children to go alone. Just a little to the surroundings of the mountain. I've kind of want to say that, but let's give up. Besides, there should be edible wild grasses around this riverside as well. I'll just be patient for now. Then, will you come and pick some eatable grasses around the river? Sure. But are there are any wild grasses like that? Can you tell that? Before, when I made the sandals, Jeru taught me. Yeah, when a one-year-old child suddenly tells you that's edible and that isn't, it's scary right? That's way too suspicious. I messed up. Just like that I used the name of that silent boy. Please forgive me Jeru. Like that, Maru, saying something like did Jeru know lots about grasses, caved into my request and we went to harvest some wild grasses. I love my kind brother. There were quite a few edible wild grasses at the riverside, dandelions, watercress. Japanese mugwort, fleabane, and jersey cudweed. Picking based on the information of a picture book I've read in my previous life. Outside of watercress and Japanese mugwort, I haven't eaten any of these. I knew you could eat dandelions, but I didn't think I'd actually ever eat them. But the current me was different. If it can fill my belly, then I'll eat anything. That's the condition I was in. Just a while after we started picking, the small bag was already full, so we took an afternoon nap and went home together. In our retreat, mother made porridge with just a little bit of dry rice and I had mother put in bit of the grasses. I've already escaped from the milk life. I mean, there's just no milk coming out. So it's baby food right now. Or rather, everyone in the family is on baby food dear right now. At the beginning mother made an is it edible? It's safe right question mark kind of expression. But when I vaguely said that the other villagers are eating it too, she obediently put the grasses in the pot. That day's dinner, the porridge with with the soup stock of wild grasses, had a taste of nourishment that spread to all corners of the body. I was relieved as my other family members all ate with a satisfied expression. Finally, we'll eat fish tomorrow. Probably. 1. Developed in 1982. The Mortainai ghost was a mascot to prevent people from throwing away food they didn't like. It was published with that. It's still referenced here and there. 2. Reference to a myth with relation to the figure. Farm Village Arc 5. It was a new village. Took me a while again, but here is another chapter. I'm going to try to increase my pace to two chapters a week at least before university starts again. So look forward to that. Ho 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 ho. This much is good. Lots of them, though they're small. My fish trap was a great success. They're about as big as an adult's thumb, but there is ten of them in the basket. Seeing the insides of the basket, Sho and Mayu were rooted on the spot. The village children saw that from afar and gathered around me, saying they wanted to catch fish by themselves as well. After telling them to bring all the straw from home they can carry tomorrow and that we'll make it here together, they finally calmed down. The children were making a commotion saying how awesome and great I am, while I was grinning broadly. Gahahi. Yes, yes. It's no trouble. Masses, praise me more. I was in a great mood. So I taught the children which wild grasses were edible. After which they were making another commotion about how awesome and great I am. Yes, yes. It's no problem. T. After going home and showing my mother and further the cord fish, they were delighted. Mother, father. You can praise me even more, you know? I'm your precious daughter, aren't I? Aren't I? You fu fu. That day's dinner had both fish and wild grasses in it. Fish bones are scary, so I didn't eat any. But the fish soup stock did its job so it was really delicious. The best thing I've eaten in my life so far. Though I've only been living for about a year. After that, I made more traps for small fish, sandals and baskets together with the other village children while teaching them. As these days continued, while kindly and thoroughly explaining the ways to knit straw to the village children, one of them said this, couldn't it be that Ryu is a magician? Dot. Everyone in the surroundings immediately become noisy. That's right, that could totally be, was everyone's reaction. Is that right? 
I might just be one, I've got all kinds of knowledge and technologies after all, it's from my previous life, in this pioneer-like village I might just become one, you few foo if magicians equals people with advanced technology, then it's no exaggeration to call me one, chichen pua pui exclamation mark one, but my dad said that if your mom or dad weren't magicians, then you couldn't become a magician, so only nobles can. He, so it's like that. HMPF, there are nobles in this country, which also means that there is royalty and a prince. I kinda want to take a look at that prince. Still, if magicians are nobles then in this country magic, I mean, advanced technology, pew pew pew, and knowledge are something monopolized by the strong and influential. I mean, there is no school in this village. They can talk, but they can't read or do maths. Even worse, this is a farm village but they don't know how to cultivate crops or everyday wisdom. They don't know anything. They're adults limited to being children. That's the really mysterious part. How have the people of this village lived until now? Perhaps this village open for development. Wanting this land to be newly cultivated. They gathered a bunch of people who don't know anything about cultivation is the only thing I can think of. The people living in this village are all basically young couples with children, the so-called nuclear families, grandpas or grandmas. Those elderly figures full with wisdom are missing. Since when does this village stand? After the discussion of nobles and magicians calm down one degree, Thinking it's finally my time I boldly asked the question that has been burning on my mind for a long time, then again it's just been a year since about five years ago. Before that, we were carrying stones to a magician building a castle. The one who answered was the oldest here, Ra. He'll be ten years old soon, so there are plans for him to start working the field soon. Oh, it's like that. Then the adults of this village were building a castle. That's amazing. Since I was coming closer to the true identity of this farming community, I excitedly answered, it was work related to civil engineering. The magician is the amazing one, mom and dad just carried stones, but with magic, a magician can make anything. Seriously? Magicians are pretty impressive. Or rather, this country monopolizes technology and knowledge way too much. What a an impressive cover up of technology, why would you go that far in covering it up? Are you corrupt? And on top of that not afraid of rebellions? After which the older older boys started to voice their complaints. Anyway, when they were helping to build the castle, we weren't this hungry. Field work sure is difficult. If the Lord would cultivate the land, plant seeds and give water we could harvest crops, is what I heard, but further also said that it's different from what was promised. Apparently when still helping to build the castle, food and so on were still properly provided, but the castle was finished and they lost their jobs. To find the people who lost their work a workplace, they were offered to live as farmers and reclaim lands. That time they were given a minimum amount of tools and seeds and told that they just had to sow the seeds. For a few years the country supplied them with food and so on but about two years ago those provisions stopped. Paying a part of their crops as tax, the rest would be theirs to keep since they wouldn't need any more food, that kind of thing. I thought the villagers were an irresponsible bunch, including my parents, but if it's the country that was irresponsible then I can kinda understand it. But this time when the magician comes, the village mayor wants to discuss the crop failure with him. Then he'll do something with magic and on top of that we'll eat fish and wild grasses from now on. We'll be able to as much as we want. Is what Mary suddenly said with a lot of passion. Everyone is nodding in agreement with his words. That's right, the first priority should be on eating your fill. Let's stop being Garagari village and become Pokari 2 village. 1. This is supposed to be a magical incantation like pain. Pain go away. 2. This means plum poor chubby, Tensai Shu Ono Rai Rika Show Chapter 6, got an issue with the chapter? Feel free to take it and publish it yourself after fixing it yourself, I am in no way taking this up as a project. This chapter from this series is merely a one-time thing that was done on a whim. Only a promotion to bring new people to pick this up, reopened commenting. Farming village arc 6 3 years old and learning about the world, after 2 years, the roundabout fraud like Magician Sama is here. Finally, Magician Sama has visited our Gary Gary village. Too slow. 
There were rumors of them supposedly arriving soon, that began around two years ago. It is a conversation from the village's adults. It seems that because of some type of civil war they had been severely delayed. But isn't two years too long of a wait? I am already three years old. Three piece desu, in these past two years of mine, an emphasis was placed on the Pochari village project to revitalize the Gary Gary village. First of all, small fry weren't the only fish. It seems big fish can be caught as well. By applying the same principle used to trap young fish, wood was inserted into the middle of the river to make a fence. The fish trapping enclosure is made from a web of straw which improves upon the original fish trap. There were noticeable results. It was able to reach the point to where dishes of big fish could be served at the dining table. In addition, a simple thousand tooth threshing machine was manufactured from thick wood since strength was needed for the task. I primarily gave out gave out instructions, so it has the feeling that Mario Anchin and Jiro Anchin were the ones that basically made it. Thanks to this pseudo thousand tooth threshing machine, threshing work was done with remarkable ease. As it was lent to the denizens of the Gary Gary village, threshing work in the village is completed with great speed. Because of that there is more time to spare, not only for the children, but even adults were able to begin knitting straw sandals or baskets, any surplus that have been made is sold to the traveling merchant San, finally, at last, this rural life seems to be over with, and now for the unveiling of the first place great discovery, a leguminous plant that was found by the riverside, with a vine-like plant, once it grows into maturity a bean that is slightly smaller than an average soybean. When I tried to eat it after planching it for a long time, it had a very immature taste when compared to a soybean. Leguminous plants are filling and are high in nutritional value. With a bit of perseverance, soy milk, miso and soy sauce won't just be a dream. It is the plant of dreams. However, there is one thing, the harvest of the field has had no progress. Rather it has worsened from growth. There are no paddy fields in this village. The fields grow a type of dry land rice for cultivation. It is harder than the rice eaten in the previous life. Well, it is still rice. I can't hate it. This dry land rice, it had very great and significant growth in the beginning, but it was a fact that each year the growth was less and less. I dimly, or should I say that I am completely confident, that I already understand the cause. It is a term that is derived from social studies class. Continuous cultivation disorder. This is it. This might be its perfect name don't you agree? There is no winter in this region. Does it become slightly chilly? To an extent, field work practically never stops and as soon as there is a harvest, seeds are sown again. With such a combination it is natural for the soil's balance to deteriorate. However, I don't have a particular countermeasure for this repeated cultivation disorder. After all, everyone in the village just says something along the line with the traveling magician's armor will do something about it. I am getting more and more interested in this magician's armor that has this overall trust. Fortunately, thanks to the fish and wild grasses, the hunger problem seems to be okay. Now I decided to see about the state of the fields. What the heck will you do uncertain magician Sama? Foo fa foo, interesting. Will you be prepared with fertilizer? Will the soil be dug up from a deep place? Or perhaps, with flood control, they may make a rice paddy. This is interesting, hurry up and arrive, magician. With more than a passing though, today is finally the day, magician Sama is finally going to arrive in the village. How impolite to keep a lady waiting. And thus, with the arrival of the magician Sama came two persons. One was very tall, a man with red hair, perhaps in his early twenties, with well-defined eyebrows that makes the person have the air of being gallant and strong-willed. The other person, a blonde, its coloration is even lighter in comparison to the blonde hair of one's own family. It is somewhat of an elegant feeling, a boy, the age seems to be in the teens. Because it is still young the features are neutral. But it seems to be that of a male, the hair is grown out, and tied behind the back, they seem somewhat nervous, with the middle of the forehead wrinkled. Yup, either way, both of them are very good looking. I, for the moment, resemble my mother's more plain face. Beautiful people are very dazzling, however I only have a simpler face right now. A woman can change themselves at any time. Cuteness can be made, 
Nevertheless as for the appearances of the magician Sama that arrived in the village, they were encompassed by long and heavy robes like for formal wear, it is something really fitting for a genuine magician, is it cosplay? I mean, to be honest, I thought that some type of skilled Ojizn type person would come, young people coming was a surprise, I can't believe that these youngsters have the knowledge and technology to do something about this worn out field. If I had to guess, those people over there are probably the escorts of the magician. Clad in iron armor were knight like middle aged men. They seemed to be dependable. I mean to say, this knight like appearance, it was the first time seeing it since birth. By the way, right now I, along with my older brothers, are peeping from the gap of the door. Presently, the magician party by the entrance of the village, with the bald village mayor that person is the mayor, were exchanging greetings while stealthily being watched from one's house, it seems like the formal greetings have ended, the mayor took the magician along with him and began to present the village's fields, a belt of farmland extends from the village at the center, its shape forms around our house in turn, the grown-ups are going about outside, the magician is now in the flow of receiving a welcoming, perhaps we, the children of the village can also do the same, I am sure of it from peeping through the crevice of the window and the crack between the door, while the mayor is showing the field, he frowns and shakes one's head from side to side, perhaps, this field is useless, and it completely can't grow anything at all at probably what is being said, then, the red-haired magician had, after a composed nod crouched down, touched the earth with his hands while looking at the fields, started to move his mouth. Can you even see the quality of the soil from doing that? With a pose similar to the starting race crouch. Perhaps this a get ready. Get set, go signal to start. I personally think it is pointless. What cheers were being heard? In a fluster. The field was seen, the dry land rice. They were steadily growing. Seriously, what is this? Right now the dry land rice plants are growing with a dancing slithering motion. What kind of thing is this? A. Eh? What is going on here? What is this strange scene? Um, pause. C. B. Exclamation mark. Hey, perhaps this might be. By any chance, magicians are genuine magicians. Dot dot can it be? So, in other words, a reincarnation into different world? the so-called dot dot swords and magical fantasy, I had read about these from the previous life, while recollecting the stories and movies of the fantasy genre, my three-year-old self had finally understood the current state of reality, agricultural village arc 7, the mage finally came, loading, I could just be a mage, there was a period that I thought so, come on, I thought that mage equals a person who has technologies from advanced countries, right, that, what is that? I could barely hear what he had said though. Once he spoke of an incantation sort of language, the crops started to grow. What is that magic so fantastic? The delicious fish dish in front of me was so shockingly good that it is unacceptable to even criticize it. Currently, my village is holding a banquet to welcome the arrival of the mage Samas. The villagers did not own a building that could fit many people at once so they had to make do with a flat land near the village and held a campfire-like event by setting up a fire. Tables and chairs were prepared and the villagers began their merrymaking. Pre-ordered wine that was imported from somewhere was taken out for the occasion. Also, the villagers' song and dance Anichans were diligently attending to the mage Samas, or more like, the Anichans were feasting their eyes. Well, I could sort to understand. Both the mages were beautiful, nevertheless. To the mage Samas, the village's song and dance girls couldn't even make it in the qualifiers, so their attitudes towards the hospitality was rather cold. With a nonchalant face, they received their wines from the dancing girl that had poured it for them. Are they trying to say rural girls are lacking? Right at the start of the feast, the mages had done a simple self-introduction to everyone. The senior one who has red hair was Seki equals Nanawazu San, a spirit user. The other one was a long hair youth, a magician called Ryuki equals Ujikawa san. Among mages, there seem to be something that is different between magicians and spirit users. I don't quite get it though. I mean, is it alright because all I see is the 10 plus years old young mage drinking alcohol? 
I wonder if it is because it is another world that the common sense here is different from mine. The elites of the Garagari village seem to be in a defeated state but, at least the visitors were pleased with the village's prided cooking. While the village chief received good comments about the dishes, he was widening his mouth and putting food in. Well, it is tasty after all, the dishes were grilled herb fish, which ingredients were just harvested today, as a main, whereas the soup was made from fry stock with watercress and beans, a wild vegetable salad, and finally, noodles made with the stem of dandelions, needless to say, I am the one that cooked the rice and fish together, the village only his salt, so in order to enhance the taste, I obtained fish stock and used herbs creating a unique and profound taste. Ha! I observed the mages from a relatively close distance, and heaved a sigh of relief as it seems that they have not noticed me nor their surroundings. I was suspected of being mage in this village, and was thus, made to take a seat that was close to the mages' sama. The villagers would eventually choose a suitable time to inquire to the mages' sama whether I was a mage. What shall I do? They definitely would ask about it. My dad and mum who sat near me were already fidgeting in their seats like mad. Stop. Don't be so nervous. Stop staring at me with eyes full of expectations. According to the village chief, if a mage is born from a commoner, the entire family would be invited to stay at the capital, and would be promised an entire life of peace and prosperity. Also, since this village is a under the territory of the aristocrats, it would be a life comparing with my current lifestyle, which offers more conveniences. Ku, the dazzling gaze from my parents are painful. But, to put it clearly, I am not a mage. Up till today, the villagers were still telling me that I could just be a mage. When they said that, I would reply it can't be, can't be, for me to be one dash, impossible, you few foo. Seeing that there is some tension, the not at all bad Ryu Chan would appear though. When I knew that a mage is a mage, no more like, when I understood that this was a different world, I have vehemently declared that definitely not a mage, 100% not. What a failure. New Chan the failure, I'm afraid of betraying the expectations of my parents. Even so, this village seems to be prosperous, despite the kind of condition the fields are in right now, everyone's complexion looks good, I didn't think that such great food could be prepared. The red hair spirit user Seki-san was helping himself to the food and appeared to be real surprised. While chatting with the village chief, you see the truth is, the kids in the village have been catching fishes in the nearby river and discovering edible wild grasses too. We did not, frankly speaking, do much harvesting in the fields but, thanks to that, we were able to live more comfortably than before. Honestly. The current situation is that we are sustaining ourselves daily not with the harvest from the fields but from the foraging of the kids, the villagers kids. That's amazing. How did they catch those fishes? To the question posed by the red hair mage, the village chief smiled with a broad grin, and started clapping his hands. The village chief is more exuberant than I thought. After the signal, the males, with heavy footsteps, moved the small fry trap and the pseudo thousand teeth too and then, the village chief looked in my direction and nodded vigorously. At last, it might turn to show up. Loading, Agricultural Village Arc 8, Judgment Time Dash. Loading. Here is the young lady that I certainly wish to introduce to both mages, Sama. She might be small but, for the sake of this village's development, she has invented several tools. Please do listen to this child for the story of how she invented the fish capturing tool and advanced this village's development. Next, at a comfortable pace, I walked over to introduce myself to the mages. Nice to meet you, I am you from the Garagari village, I'm three this year. Please allow me to explain about the tools. The mages gave an astonished look as they looked upon me. To think that this three years old could be so fluent in the language and that the village chief wasn't kidding when he said the child was really just a kid, such could be seen from the amazement on their faces. It's okay to be trembling in fear. I, who seemed to be possessed by a god, had presentation skills that had more worth than the mages. My parents have got to see me in action. And then, I gestured with my hand and said without any stutter on the workings of the small fright trap, and with the application of this design, it could be used to catch bigger fishes, 
Next, I explained about the thousand teeth thresher and also mentioned how it can be improved. I see, due to the application of the thousand teeth thresher, work hours have been shortened and with that extra time, more straw can be braided. In addition, with the tools made with straw, fish or wild grasses can be gathered. That's wonderful. We need to spread this to other agricultural villages. The young mage Ryuki started to get into a state of excitement and started touching the thousand teeth thresher and straw made tools. Viewing the tools at all sorts of angles, he confirmed the inner workings of these tools. For a guy with a reserved face to be that excited doesn't he know basic manners, that he shouldn't be touching the items on display without permission. They aren't really display items though. Even then, he seemed to be intensely studying the tools. I wonder if it would be better if I gave an explanation. The plant straw is a symbol of bountiful harvest too, and lumber is also part of a plant. These are farming tools after all. Since I wish to document the creation of these inventions, village chief, how many stalks of straw you might have and how much timber do you have? Could you provide some? The mage Ryuki san said so while creating a tense atmosphere since nobody understood his intentions, the village chief proceeded with his request. The village chief was taken aback by such a sudden request, and while fretting over the request, he called out to a nearby woman to bring roughly ten bundles of straw and some wood sticks. Ryuki san picked out three stalks of straw and started singing something. In Atsukuba Kakaru Akatu Wokoi Ohimoka Tonon Akugoga Dorit Naj Kamu. Amatsuke's Kumana Kale Hiji Fukito Gio Ottomana Sugata Shibashito Mimu. After doing so, the straw that Ryuki san was holding on to started moving on their own and before you it. It became a small fright trap. Ooh. Mage Sama's abrupt magical performance was met with enthusiastic cheers from the village. I got very excited as well. You know, this thing is real awesome. What a mage huh? Furthermore, to have completed it with only three stalks of straw. How did he do it with so little? Unbelievable. Next, as though he couldn't hear the excitement from the crowd, Ryan Kisan grabbed the timber and pierced onto the ground while also singing something like an incantation. The timber grew larger and became a completed thousand teeth thresher that was far more well done than the one I, in actuality, it was Mayana Chan who made it, made. The villagers became wild yet again. Seriously? Somehow, my feelings have transcended amazement, anger, jealousy. This is quite the strong sense of helplessness. This thousand teeth thresher took us great pains to complete. Not only did I injured my arm for this. Actually it was my bro, my hands were also roughed up by it. Actually it was my bro, and I spent many nights on it too. Actually it was my bro, despite it taking so much time. Even though it looks kinda unrefined, I did it as conscientiously as possible dash. Actually it was my bro. The mage managed to get it done in the twinkle of an eye. Furthermore, it was better made. G-I-L-G-I. My insides of my heart were squirming in bitterness. And even as I sent a destructive beam across, the mage Ryuki-san doesn't seem to be bothered by it and gave me a smile that was full of enjoyment while walking over to me. Thank you. This tool is really wonderful, with something like this, this fledging industry should be able to flourish. I desperately suppressed my twitching cheeks as I conveyed the idea that so long as it is useful then it is a good thing. Next, the village chief that has been watching attentively the flow of events started to make his move. Dear Mages Sama, I'm sure that after looking at these tools and understanding them, you would come to the conclusion that this child is really intelligent. It has been said in the village that she could just be a mage. What should be done? The atmosphere grinded to a halt instantly. It's because the villagers are immensely curious about whether Yu Chan could possibly be a mage. I see. Indeed, to be able to come up with such a tool does indicate some rare talent. Magic manifests itself on people mainly through heredity but, there are times when a village far from the capital would have a child born with strong magic powers. I shall investigate further. Hearing what the village chief had just said, the spirit user Seki coolly bowed his head in assent, and gestured for me to follow him. The time for judgment has finally arrived. Speaking of which, after watching Yuki-san skillfully using magic, how can there be people who still think I can use magic? They are totally mistaken, 
fundamentally wrong. I and magic completely don't match, as I thought. The villagers and parents were beaming at me with sparkling eyes that were full of hopes and aspirations. Coo, it's no good, they have yet to have given up. Stop staring at me with those glittering eyes, however, I have no choice. I slowly moved my feet over to Seki the spirit user. Loading, agricultural village arc 9 The things that I can do. Loading, can you see what's on my shoulder? As I approached Seki-san. He pointed out to his right shoulder and asked me. Hey, there is nothing on his shoulders though, just plain air, am I supposed to be seeing something? This could be a criterion for a mage, just to be safe. I took a good long look at it, but I still couldn't see anything. Nope, sorry, there seems to be nothing. Is that so? Well then, how about checking on Yuki, the subject of the conversation? Yuki-san, nodded deeply. And after staring in a distance for a second, he held up his right hand. What do you see on this side? I tried taking a look at Yuki san's right hand. Likewise, there wasn't anything, just empty space. I don't see anything special. Do you not see a glittering light? I knew mages would be able to perceive something there. A glittering light, huh? Still, I can't see it. Sorry. It's just normal to me. Is that so? Yuki-san murmured to himself while giving a complete disappointed look. Similarly, Seki-san's face looked like a disappointed one. I understand what's going on. I understand but. Seki-san put on the mysterious face that TV hosts would put on before a big reveal, and announced the verdict. Village chief. Unfortunately, this child isn't a mage. Triple underscore eight older. The villagers strongly sighed and their dejected voices could be heard. Even the chief's shoulders started to slump down, I was kinda afraid to even look at the reaction of father and mother. Dash dash. The banquet was over, and on the very same day, the village chief provided a vacant house for the mages to stay for a night before traveling again. The mages were compelled by the country to follow a messy schedule so they had to leave after one night. Also, they wanted to spread to other villages what they saw in this village, the groundbreaking farming tools that were made by Ryu Chan. Dot. Speaking of which, are the fields all right now? The mages came and made the crops grow all of a sudden but, have they made any changes to the quality of the soil? I am thinking of making full use of the information of my previous life to improve the quality of life for the villagers, it might be possible. However, it is possible that this world may have no need for such scientific knowledge and information. It's like with magic, this world is complete. Somehow, I felt like the purpose in my life was lost. My heart aches. Still, even then, there should be something I can do. If I work hard at what I can do, I can make my family, the villagers and everyone else happier. I have no doubt that I would be happier this life. Loading. Agricultural Village Arc 10 Experiment and an Unexpected Visitor Loading, and thus, the mages left and many months flew by, as I predicted, or more like. Somehow, the fields were indeed infertile. What in the world is this? The soil quality didn't show any signs of improvement. And we didn't even plant any crops after that too. After the mages managed to speed up the growth of the plants, we harvested it, retilted the land removed the weeds, and replanted, however, similar to the situation beforehand, or more like, to a greater extent, it seems that the plants are unable to grow. Wow, a mage is so great, if I could be a mage. I was seriously harboring such thoughts yet this is such a letdown, it is a tragic loss, the magic by the mages only had a temporary effect. Thus, magic isn't really all that omnipotent. After all, the very act of magic is performed by humans, it probably isn't a complete thing. Somehow, I feel a slight affinity to mages. Both the mages managed to look cool even after their Ikaman masks were taken off, but at the end of the day, they are still human. Gufafu. I have no idea why but my chest is feeling all tight. The Garagari village was again vexing over the issue of crop failure. Though it seems that the village chief has already anticipated the current phenomenon and said a a, as I thought, when the mages came to the village in the past, a phenomenon like this had happened, at that time, the plants managed to grow after they casted their spell, but after that, it felt as though the yields had decreased, if you knew that, you could have informed the mages about it. Village chief, 
The village chief must have been caught up in all that tension when he saw the crops steadily growing due to the spell, and forgotten to say anything. Yeah, I can kinda understand that. After seeing that, I instantly became dumbstruck. I understand. Nevertheless, at the corner of the village was a field that didn't seem to be affected by the crop failure phenomenon and had plants that were sprouting. That's right, it's the Jiruangchen's field, which was incidentally supervised by Ryu Chan. If I had possessed magic, I would have taken it easy since any effort put into developing their agriculture would be meaningless. This is what I feel from the depths of my heart. Being a dark horse to a certain extent, to reduce the risks, I prepared countermeasures that were worthwhile. In the end, Jiru Angchen became 15 years old and having been recognized as an adult, he became the owner of his own field, although I might say that, it's not that a new piece of land was cleared, it was simply just a portion of Otasan's land that was transferred to him. The soft-spoken young man Jiru Angchen did not raise any objections and nods willingly to what I tell him to do. Not only is he soft-spoken, he is quite the obedient type too. Together with Mary Wangchen, who was in charge of taking care of me, I and Jiru Angchen gave our all to the fields. I, who holds memories of my past life, would be more than capable to handle the cultivation of the crops. I held this thought for a period of time but now, given that I'm a greenhorn at this, I would need to do some trials first. Firstly, I divided Jiru Angchen's land into four divisions, one mixing the ashes of straw and weeds to the soil. This field by the riverside had a mix of Jirumame and rice grown together to no addition of ashes and had a mix of Jirumame and rice growing field. Three field which soil was mixed with the same kind of ashes but only rice is grown here. Four nothing is grown here. And now, the one the field that provided the best growth for crops is the one field which had cinders mixed into it and had jerumame and rice growing in it. Runner-up is field 2 which didn't have cinders mixed into its soil while both rice and jerumame grew on it. There wasn't a big difference in performance between these fields however. Of course, since two varieties of crop were cultivated in these fields, the amount of rice growing was halved. Nevertheless. The field which was monoculture was basically completely wiped out, so even if half of the crops in field 1 and 2 managed to grow, it would still be way better. Field 3's had fertilizer cinders added and compared to the villagers' fields which didn't use any fertilizer, there were still not a big difference as both kinds ended in total annihilation. Therefore, the most important factor is the addition of the bean plants. Does everybody understand? The above summary was presented by yours truly, in the recently inaugurated villagers meeting. This was to facilitate the sharing of knowledge in agriculture and other informative matters on a regular basis. I initiated it using a teacher's pointer, made out of a stick, to draw explanatory diagrams, no words, drawings only, while reporting on the agriculture experiment was me, New Chan the four years old. After the incident when Yu Chan was confirmed not to be a mage, the villagers were, at the beginning, dejected. Still, it's not like my level of excellence decreased or anything. Thus I managed to keep my status as an exceptional child due to my appeal as a desperately hard-working kid. Yes, I have a question. Why was Field 4 made empty? Yep, that's a good question. A rather good question indeed, son of the village chief. It's so that I can experiment to see the effects of letting the field rest. It's called fallow farmland. After harvesting the crops planted this round, I plan to plant seeds in the fallow farmland and observe the growth of the crops. Just like that, the lecture started and ended without a big fuss. From the onset, I started acting cute and spoke with a lisp but I eventually got tired of doing so. The villagers didn't find it extraordinary and embarrassing so it became a Yu-Chan thing to put adults to shame, extrapolating my growth. I dare say that someday, I would become the village chief. Based on merit, yeah, I'm awfully sorry but you've got to settle for vice village chief, son of the chief, Amu. Dash 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 it has been one year since I have started meddling in agriculture. 
we started to obtain a considerable improvement in crop yield. We conclusively found that a fallow farmland is beneficial for overall cultivation and made it mainstream. The field is usually divided into three portions, one of which would be the fallow farmland and would undergo a rotation system. Just that, more research has to be done regarding the fertilizer since fertilizer made with the ashes of the weeds isn't that effective. Something like humus would be great I guess. Ideally we would have a paddy field though. What's next would be to raise the levels of production of both rice and beans so that I can seriously work on developing miso or soy sauce. I believe that is my eventual goal. I was awoken by my parents, who were grinning broadly while doing so. They were introducing me to some guy, judging from his appearance. He seems to be in his late twenties and had black hair. His name seems to be Claude equals Rainforest. He is likely to be affluent based on his appearance. My other brothers were still asleep, naturally. It is currently before daybreak and the outside world is wrapped in darkness. I was partially asleep though. But my mind was still sharp, it's because I had a hunch that something very unpleasant is about to happen. Next, the man held out his hand, cracked a smile and said, shall we go together? My mother and father were seated around the table, and on that table were three pieces of silver coins. I ascertained the situation and then, my thoughts grinded to a halt. New Chan is an obedient and good child. Surely you would understand right? Okar-san said that to me while giving off the feeling that she was gazing at me from a far far place away. Just like that, I was sold and became the black haired man's property. I got on the horse drawn coach together with the man. A.A. Again, I wasn't loved. Loading. Recollection Chapter 1. Loading. In my previous life, my family was well to do. I was the only daughter of the director of a major hospital. Both my mom and dad were Dr. Samas, so they were always busy. When I grew up and became aware of things around me, my parents were technically non-existent at home, and a maid son would always be at the house between 1400 hours and 1700 hours to cook and handle the chores before returning home. I would always have spare time and would mainly pass time by reading books, before long. I could sense that both my dad and mom made extramarital lovers outside. For kids, just by observing their parents, they can perceive such things as they are very sensitive to their parents' emotions and behavior. And then, dad and mom narrowly managed to hold on to their marriage, though I recognized that their main reason for doing so was because I existed. Therefore, I thought that I had to work extra hard to maintain our amiable family of three. With this as motivation. I worked hard on all kinds of things, and pushed myself to the fullest, be it studies, sports or the arts. I would always aim to reach the top in my studies, from sports such as table tennis, tennis, track and field to the martial arts like kendo and archery. I participated in an extensive number of tournaments, and polished myself until I attained victory at a decently large tournament. I went back and forth from the classroom to attend lessons in the aesthetics, such as painting, playing the piano and playing the violin. Similarly, I also made sure to continue until I won prizes at contests in any of the disciplines. Immediately after I obtained a trophy or prize, I would let my parents take a look at it, and would always be waiting for their reactions. Both my dad and mom would praise me. I was happy. However, there was nothing else apart from their praises. It's not like there was an increase in family time. It's not like dad and mom cut off contact from their extramarital partners. It was frustrating. I thought I hadn't put in enough effort. And then, I ran out of things to impress my parents within the 17 years old me was in a fluster. No matter what kind of excellent grades I bring, back home, even if I became the very best, my parents didn't come home. As I became an adult, I had the feeling that my ability to keep my parents' marriage was growing weaker. Being unable to express this to them, I was in a tormented state of anxiety. It was at that point of time. I went home from school, using the same old route I always do. The usual pedestrian crossings traffic light had turned green. From where I was, I could hear the loud noise of a car's engine from a distance, suggesting that its momentum was way too much to stop in time. However, I don't know if I was impatient or something, somehow, I had the impression that I, I didn't hear it, and simply crossed the pedestrian crossing. The next moment, 
I was knocked over and I died. I'm pretty sure I died, but I did not have to savor the taste of the afterlife and instead, reincarnated to this world. I was surprised at the fact that my memories were still intact, though I am sure the Kami-sama must have rewarded me with this since I worked so hard in the past. I was given another chance. This time, I would be loved by my parents. I really wanted to feel the kind of selfless love that parents give their children. In my previous life, I gave up friends and lovers alike so that I can devote myself to the family. I had no real hobbies. Now, I can have a fresh start. After I am loved by my parents, my world would surely feel expanded. To me, parents represent the very essence of my world. This hasn't changed even if I am in a parallel world. For this world, I would persevere to do so. I wouldn't hesitate to expend all my strength. Nevertheless, the reincarnated me still wasn't loved. I was an existence traded away for three silver coins. I have never seen anything beyond iron coins, so I have no idea how much silver coins are worth but, I suppose what I have achieved so far is still lighter than the value of three silver coins. Love can be bought for three silver coins. Oh, I could be wrong. Maybe I wasn't loved in the first place. My parents belong to the house of laissez-faire and do not concern themselves with their children at all. The same treatment was given to my other brothers, so I didn't pay attention to it. It can't be helped since we are poor. Well, ever since I was born, in order to ensure nobody would complain about the poverty, I worked to exhaustion and our lives should have been improved. Such were my foolish parents. Compared to three silver coins, by keeping me, there was no mistake that they would be able to enjoy permanent improved living. Despite this, or perhaps, could it be that my efforts weren't sufficient? Should I have had advanced the development of the village at a faster rate? Wait, on the contrary, it could be that I had accelerated the development too much, and because I was rated too highly, there were people willing to fork out three silver coins for me? Had I been a mage, this kind of thing probably wouldn't have happened either. At that time, if I had pretended to see what the mages wanted me to see, I wonder what would have happened. Let's stop the speculations. No matter how many if I come up with, it is futile. I would be alone from now on. And just like mud, I would live until I die. Dash 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 dash. I opened my eyes while in the swaying coach. While I was lost in thought, I seemed to have taken a small nap. Light was seeping through from the gaps in the coach. It could already be noon time. I am hungry. To be hungry at this juncture, I must be quite a cheeky fella. I felt like I couldn't carry on living after abandoned by my parents but, I wonder if I could lead another kind of splendid life. Loading. May dark one waking up in the coach. Loading. After waking up, I surveyed the surroundings in the coach. The area was piled up with all kinds of goods. It seemed as though I was imprisoned along with the other merchandises in the carriage. Salt, dried meat, dried fish, porcelain, some kind of mineral, fruits, vegetables, rice, glass bottles, cloth, etc. The place was filled to the brim with things I have never seen before. The traveling merchant that appears at Garagari village at fixed intervals didn't deal with that many goods. I mean, there are even glass bottles here. The merchant that visits Garagari village would usually be trading salt, vegetables, fish and cloth only. Despite the limited selection, the villagers are always looking forward to the visit by the traveling merchant. They would trade Garagari village's specialty, rice and beans for salt and vegetables while exchanging straw made products for cash. And then, with the iron coins saved up from the sale, they would purchase cloth made goods. Humphrey, watching as far as I can from the inside of the coach, I could see a person that seems more highly ranked than the usual traveling merchant that visits the village. I'm certain that the person that purchased me was called Claude San or something, and despite being young, he was quite a capable person. However, my body was free and I wasn't tied up by a rope. Claude San appears to be seated at the coachman's seat and there wasn't another single soul in the carriage. Just me and the goods alone. Dot I can make my escape any time? I wonder what would happen to me from now on. Now that I have been purchased, I wonder what job I would have to do. Or maybe, I would be resold again. 
The current me is something like a slave. Based on what I know from my previous life, a slave is someone forced to work under considerably harsh manual labor. A girl might have to be a prostitute. I don't have a good feeling about this. Dot shall I run away? As I was thinking, I heard the conversation beyond the cloth, TN, acting as the door between the carriage and coachman seat. Smith, is it about time to have our meals? Although I must say, the portable food isn't really enjoyable, I'm pretty sick of it already. Well, well, there's just a little more before we reach our estate. Claude Sama, has the clay doll like person at the back made any sound? Clay doll like. Stop joking. I forked out three silver coins for that you know. A.A., if she continues to stay like that, I would really be making a big loss. I even went all the way to the countryside to bring her here. A, the clay doll refers to me. That's completely rude. While contemplating on their conversation, I glared in their direction. With a light rustle, the cloth that divides the coachman's seat and the carriage was turned over by Claude San as he looked in this direction. In a flash, our eyes met, or more like. He was assessing me to a great extent. At any rate, Claude Sand's eye color was yellow-green shade, a rather rare kind of color, I suppose. The residents of Garagari village had brownish eye colors. Mine was a bright, light brown too. Somehow, he removed his gaze on me for a moment, had another sudden inclination to watch me and looked straight at me again. I don't like it. Staring at me like that. Could it be love at first sight? Or maybe he was a lilican or something. Dot here. Want to eat this? While staring, he suddenly held out something that looked like bread. Is he feeding a zoo animal? Dot LG. Gladly take it. I couldn't fight my stomach, so I timidly accepted it. As I did so, Claude San face turned to that of wonder, and shouted with an abrupt, strange voice. She, she talked dash 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 dash. The horses were frightened and made high, in cries, causing the coach to sway violently. The man that was acting as the coachman, soothed the confused horses with woe, woe. I too had been alarmed at Claude Sand's shrieking, and instinctively dropped the bread I was given. The bread landed on the floor with a reverberating thud. While thinking what is this loudness? It must have been a rock-hard bread. I started preparing myself for the eccentric Illican, Claude Sands, next movement. Loading. May dark to an aristocrat. Loading. Oh no, sorry. Looks like I frightened you, said Claude Sands as he picked me up with agility and put me down on the seat adjacent to him. Now that has happened, I became interposed between the coachman San and him. Next, he picked up the stiff bread and returned it to me. He was skilled with children, as expected. He must be a lilikin. You're a lilikin right? As I crunched on the bread, I kept my guard against Claude San. Still, I'm glad, after you were bought, you really became doll-like and made no reaction at all. I thought you might have been dead. Your eyes looked hollow and couldn't focus. You didn't talk nor eat when offered a meal, and only took small mouthful at most. A.A., I'm really so relieved said Claude San as he tapped on my head with a satisfied look. I became dazed as I realized how worried he was for me. I had the feeling that roughly half a day has passed but judging from what Claude San had said, it could have possibly been an entire day already. I have made you worried. By the way, how long has it been since we left the village? Ooh, you can speak clearly right. Good stuff. It has been around one week since we left. He appeared satisfied with every single detail of my reaction and nodded as though he was super shocked. One week you say? I had no idea that so much time had passed. No memories of that at all. Was I in that big a shock? Currently, I've reached the point of resignation, but on the contrary, I feel more at ease. Still, if we think about it, I'm still a five years old child. I might have resigned myself to all sorts of things but even that requires some time. That is, I really have made you concerned. Incidentally, since I was purchased, what would I be made to do? Yes, you must be bothered by that too. In reality, I want you to do this. Is what I like to announce but, at the moment, it hasn't been decided what your role would be. Well, we will soon be approaching my home according to the schedule. Before that though. Are the rumors that say you invented the thousand teeth thresher true? Invent? How should I put it? Erm, um, added something like that I guess. Truthfully, it was invented by a person a long time ago, 
but explaining that would be too troublesome so I shall omit it. Claude San repeatedly nodded his head, and looked very pleased as he was very content with my reply. Once we arrived at my home, you will be living together with us. There will be an aristocrat Bok Chan that is around your age so, I expect you to keep him company. The plan for your life hereafter is that you would be receiving schooling apart from being taken care of. If by any chance, my younger sister takes a liking to you, she might buy you over, so there is a possibility that I have to turn you into a maid. Well, that's what I think. I see, it was made very clear that I would be working at their residence. Therefore, the treatment is much better that I have had imagined. It might be a better decision not to escape and remain in the coach. Speaking of which, is this person an aristocrat? He did address the Bok Chan as an aristocrat too. Are you an aristocrat, Claude Samar? Being asked such a question, Claude San face darkened to some extent, and gave an answer immediately. Nope, I'm not. My family might be of nobility but, despite being born in that kind of family, after I became a matured adult, I lost my aristocracy as I wasn't a mage. In my scenario, since I studied business, I was a given a quasi-aristocrat title of Merchant Shaku. Nevertheless, it is planned that my younger sister, who has the genes for magic, would inherit my family's core rank. Your peers would be my sister's children. There are two of them. And one of them is the Bok Chan who can genuinely use magic. So basically, as long as a person cannot use magic, he or she cannot be an aristocrat. That's the gist of it. Speaking of which, you must be unaware of the details of an aristocrat because you were raised in a farming village. Simply speaking, a non-magic user would be unable to be an aristocrat. Since the capability to use magic is determined by one's genes, people with such genes would inherit our property and land. Those born from nobility and yet not blessed with magic genes can still be an aristocrat if they marry a mage from some aristocracy. My brother did that. He became a groom and was made the supervisor of the land surrounding your village. This was the brother whom I heard the information about the thousand teeth thresher and fish trap tool from. My brother was in disbelief about it though. Oh, there's such a rumor about me. It seems like there are people who don't believe it too. For now. I shall entrust myself to Claude San. Rather than escaping in this state, I shall try living on just like that. If by any chance, the people at Claude San's residence have terrible personalities and I am forced to do harsh manual labor, it would still be good to make my escape then. In any case, this person seems like the careless type so this plan should work. After Claude San finished what he was saying. He rummaged through the pile of bags at the back and took out a book. By the way, are you able to read and write words? I wonder if it was the language of my previous life. I shouldn't have any problems but, for a fleeting moment, I saw the front cover of the book that Claude San was holding and couldn't recognize the characters on it. No, I am unable to. I see. Your manner of speaking seems excessively fluent so I had assumed that you were well versed in the language but... It's because the village doesn't have education for language right? Just to be sure, I carried this book along. I would be reading this book to you on the way to the residence so I want you to, at the very least, memorize some of these words. As he said so, he lifted the me that was crunching on the bread, placed me on his lap and opened the book that was in front of me. Unfamiliar characters and words lay side by side in the book. It appears that this parallel world has their own language. Claude San read out loudly and slowly for me. This translations was brought to you by https colon slash slash translations.com slash. He doesn't seem like a bad guy. Loading. May dark for the aristocrats bout charmer. Loading. TN. Bout charmer is another version of Botchen, just that it is more respectful and also adds a level of intimacy. After finishing with my greetings, I was guided along by the maid. I felt that she was treating me like a dirty rag as she made me follow her to take a medicated bath, scrub my body with a cloth, cleaned my hair and apart from that, she tied a ponytail for me and gave me a new set of clothes. The clothes given to me was a black long sleeves one piece and a white apron that was supposed to be worn around the waist. Cool. This is so maidish. The other maids were wearing clothes with the same design so perhaps it is the uniform for all the servants here. The shoes were a pair of leather shoes and they were rather soft. 
the straw sandals I made by hand disappeared to somewhere else. Hey, there seemed to plenty of tiny sized made attires that fit me here. Next, after going through the normal procedure of cleaning me, the maid that was in charge of washing me finally looked me straight in the eyes. I am Stella, the person in charge of taking care of Irina Kasama. You must have heard that you will serve as the maid to Alan Bouchama and Kane Bouchama. The both of them are presently studying at their private tutor's place but, they would be free soon and you shall kindly introduce yourself to them then. Why yes, I understand. Her expressionless and indifferent manner of speech somehow made me nervous. A maid for the upper class is so cold. Later on, I guess, the Bouchamas might treat their maid unreasonably so I hope that your clothes do not get soiled. I particularly dislike dirty things you see. Oh I see. She didn't look at me all this while because it was a problem of my appearance. Arian San might be a gorgeous woman but Stella San is also equally as pretty. Her light gold hair swooped down to her nose, and her overall looks can be compared to a sculpture of a goddess. Adding on her characteristic still face she usually puts on, calling her a sculpture is right on the mark. I saw other maid servants when I entered the residence and they too had fairly decent looks. There is definitely no mistake that one of the criteria to serve as a maid in this residence is beauty. Next. Stella San gave me a map of the residence and taught me the relevant information a maid needs to know such as knowing the location of the bathroom for maids, the important point is when washing herself, what one has to do when nature calls, and that servants will be specifically living in a specific building. Arian San ended her lecture and said it was about time, before dragging me out of the room. At last. It is the meeting with the Bouchimas. I didn't have a good hunch about this due to the earlier information but, now that I have become an, an apprentice maid, I shall respond to my assigned task. Now, Stella San had stopped right before the door ahead of us. Somehow Stella San's facial expression is bad. Next, she looked like she was hardening her resolve, and knocked on the door. This is Stella Bouchimas. Today, Claude Sama has brought a new maid with him. Replying to her. A childlike voice which carried a proud tone emerged from the direction of the door. All right, you may enter. Strangely, Stella San urged me to be the one to open the door. Eh? Wasn't I supposed to enter the room following behind Stella San? Is this all right? While considering the possibilities, I opened the door. I took a look inside the room from the entrance of the room, but there was nobody around. While saying excuse me, I had closer look inside and hesitantly entered. Bashan. It was too sudden. At first, I had no idea what had occurred. Taking a look at myself, I noticed that my brand new apron had been stained by muddy water. My hair had become drenched too. The door behind me was slammed shut and it was likely Stella San who did that in order to shield herself from the murky water. I heard the sounds of footsteps walking away from the door so I guess Stella San must have simply left me here. In any case, I've grasped the situation and from the left of me, the children were breaking out in laughter. Ah ha 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 ha. Did you see that? Kanan Izama. Her face. Alan. This is no good. Facing the left, while squatting down and co-style tooltip. This is the kind of squatting position you do when you are pooping in a squat toilet. I saw a black hair kid in an explosive laughter and as we looked one another mutually. There was another reddish brown hair boy that was in a dither. Ma, even without confirming beforehand. I knew the black hair kid was the five years old Alan Bouchama, whereas the reddish brown boy was Kane Bouchama. Alan had the same black hair and pea green eyes as Claude San. His hair was a bob cut, and the evilness of his personality could be seen all over his face. It was a totally sinister face. On one side is Kane, who also had pea green eyes, but even though the brothers have similar features, the younger brother was distinct in that he had round eyes that reflect the kindness in his heart. Oi! What are you doing? Stop scrutinizing me. Alan started yelling impertinently. Amu, um, my squatting position changed to a Yankee eye style. I suppose I'm friends with all the bad boys. Yeah. I shall make my introductions. I am called Ryu. From today onwards, I am the maid for Kane Sama and Alan Sama. I am very pleased to meet you. While I was dripping wet. I gave my greetings as if nothing had happened earlier. Loading. May Dark Five something like a duel. Loading. Stop pretending to be strong. With that foul appearance of yours. 
Don't even think about entering this room. Where's your common sense? These are the very words by the fellow that caused me to be dripping wet, and I was at my cleanest moment of my life just a few seconds ago too. Rest assured, about Chama. When I entered the room, I was clean so your point on my lack of common sense do not apply I said it in a clear cut manner. What's with your choice of difficult language? Don't get too cocky with your dumbass face. Because I am more superior. Because I'm a mage. Calling me a dumbass face. This brat. My plain looking face is temporary since there is no doubt I would grow to become a fabulous woman. Furthermore, whatever he said earlier doesn't contribute to the argument. This brat. I am very aware of that, about Charmer. Speaking of which, isn't the room dirty now? Shall we have it cleaned? If that's the case. Would you kindly step out of the room so that I can have whoever's in charge of cleaning to handle this? The weather is fine and it is a good day to be outside too. Shut up, dumbass. I don't take instructions from you. Again, this brat called me a dumbass. Are kids always so irritating? Wait a second, aren't I a kid too? There is a saying that even a Buddha will get angry after you touch it three times. I shall magnanimously forgive this child's words. Alan, why do you always snap at the new servants? In addition, I forbid you to receive anyone's help in cleaning up your mess. Earlier, Kane had been nervous but he seemed to have regained his composure and admonished his brother. Amu, this eight years old is well brought up, praiseworthy. Kane and Izama, but it's all because she is being audacious. Listen, apologize now and clean the room. Dot got it. Kane and Izama. Somehow it seems that this shitty brat Alan is not going to disobey his brother even though he honestly cannot accept it. Oh my. I'm going to be apologized to. If that's the case, I wouldn't be a demon about it. I would willingly forgive you for calling Beardamus. However, I ain't gonna say sorry. I'll just clean the room. He's not apologizing. Rip my expectations. Anyways, isn't a room completed soiled by muddy water too much to handle for a five years old alone? Nevertheless, my concerns were unnecessary. As the shitty brat Alan placed his hands on the floor, and muttered an incantation, the muddy water that spilled all over the floor vanished gradually. Oh right. This shitty brat is a mage. I'm guessing that the muddy water appeared in the first place because of his magic. This is too convenient. Even the vacuum cleaner wouldn't be a match for that kind of absorption magic. All households should have at least one mage. Still, the shitty brat Alan. Are you aware that you've overlooked something? Alan Sama. I am currently soaking wet. Could I be cleaned as well? I tried my darndest in smiling. The biggest smile a five years old could give. Ha. Huh. Your current appearance is befitting for a dumbass face like you. Dot. W what is this? That rebellious stare, you dare to go against me. Oops, that was too much bloodlust. I was nearly about to get all worked up by this little kiddie companion of mine. Be cool, be cool. I was just about to stare this brat to death. Alan, that's a pathetic appearance you're putting on. Isn't this girl around the same age as you are? Oh dear, as expected of Kane Bout Charmer, impressive feminist. Eight-year-old Ikeman. This. There is no need to apologize to a dumbass servant sent over by Otisama or Okaasama, said Alan as he was on verge of tears. Hey, the one that should be crying is me. I'm still drenched here you know. Alan Kane Bouchama put his arm across Alan's shoulders, while calling his name in an effort to comfort him. Is this supposed to be some drama? And I have been abandoned at the sidelines even though I'm the victim here. Someone, please notice me. If I'm left in this condition, I'll catch a cold. This is a strong brotherly relationship I said, trying to express my impressions on the drama. STFU, fucking servant. I'll be sure to fire you. Get the hell out now. Oh man. He's really pissed. Even though I have been trying to ignore what this cocky brat is saying, damn. I'm really annoyed. Could this be menopause? Even my puberty hasn't even started. Ma. Alan Sama, that's some preposterous thing you have just said. The person to decide whether I get to stay is the Okusama. I don't think Alan Sama has that kind of authority. The soup paranoid me, moved my hands over to my mouth, with my little pinky sticking out, as I laughed. Oh oh ho ho. I could picture myself being the evil mother-in-law in those afternoon soap dramas. A. Eh? What? He was staring straight at me while his face turned red. Puppy love? 
I'm such a sinner. You, why are you being so cheeky? Let's have a match. A duel. I'll make sure to beat you till you're blue and black all over and willingly say you give up. Looks like I was mistaken. His face turned red because of anger. What a short-tempered shitty brat. Alan. She's a girl. Kane Bouchama frantically tried to stop Alan. But somehow it seems that he wasn't able to stop his younger brother that has lost control of himself. Kane Bouchama, who was lost for words said something along the lines of you are too conceited earlier but it was swiftly dismissed. Kane Bouchama gazed at me sympathetically. I mean, him saying he wants a duel, even though he's only five years old, perhaps he is referring to card games? Is it the kind where you'll say duel stand by? As long your bum hits the ground, it would mean defeat. You understand? If you lose to me, you will scram and quit being a maid. You got it? When you said duel, you mean a real all out brawl? Would there not be any dual standby? Duh, a no rules battle. Of course, magic is permitted. That is if you can use it. The shitty brat broadened his grin and laughed. I see, he's so full of himself because he has confidence in his magic. Incidentally, if I won, what would I gain? HMPH, there is no way you can win but. If that happens I would be your fellow henchman or whatever. I didn't ask for a henchman with such a terrible character though. The field for our duel would be here. This very room. Is that acceptable? Sure. Going all the way out would be troublesome anyways. By the way, when you were casting your magic earlier, Alan Sama, you had to say some language but if unable to say the incantation, I suppose the magic would not activate. You don't say. The shitty brat Alan replied as though it was so obvious. Is that so? I was merely curious at how you were able to remember such long lines at such a young age. Well then, I shall obey respectfully. I accept the duel. Good. Kane and Izama, please give the start signal. Kane Bouchama said I know with a glum expression and became the referee for our duel. And as for me, am I really fine? That was the kind of gaze he directed at me while he prayed that I do not get injured. He did say that if I gave up in the midst of the fight, attacks would be stopped immediately and that I can rest assured on that. It must be tough on the elder brother with such a difficult kid brother. Begin. The signal to start reverberated in the room. At that very same moment, I dashed towards where the shitty brat was. Although I said dash, for a five-year-old kid's leg strength. It was more like tottering. At any rate, the distance between us was roughly four meters. I closed the gap with the shitty brat that was muttering his incantations. As I ran forth, I undid the knot on my soaked apron and aimed it at Talon's face. The shitty brat that was in the middle of chanting, started to go out of breath and made puffing noises like hey how a youth that swimming would make. The moist apron successfully clung onto his face, preventing him from breathing. Using this opportunity, I got behind him and swept his foot while pushing him on his shoulder, causing him to fall on his backside. A disappointingly easy match to have had a duel in this enclosed area. Furthermore magic was something he had to absolutely use. What a foolish five years old. There's bound to be weak points for things that are convenient and awesome. You have to bear in mind your own weaknesses, Shaun. The shitty brat Alan that had his head wrapped around by my wet apron looked up at towards me, dumbfounded. Well then, could this henchman Alan Sama, this being an immediate order, clean up my clothes and hair? I took on an imposing stance while looking down on him, and dished out a simple command. Loading. May Dark Six what comes after the duel? Loading. After the duel, Alan became incredibly meek. From his face, you could see the reluctance and dissatisfaction. But as my henchman, he has to obey the orders I gave him. I had expected Alan to start his wawa crying after the duel and tattle on me to his mama that I had been bullying him because of the following reasons. He is only five years old, he is Alan, and that he is a shitty brat. Surprisingly, that didn't happen and instead, he kept his promise and reluctantly accepted that he was my henchman. For a five-year-old kid. He's a rather steadfast shitty brat. Stella was both astonished and gratuitous at how I managed to safely get the shitty brat and Kane Bouchama to recognize me as their maid. It seems that among the servants, there has been tension and discomfort on the question of who is the next personal servant to the Bouchamas.
The other servants were all full of praises for me. By no means had I gone around boasting on how I dueled the young masters or how I made one of them my henchman too. Not one word. That's cause our relationship has to be kept a secret. It's not like the shitty brat would want to tell anybody that he lost to a girl. Similarly, Aaron San and Claude San weren't told as well. Or perhaps I should say, they never did reappear after the very first day. Claude San claimed that he had a lot of work piled up that required his attention so he secluded himself in his room and endeavored to complete his work. Aaron San being herself, was now, extremely busy due to the lack of mages and was hardly back at home in the first place. Even at dinner time, all the members of the family did not turn up. The only people at the large dining table were the shitty brat and cane bout charmer, where they ate in silence usually. Being their maid, I did not join in to have dinner together with them, but I still had to assist them in their meals. The job mainly consist wiping the dirt off cane bout charmer's mouth, bringing the cutlery from a distant place for him, refilling his drink. Oi! Why are you helping cane and eyes armor only? The shitty brat started whining as he stamped his foot incessantly. The food is extravagant. The food, which were most my first time seeing, would make me drool. Still, from my experience with their dinners, it's always a miserable sight. Looking at the meat in silence makes my heart ache. In this residence, the people in charge of managing affairs in their territory are the Danis Armour, Claude San and Aaron San's father, Aaron San, her husband. However, the Danis Armour and Aaron's husband were summoned to the capital and were made to handle some work. Two years have already passed since then. For your information, FYI, the wife of the Danis Armour has already passed away. Claude San was initially hitting it out on his own, living in a separate residence while making a name for himself in commerce but due to her sister begging him in tears. He has now returned and is helping out with some management issues too. Moreover. The matter that Aaron San was responsible for, in short, was the problem of the dwindling numbers Rainforest Earl family's mages. The current situation was that the mages were leaving in the droves. For what kind of work the mages are leaving for, I have no idea. I wonder if the reason is similar to why the two mages visited the Garigari village. Could the other mages be patrolling around the places? This was what I heard from the home tutor during the history lesson that I had together with the Bouchimers. So basically, all this means that the Rainforest family is the best. Rainforest family bans I. No no, it is my honor to have become the home tutor for the Rainforest family, Bouchimers. Let's hope all goes well Jahahi. This was the kind of boot-licking shabby teacher he was and even as he might be boot-licking them now, at least he teaches history in an easy to understand way. TN, this paragraph was rather confusing, I tried my best in interpreting it and this was the result. At any rate, in these two years, their father and mother were hardly around, thus for both Kane Bout Charmer and the shitty brat Allen, from the time they became aware of their surroundings, they've been living without their parents. It seems likely that their closeness stems from this kind of family background. Honestly, this is so similar to my previous life. I had persevered, tried to obtain first for everything, gained as many hobbies as I could. In the case of the shitty brat Allen, I must have had taken notice at how he behaved. My first impression of him was that of annoyance, but it may be it is because I saw my old self in him. In the short period before the arithmetic tutor comes in, I consolidated my thoughts and decided to give it my all in treating him as nicely as possible, and shot to angel-like gaze that emitted gentleness and warmth right at the shitty brat Allen. Live strong, Shan. W what are you looking at? Stop staring at me with eyes of a dead frog. If you are going to ask me to buy some milk, it's not possible since there isn't enough time. Oi, how dare you compare my angel-like gaze to a dead frog. Rude. And what he said at the end, isn't he suggesting that I'm constantly making him do errands? How is it possible for me, as their companion, to order him? Furthermore he is an aristocrat, to frequently go on errands. I made him run my errands once or twice only. Staring in his direction with my eyebrows furrowed, as though a snake is stalking the frog, the shitty brat instinctively became afraid and averted his eyes away from mine. Whoopsie daisies, that's not what I should be doing. 
I'm supposed to be their companion, oh oh ho ho. Just at this moment, the arithmetic teacher came and we started to focus on the lesson. And I haven't forgotten how he compared my angel gaze to a dead frog. Damn shitty brat. Not gonna give a damn about you now. Loading. May Dark Seven came about Charmer's feelings. Loading. Ha! Huh? Shouted the shitty brat in his lively voice which resounded across the open field nearby. Kane Bout Charma and I were watching over the sword play between Alan and the knight teacher who was coaching him in swordsmanship. For the Alan who had lost to me, he must be in agony I suppose, so he had started to buck up and began swordsmanship training. Kane had already learned swordsmanship so it had been decided that Alan would be personally coached. Given that I had practiced kendo in my past life, from what I can see, Alan has a considerable talent in swordsmanship, he hasn't gotten used to it and that he only has a body of a five-year-old, yet he is able to execute all these movements well, it is a level that is not expected of a five-year-old. And he hasn't mastered his basics too, from the perspective of Kane Bout Chama, who had undergone the same sword practice, he seemed to be very satisfied with his performance as he nodded in approval. From how I see it, Kane Bout Charma is the genius in swordsmanship, he was able to match the knight teacher's ability in no time, Alan is incredible, he is already able to wield magic, when his swordsmanship improves, the curtain for my exit would surely descend, despite being all that satisfied earlier, he was now casting his eyes down and muttering softly, not at all, from how I see it, there is no mistake that Kane Sama is the real genius in swordsmanship. You have good memory, a handsome looking face and a good personality to boot. In the future, women would be queuing by the miles to court you. Yep, no mistake on that. However my attempt at encouraging him had the opposite effect as he appeared to be even more dejected. Nor, since Salon is a mage, I'm sure he would be the one that would have a bevy of beauties after him. Well, as for me since I'm not a mage, in fact, finding a lady mage would be the more daunting task considering that there hasn't been any female mage around my age under the jurisdiction of the rainforest family. Ah, is that so? Dang. In this world, it seems that the ability to use magic holds the absolute authority. Sorry for the irresponsible encouragement. Still, if I apologized, he would feel even more hurt. I wanna know how to handle a delicate eight-year-old. Still. I have been thinking that maybe a lifestyle like Oja-sama would be a good to Claude Sama's way of life, you mean you aspire to be a merchant? Nope, I plan to be a knight. Only after distinguishing oneself can one be a knight but I can receive the quasi-aristocrat title of knight early easily though. Well, it is actually just an honorary title. Having the title of knight earl, I would be able to assist Alan. In addition, if I meet a nice lady mage that I like. It wouldn't be bad at all to marry her. Well, Claude Ajayzama hasn't even found a suitable spouse though. Oh, I'm relieved. Before I said anything, this was what naturally popped up in my mind. I threw out a stock response instead. Indeed. A good Anasama. <laughs> Let me see. It is really wonderful I think. Even under your circumstances, you would prioritize the shitty brat. Oh pardon me, Alan Sami. Above all. Yep. His family after all. Speaking of family, it would be wonderful if that shitty brat, oh pardon me, is able to demonstrate love for someone. Kane Bout Charma giggled at how I constantly let slip of the term shitty brat. In addition, when I was born, everyone in my family were mostly disappointed that I wasn't a mage so I kinda felt guilty about it. After that, Alan was born and everybody was relieved that he was a mage. Honestly, for this world. I cannot imagine the kind of emotional baggage non-mage children of aristocrats would carry with them. It would definitely be tough on them I think. At the Garagari village, being told that I could be a mage, I had my hopes up. When it was crushed later, it became painful as I was unable to return the expectations placed on me. I felt ashamed and couldn't do anything about it. Wasn't my feelings the same as his back then? Kane Bout Chama who has been continuously carrying such feelings since he was born, had grown to be such a fantastic and kind vicoman. It's really incredible. As for me, after being sold, my heart grew cold and apathetic. Even though I have been calling that innocent five-year-old a shitty brat instinctively, showing how stormy my heart is, as expected, 
I can't hide conceal anything from you. Just by looking at my face, it feels as though you can see through everything. Said Kane about Sharma as he coyly scratched his head displaying his bashfulness after I threw a respectful gaze over him. It's not like I happened to have a see-through cheat prepared, Kane bout Chama. Actually, it's not always purely liking him, it was a more of a dramatic torment for me, and there was this once when I really hated my brother. But Alan being Alan had to face lots of pressure and it seems rough on him. Furthermore, he is very clumsy in expressing his feelings, and Otisama and Okaasama are always not around in this period. So he has to rely on me. I feel that I have to protect him. He's my cute little brother after all. Said Kane Bouchama who was calmly smiling. Seeing his smile, a fleeting memory of my brother's smile appeared at the back of my mind. The image is rather hazy. These brothers are doing fine. I wonder if the villagers at Garagari village are properly tending to their fields. Yeah. What's up? R. Sorry. It's nothing. That story of yours was too touching. Eh. I was flooded with thoughts about it, Alan is really a lucky person to have Kane Bout Sharma as his brother. You fufu, -fu. I said and laughed to dodge the question. Right about now, the shitty brat Alan's coaching had ended. Kane Sama nimbly went over to Alan's place, and praised him for doing so well. Saying something like he is still no match for Kane Bout Sharma, the shitty brat smiled while not appearing to be all that annoyed. By the way. Anisama seemed like he was in a conversation with you earlier, what was it about? Alan probed with an innocent smile befitting of a five-year-old kid. Hey, don't throw that troublesome smile at me, TN, came to you, that is a face that says what shall I do? Well, since I heard a good story from you, in return, I shall help you this time. It was an adult conversation that is too early for someone as young as you to listen to. More importantly, Today I want to visit the town so, could you help me get the preparations ready? W what? An adult conversation. Aren't you and I the same age? And to directly give me an order to Alan Sama. The boss has to obviously give his henchmen orders, and it is of course part of the natural hierarchy for the henchman to listen to the boss. I knew that the night teacher had already left, and after confirming that there weren't any adults in the vicinity, I took the opportunity to teach him about hierarchy. GRR. One day I would be able to argue you into silence. Mew. With his parting remark, Alan went back into the residence to look for the other servants. To leave the place, he would need to prepare bodyguards. Amu, please work hard to accomplish the task I present to you, henchman. Loading. May Dark Hate to the Town's Market. Part 1. Translated by, Wyami. Loading. It was decided that the shitty brat Alan. Kane bout Sharma and I would visit the town, it's a journey on the coach, it wasn't a wagon like carriage like the one I was on with Claude San, this one had proper seats for humans. Two people who had the appearance of knights accompanied us as bodyguards. I peeped outside the coach to have a look at the scenery, and amidst the tranquil rural landscape, I caught sight of a bunch of people lazing near the bushes. I had asked the knight that was sitting next to me what was it about and he told me that those people were farmers. The thousand teeth thresher had been popularized in this area and the threshing process has been made remarkably easier so more peasants have nothing on their hands to do. They had finished their field work, and their next step would be to wait for the mages to force the crops to grow. However, due to the shortage of mages, the problem of waiting time was created. Staring at their blank unthinking faces, somehow, I remembered that they can raise livestock in their farms too. Speaking of which, all the crops in the farmland here, requires mages to grow them? Yes it appears, because this village is under the jurisdiction of the aristocrat. This is a village controlled by the aristocrats. Oh, what a culture shock. Which reminds me, if I had been a mage, the Garagari village would become under direct control over the aristocrat. So this is why the villagers at Garagari were so excited. I see, so this is it. If the mages help grow the crops all the time, the villagers wouldn't have to fret about crop failures and don't have to care about the weather too. Won't it make their jobs too simple? For the people of the village, it would surely be an utopia. Oh yeah. Udono originated from one of the new rural settlements. Rural settlements? Is that for real? Mew. 
You came from such a primitive place. On hearing our conversation, Alan triumphantly joined in the discussion. It is likely he noticed that it was a perfect topic for dissing me and thus, attempted to join in the discussion. This repulsive little brat. When I had first seen magic accelerating the growth of crops, it came as a shocker to me. I'm so envious that it's so common in this village area. I had ignored Alan and continued my conversation with the escort knight. This infuriated Alan and he stood up from his seat to confront me but was sharply told off by Kane Bout Charmer. Decades ago, these rural settlements didn't exist though. The problem of lack of mages became more acute and it became increasingly difficult to appoint mages to all the rural lands, resulting in an extreme dip in crop production rates. Thus, we had to explore new options that could be sustained without mages, this is where the new rural settlements came in useful. So, all this boils down to the lack of agricultural development. When I had saw the prowess of magic, I had already considered this was why agricultural was so laid back here. After giving a cold glance to the Allen that was flaring up, I took another look outside and noticed the town. Earlier, all I saw was the quiet rural landscape but as we approached the town, I could now hear the bustling noises of the town. Looks like a lively town. Where did you want to go? You? I wanted to see the market. As I came down from the coach, Kane Boucham received my hand to escort me down. No way, such a kind Vikerman. A pity he's only a child. If he was any bigger, I might have fallen head over heels for him. Nevertheless, no matter how much of an Eichelman he is, there is no way that I, with the memories of my past life preserved, would find him my cup of tea. Is there anything you need from the market? For now, I don't really need anything specific. All I want is to check out what is sold in the market. I see if it's the market we will be there soon, replied Kane Bouchama as he pointed in direction we should be going to the escort night. It really didn't take long before we reached the entrance for the market. The place was cramped with stalls, and they sold things like vegetables, meat, accessories and many others that caught my eye. It was as boisterous as a matchuri. Basically, it gave off the feel of a regular market from my previous life. Everything ranging from fruits and vegetables to meat and fish was sold here. One difference though, typical of a fantasy world, armor and sword combat equipments were sold as well. Particularly startling was that there were many pharmacies here too. Medicine-like dried medical herbs and cream-like medical cream were sold in the pharmacies. I hardly had any image of medicine being sold in this market. Furthermore, there was an abundance of the variety of medicine types too. Rummaging through the assortment, I came across dried yamogi. No way. How nostalgic. I had frequently used it back at Garagari village. Yamogi smells good and has the smell of Japan. I want to make some herb mochi. As I was thinking about that, Kane Bouchama went on ahead to buy me a bag of it. This is a secret, he said, as he made brought his index finger to his mouth. Tn. SHH. Comma this eight-year-old Ikeman is truly amazing, and his perfectness is likely to get worse from now on too. Just so you know, I'm a servant. If you actually treated other servants like that, they wouldn't have the heart of a servant. In a way, the future batches of servants would have a harder time with his Ikeman style compared to Alan's shitty brat style. Everybody would be despairing that they cannot be of any use to him. I continued window shopping until it became somewhat dark and we decided to go back. Together with the darkening skies, the people in the market began carrying lanterns to illuminate their surroundings. Click click I heard the sounds of striking flint so that's probably how they start the fires in their lanterns. The vanguard escort knights similarly illuminated our paths. We walked on. The soft flickering glow of orange created a dreamlike atmosphere in the market. Shortly after, we reached the entrance of the town, yet the coach that we rode on was nowhere to be seen. One of the escort knights said he would bring along the coach and left in an composed manner, so the coach was probably parked somewhere else. We obediently waited. We walked quite a fair bit so my legs started to hurt. I'm exhausted. However, a child near where we were, was pacing himself back and forth before a huge tree. Picking up ears to listen, I heard something about a copper coin medicine, and about snakes mixed with his weeping cries. This smells of nuisance. Honestly, 
I'm quite tired but if I were to leave while ignoring this child, I would be bothered by it later. Just when I decided to approach the kid, Alan called out to him. Hey you. What you doing? The self-important Alan makes his grand entrance. Even though we might be calling the kid a kid, he looks older than Alan. Despite so, from the atmosphere, it didn't feel that way. That is the shitty brat Alan for you. I came to buy Okar Sans medicine and my copper coin has fallen inside the cavity near the tree. Can't you just put your hand in and search for the coin? But, there seem to be snakes inhabiting this hole. Judging from the hissing sound, and I'm afraid, I tried poking inside with twigs, however, the inside of the hole is surprisingly complex and I couldn't dig out the coin nor could I chase the snakes away. At this rate, I won't be able to buy Okar Sans medicine. Alan was conversing with the kid so we stood behind behind him. Abruptly, the escort knight that was behind me started wailing in a frenzy. Snakey, where? Where is the snake? Alan Sama, Kane Sama, get back. Snake, snake. It's here. Next, the hysterical knight grabbed them, who were complaining and lamenting, forcefully to a nearby, or more like, as far away as possible from the tree. Oi, what is it? Ouch. Dot you hate snakes? The knight made no response to Alan's question but you could see the fear in his eyes, eyes that clearly showed that he was scared of the snake-infested hole. Thus, there was no doubt he hated snakes. I borrowed the lantern from the chicken knight and twigs from the child and then tried poking the hole with the twigs. Exactly as the child had mentioned, the hole was a complicated one. Using an upright stick, I still couldn't reach the end of the hole nor could I turn over the copper coin and bring it out, placing the lantern near the hole. I took a peep inside the hole while moving the twig about the hole. Upon doing so, sounds of hissing can be heard and next, I could see something glaring at me. Make no mistake. There are snakes inside. Loading. May Dark Nine to the Town's Market. Part 2. Translated by, Wyami. Loading. It's here, the snake. Kaya. A hoarse shriek could be heard. I can't be sure if what he did was for the sake of Alan and Kane about Charmer or to protect himself when the frightened knight dash off carrying both of them. Only after a distance did he stop running while hugging them with his burly arms. This knight shows no sign of being useful at all. Using the emoji that I had bought earlier, I squished and lumped them together in a ball so that holding it becomes easier. After collecting two long twigs, I used the twigs to pierce into the lump of emojis, and set them alight with the flame from the lantern, ascertaining that the lumps have caught fire. I pulled them out of the flame and lightly swung the twigs, thus extinguishing the fire on them, making it such that it gave off smoke only. Next I inserted the smoking lumps inside the hole. This was a tactic to smoke the snakes out. Besides, Yamogi could be used like this since the smoke from it repels the snakes. Large amount of smoke billowed out and immediately, the effects could be seen. Two snakes slithered out from their holes. I had assumed that there was only one snake but looked like there was actually two. A married couple perhaps. Soon after, another manly shriek could be heard from the escort knight. But hey, the snakes wasn't even heading in his direction. The snakes slithered towards the bushes behind a big tree, temporarily pulling the emoji out. I once again thrust the twig in to make sure there wasn't any more snakes inside and from what I could see, it should be alright now. However, I can't be 100% sure. Are the snakes totally driven out? Tn, said Kane Bout Charmer, I think. The chicken knight made his way back discreetly and so. Alan and Kane Bout Charmer finally came along. I am not certain but it is very likely that the snakes have left their hole. I had expected only one snake but two appeared and it shocked me for a moment. Still I doubt there would be another one, I suppose. Saying that, I resolved myself to put my hand inside the snake's hole and found an object that feels like a copper coin. I'm so glad that the coin was at a place where my hands could reach. Also, there weren't any more snakes in the hole. Here you go. Hold on tight to it K. Okay? I passed over the copper coin to the kid that had dropped it. The kid repeatedly expressed his gratitude to me. And in order to stop him, I told him that I had to make my way to the pharmacy before it closes. He panicked and gave his final thanks before running off towards the market. He was so desperate for the sake of his mum, and almost cried too. Oi. You. What are you doing? 
Alan grabbed my shoulders and yelled menacingly at me without warning. Huh. All I did was return the kid's copper coin. I already saw that. That's not what I was referring to. Alan started raging all of a sudden. Frankly, I don't understand why. My usual guess is that he has a short temper and his fuse got triggered. This time, however, I have no clue. It was as though a question mark popped above my head. With good timing, the coach arrived and one of the bodyguard knight returned. Anything happened? He alternated his eyes between his cowering co-worker and the Alan that was angrily staring at me. Kane Bouchama broke the silence. Ha, ah, some stuff happened but, it's okay now. Let's go back. Kane Bouchama walked back to the coach and seeing as he did so, Alan clicked his tongue and followed behind. Tilting my head in confusion, I followed them back to the coach. The atmosphere in the coach was utterly cold, dreadfully gloomy. Apart from the pale-faced knight who had earlier exposed his pathetic self, even Kane Bouchama seemed to be angry at me too. I scanned through my memories of the snake incident to see what might have enraged both of them but still didn't manage to understand anything. You, you have no idea why Alan and I are mad at you? Kane Bouchama muttered faintly. Alan rages at me as regularly as the number of meals I have but this time, Kane Bouchama was mad at me too. This is a first I believe. I'm sorry for angering you. I have absolutely no clue how I made you guys livid at me. Kane Bouchama is actually angry too right? Of course. Dot Ryu has to really take care of herself more carefully. Of myself? Did I hear that right? You said it herself right? Specifically that you were not certain. So this means that there was a possibility that there might still be snakes in there. Am I not wrong? Despite that. You examined the whole personally with your hands without any hint of hesitation. Alan and I were shocked. Summing it up, what do you actually mean, considering what happened in the end? There weren't any snakes in there, and I managed to pick up the copper coin, so there shouldn't be any problems. Why would you all be crossed at me? Your face says that you still don't get it. Huh? Kane Bouchama laughed scornfully. To think that Kane Bouchama would laugh at me like that. The attack power of Kane Bouchama sneering at me was too high. Basically, Alan, and of course, including myself had been worried for you. We were upset that you acted without any regards to your safety. If there had been a snake, what would happen? The snakes could be poisonous and in the worst case scenario, you might get bitten and would die. Worried? I made them worried and angered them because of that. Sitting next to Kane Bouchama was Alan who was gazing outside awkwardly while in a bad mood. In fact, you hasn't been prioritizing your own health on many other occasions. It was so when you accepted Alan's duel. I shall repeat myself. I want you to cherish yourself more. I could only say sorry, reply that I understood and that I'll pay more attention in the future. From then on. I was lost for words throughout the journey on the coach. I had been chided by an eight-year-old boy. Still, this feeling doesn't feel bad at all. I tried to reel in on my memories to see if there had been anyone that got mad at me because he or she was worried for me but no one came to mind. I don't usually involve myself in exceedingly dangerous incidents in the past though. Anyways, it seems that recently, I feel like I have gotten reckless. Nevertheless, I actually made these little kids concerned for me, recalling the angry faces of Alan and Kane. I can't help but feel a sense of warmth, a warmth that cannot be swallowed no matter how hard I try to force it down my throat. It remained trapped in my chest. I can't really find the words to describe this accurately though. I never expected that I, as a maid, would vow in my heart to take care of them bravely. However, even more strangely, for their sake and not only because I'm their maid, I would push to my very limits for them. Loading. May Dark 10 The Madam's Maid Part 1. Loading. Translated by Wami. I who had secretly made my determination to give my all for the brothers of the Rainforest family, am now wrestling with the problem that I had feared up till now. It was a battle to increase family time. I hypothesize that Alan's bad temper is completely the fault of his mom for not doing her role as a mom sufficiently. Furthermore, Aaron San has always been so busy that she cannot afford to spend time eating meals together with her children. What is going on? Something in her schedule has got to be redundant, something out there. Is it really compulsory? Something should fit this description. In alignment with my bookkeeping job, 
I wanted to know Erin Sands' schedule, finding out what her one day worth of work is like. Hence, I went to look for Stella San, who was her personal attendant. Work hasn't started for the day, so she should be at the servants' waiting room currently. It seems that I had arrived before dawn, and nobody had arrived at the waiting room as of yet. Too early I suppose. Still, Stella San is always early and it's high time that she appears now. While I was holding this thought, the door opened violently and there, Stella San, stood with an intense expression on her face. I can detect killing intent from her. What had happened? Stella San looked at me and, oh it's you. Are you the only one that got out of bed? This can't be helped, since we don't have much time left, I shall have to bring you along. She said as she grabbed my arm, dragging me along despite my lack of consent. W what has occurred? One of Okusama's maid has fainted. I'm bringing you to her as a replacement. You might be young, but there has been talk about you being able to perform well. So I am expecting good results from you. Ta 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 we walked at a beastly pace. Could Stella San be a race walking athlete? Trying my best not to fall over, I had to switch to a jog to keep up. In other words, I have to be Okusama's maid today? Indeed. What luck. I didn't even have to ask Stella San and I would get to directly observe Erin San's work life. I made a guts pose in my mind. After tossing several objects out to make space for me in the coach, I took a seat together with Stella San. At the front seat was Erin San who was drooling in her slumber. Be quiet, you. Else we would awaken Okusama. Okusama can only sleep during the traveling time you see. The Aaron San I am seeing now was somehow, much more worn out than when I last saw her and that she even had dark circles under her eyes. Sleeping in between traveling time? Sounds like the average salary man on the crowded train. Is this what it is like for most aristocrats? My image of their elegance crumbled. Anyways, as I was saying, I am going to thoroughly research on the work life of Erin, from the famous Rainforest Earl family. The morning for a mage aristocrat is early. Even before daybreak, the coach is already swaying, proceeding towards the slightly far off farmlands. Next, using magic, she started to fill water into the stone water reservoirs. She added water to the stone water reservoirs that surrounded the coach within a wide radius. Of course. During her time in the coach, it was her all-important sleep time. Not a single second was wasted. The next job was regarding the construction and maintenance of buildings. Holding the stones that were prepared beforehand, she started to chant magic. In the twinkle of an eye, the rock fused, broke apart, underwent a change in shape and became the building blocks in the construction of a new building. Too awesome. When she was using magic, she opened up her glittering eyes that were closed earlier. Her bloodshot eyes were frightening. Next was to harvest and transport raw cotton to the storehouse. Madame held onto a clump of cotton and began her chants. As soon as she did so, the cotton spun itself into threads. Stella San and I held onto the spool of thread and using it as the core, we wound up the cotton thread that was made by magic. Seems likely that I was called over to help out in this. This is a boring and tedious work. And it took quite some time to finish. Despite our efforts though, the storehouse contained barely any cotton wool and we already had to make our way to the next workplace. Maintenance of buildings, production of swords, armors and other equipment, production of glass products, etc, etc. What a secondary industry. From this we can see that mages are a complex version of a factory. Next, Aaron San returned to the residence late at night. Mage is simply a term for an employee working in a black business. In order to have a late night meal, Aaron San went to the dining room. The job of cooking the meal was delegated over to the servant that was on duty, while Stella San and I made preparations for her bath. Stella Sama, I am amazed that Aaron Sama had to do all that. I never once thought that the aristocratic mages would be treated as a factory. From my innermost depths, I was surprised for I had willfully imagined that aristocrats would be visiting salons, and if they were mages, they would be in charge of eradicating magic beasts. Yes, originally the role of assisting the villagers was divided between the mages of the rainforest family but ever since a number of people followed Danisama to the capital, there was a shortage of mages in our domain. Still, 
Okusama has earned her resolve to work hard in these two years, since these jobs all require the indispensable help of mages. Stella-san said as she wept you -u. Even the expressionless beauty is shedding tears. However, Stella-san, hold it right there. I don't think that there are any jobs that only mages can do. Couldn't these jobs be done given some time and effort? As I was scrubbing the stone bathtub, I had a thought spontaneously. By the way, Stella Sama. Right now, the bathtub is empty, so how are going to go about preparing the bath? Stella San turned towards the medicinal herbs specially used for baths and replied while giving her isn't this obvious? Face. Of course. The Okusama always adds them to her baths. I instinctively looked up at the sky. Loading. May Dark 11 The Madam's Maid Part 2. Loading. Translated by Wami. Ma. Mu. Is this a technique which farmers employ to combat fatigue? This feels awfully good. Currently, I'm using an effective method to remove tiredness and I am now giving Aaron San, who is submerged in the bathtub, an eye massage. This is called a massage. Using the hands to massage, blood circulation can be improved and stiff muscles can be loosened up with this skill. When Okusama was using magic, your eyes were scar, cough cough. Excuse me. I mean your eyes were overused so. I thought that your eyes might be tired and with all due respect, I have been impolite in my actions. Are you experiencing any discomfort? No, it is very good. Please continue on like this. Being given Aaron San's approval, I continued up to the head massage before today's bath ended. Together with Stella San, we wiped Aaron San's body with cloth. I'm still a midget. Thus, I was responsible for her lower half body. Anyways, it was unbelievable that her body was one which had already conceived two kids. In addition, despite being naked and being wiped by cloth, Aaron San was unperturbed, as expected of her. I had thought of her as a complex version of a factory but, Aaron San had behaved as though it was natural for her to be waited upon. She is a proper aristocrat Samaha. Lastly, while we put on her neglected clothes for her, the Aaron San that had kept up her silence till now said, make you my assistant for tomorrow, and went back to her restroom in a spirited mood. Without my response, Stella San replied with understood and followed Aaron San. I hurriedly followed behind but Stella San told me to rest up as tomorrow would be an early day so, I bowed and saw them off, and then, for the next few days, I helped out the madam and could oversee her schedule but nothing much had changed in her daily routine. Still, there were some minor changes in what was being produced. Every single day, as a factory, she produced all sorts of objects splendidly. The most time-consuming and difficult task for them all was the cotton yarn winding. No matter how we hurry, we could only come up with a small amount of yarn and, it wasn't as exciting as constructing a building. On the third day of attending Aaron San, we encountered another mage for the first time. It was a middle-aged man with an unshaven face and he showed signs of exhaustion. His haggardness could be seen from his dark eye bags, rough skin and the paleness of his face. He was in an extremely bad condition. He appears to be a mage that primarily handles the growth of crops. I heard from Stella San that spirit users are good at growing crops, so they specialize in doing so. It seems that Madam can be considered a magician. Speaking of which, back in the past at Garagari village, the two mages that came also called themselves either a spirit user or magician. I wonder if this means they have different spheres of expertise. According to the fatigued man, thanks to the thousand teeth thresher, the villagers speed of cultivating their lands had become faster and that the work in the rural areas had become busier. In addition, he discussed with Madame about the diminishing amount of spirits living in soil causing crops to not grow as he wished. Listening closely to his words, Madame said that it had to be done and that it wasn't a question of whether to do it or not. This was the kind of guiding principle that black businesses uphold themselves to and with it, all complaints are rejected. The worn out spirit user had a deeper look of death carved into his face after hearing that. Roughly one week has passed since I became Aaron Sands maid and as usual, she always said you will help me tomorrow again after I gave her a massage while she was in her bath. And as always, I thought Stella San would reply that she understood, but this time, she hesitated for a moment. Allow me to humbly say, Okusama, 
Actually, ever since he became Okusama's assistant, Alan-sama has been in a stormy mood. The other servants have been troubled by this too. Kane-sama said that if Mew was around, he would be able to behave better though. What should I do? Oh Alan, stop letting your hair down all the time because your boss isn't around. Your boss is ashamed of you. Later I have to re-educate you. Oh, about Alan. I see. Return to being my son's maid as per norm tomorrow. But you have to give me the massage at night. I cannot back off on that. I shall obey. Stella-san and I said so in unison and bowed. My duty as madam's personal attendant has been concluded as of today. It was tough. I heard that the previous maid that served madam had collapsed but it seems that she is now recovering. Seems like overwork. This black corporation is terrifying. I am still a child and for tasks that are physically demanding, I would receive help from Stella San. Even so, I am exhausted. Stella San is quite the superwoman. Impressive. Even though Stella San has assisted me, I am still tired from all that and there are still things that I want to do so Alan's behavior might have saved me there. Being Madam's attendant means that I had to accompany the busy Madam everywhere. Hence, there wasn't any time to do things that I want. Furthermore, because I hadn't been around, the proud Alan had behaved unacceptably, as the big boss, I have got to instill some discipline. Amu, tomorrow I have to properly work him hard. Let's do that. Loading. May Dark 12 back to being the Bouchima's maid. Loading. Translated by Wami. Early in the morning, I went out from the back door of the residence's bathroom, that could only be used by the masters, and saw, not far away, another female servant. She had a pail filled with water and was washing clothes, making the basha basha sound while doing so. A kind looking auntie with a good physique. She must be Mary. Mary Sama. Are you doing the laundry here? Early isn't it? Are you? Morning. By the way, you can drop the Sharma with me. Aren't you early yourself? Yes, I am going to do make some preparations. And next, I went on with surveying the ground. There was gravel all around here. The size of the gravels were generally large, being roughly 5 centimeters in diameter. Just what I needed. After being satisfied with my surveying, I turned back face Mary and asked. Is Mary going to continue washing the laundry here? Why not do it at the washing area? If it was as per normal, most people would have done it at the place assigned for doing laundry. I usually go there to wash cane bout charmer and incidentally, Alan's clothes there. The washing area is meant for washing the master's clothes, you see. The clothes washed here are the servants' attires. We use the bath water that's left after Okusama is done with her bath. It contains so ap nuts so using it makes it easier to wash off dirt. Ah, so that's so ap nuts. It's the herb that Stella San always carries around her. I've always noticed that the madam's bathtub is empty the day after she used it, so this was what happened. It was fully utilized by the servants to wash their clothes. Great for ecology. Mary San, thank you for your constant guidance. It's all right. You don't have to thank me for everything. Considering that ever since you came, the number of dirty clothes Alan Bouchama usually racks up has decreased, making my work easier. Though it has increased again as of late. Damn shitty brat. Sorry. From today, I will return to being the Bouchama's maid and I would make sure to instruct him carefully to prevent it. Ahaha. Are you seriously saying that? You don't seem like a child at all. Young yet dependable. Well. My mental age is indeed around your level. If I continued to stay and chat with Mary San, I would likely be a hindrance to her work so I decided to cut off the conversation at an appropriate timing and hastily went on with my preparations. I made sure to inform Mary San that I would be doing some work here, and of course I gained Stella San's approval beforehand so please do not be bothered by my presence. First and foremost. I pushed the gravel with my feet around a former circle with one meter in diameter, after which, I piled some big rocks and firewood in the circle. This sounds quite simple but it took a significant amount of time, compounded by the fact that I only have a physical body of a five-year-old. Doing anything at all would easily make me tired, and my movement is sluggish too. Moving these heavy objects was tough. I took a short break and realized that the young masters should be waking up anytime soon. I quickly dusted my attire and went to their room. Knock. 
Knock. Good morning, Kane Sama. May I enter? No replies came from inside the room. They were probably still asleep. I was taken aback as I didn't expect Kane Bauchama to be the type to oversleep. Saying excuse me, I entered the room. There were bulges on the canopy bed, as I thought so. They were still in La La Land. The curtains shielded the room from the morning sun, cladding the room in darkness. For starters, let's flood the room with sunlight. I drew open the curtains. The room was bathed in sunlight in one go. Even though the radiance struck above their eyelids, all that could be heard from the bed was their monotone Yuan cries. I stood by the side of the bed and greeted morning, and Kane bowed Charmer and Alan replied Yuan again while snuck underneath their covers. Yet again, Alan had crawled into Kane bowed Charmer's bed. This happens regularly. Perhaps he feels lonely. Well, he is a five-year-old. I was sincerely sorry to interrupt their good night's sleep but, I hardened my heart and flipped their covers over. The Bouchimas were wearing their bathrobe like pajamas, which was creased and wrinkled, after sleeping on their bed, for now. Since they are children it is acceptable but, to continue sleeping on the same bed after they grow older, people might get the wrong idea. It is morning already. Breakfast has been prepared. Please wake up. I pressed on. The first reaction came from Alan. Un. He laid down on the bed before lifting his face and as he met my eyes, something twinkled in his eyes. He started shouting, It's you. And jumped to his feet, unexpectedly. He was extremely excited and I too, was startled at his enthusiasm. I had imagined him to shout that my pain in the butt, boss, is finally came back and make a disgusted face. Don't you? Kane Bouchama had been awoken by Alan's shouting and while rubbing his drowsy face, he slowly rose. Kane Bouchama probably has low blood pressure. Morning was when he looked sheepish. It's really you. Morning. Said Kane Bouchama as he sweetly smiled. An amazing angelic smile. His sheepish half asleep look was good. I archived his smiling face into my mind's folder. What? You? I was told that Okaasama found you useless ultimately, and so you came back huh? Alan was extremely delighted. I see, I see. Damn Alan. He had wanted to spout his nonsense to me all this. What a reliable brat. Initially, I had thought that he was such a cute henchman, but now I have to return the borrowed sense of warmth. So I heard a rumor about some henchman that had been behaving riotously while his boss wasn't around. Since there was no way to resolve this problem. I have returned. A. Someone is behaving righteously. You. Do you have any other henchmen other than me? Alan's face looked as if he was greatly shocked. I'm talking about you. Mr. Alan. Please realize. Your boss is being sarcastic here. I don't have any other henchmen. This means. Some other henchman out there. Is he from another faction? Could it be the brat from the adjacent town at Fatty Arms Coffin's place? No worries, you. That dude definitely has plump palms, a bulging belly and fat legs. There is no way he can oppose me, declared Alan braggingly. He puffed up his chest in pride and looked at me with his twinkling eyes. As expected of my henchman, reliable. Was what I wanted to say, but I won't say it anyways. What is this Fatty Arms Coffin? Who is it? There are other factions? This was my first time hearing about it, don't count on me to join in the conflict. I sighed, and decided not to continue this topic. Beside Alan was Kane Bouchama cowering and shivering as he tried to restrain his laughter. Isn't it the job of the elder brother to prevent his little brother from going berserk? Kane Bouchama. Alan Sama, I have yet to hear anything about this fatty coffin San. More importantly, Breakfast has been prepared. Please allow me to assist in changing your clothes. Today you have sword practice. Hence, let's make do with a set that is easy to move in. Speedily. I selected the clothes from their closets and assisted in their change of clothes. We are all children. So for now, helping them change is okay but in the future, I feel it's best to search for a male servant to deal with this. It appears that Alan and Kane Bouchama felt somewhat awkward about it. I combed their hair and gave them a seal of approval on their heads that guaranteed that it is decided that today would be a perfect day before sending them off to the dining room. I retrieved their pajamas and informed the other servant to Nain, who was in charge of the room's management and tidiness, that the Bouchamas have woken up and they would proceed to have their breakfast. 
I then rushed off to the dining room myself. I have to help them in their meals or else. Dot somehow, rather than being the boss, oi a bun, I am more like the parent oi a. Well, I am their maid, so that's fine. Loading. May Dark 13 Founding of the Nation and Assembling a Spinning Wheel. From now on, I would be referring to Aaron San as Irene San. Should have realized earlier, face palm. Also, I came to realize when translating this chapter, that back in chapter 20, I made the mistake of translating stone water reservoirs as wells. I have corrected it, I should have realized it sooner if I had actually considered the logic behind it. Sorry for that. Anyways, enjoy this chapter. This chapter contains twice the usual length of words by the way. Yami. Loading. While observing Irene San's job scope, two thoughts came to mind. First was to build wells and the other was to make a spinning wheel. With wells, there will no longer be a need for mages to specially make a trip TP replenish water supplies and with a spinning wheel, it would be possible for anybody to spin thread by themselves. It's just that, for a water well, even building a prototype would be beyond my means and thus, I am going to prioritize first on the spinning wheel. However, the construction would have to wait after studying. I have lesson time with the home tutor now. Today's lesson is history. This time, the lesson is on a rather old legend, during the period known as the Age of Mythology. Even though it is a legend, it seems that this country doesn't have a religion that seems like a religion. The story gave vibes similar to that of their Nihon Shoki, or the myths about the Greek gods, it feels right. However, I can't shake off the feeling that the predicament this country is in stems from their ideology, their raison d'etre for establishing this new nation and their ambitions for it. These were mentioned at the last part of the legend of the founding of the Castell Nation. According to the narrative, the Castell Nation where we all reside in presently was a cunt rebuilt by the gods. During the age of mythology, magic could be casted without saying their incantations. As of such, mages were omnipotent and they got so carried away that they called themselves gods. The arrogant mages clustered together and lived together in their kingdom of gods, the great magic empire Pandora. In this era, their empire was the only absolute leader of the continent. The mages of that time were full of themselves. They were brutal and cold-hearted, turning the whole of the non-mage human population into slaves and toying around with them as though they were lesser beings even when compared to beasts. Nevertheless, the non-mage human soon discovered how to make iron, and could forge resilient swords, shields, armor, helmets and other equipment. The humans that were slaves, stealthily sharpened their fangs, and finally rose their flag of rebellion towards the mages. No matter how the prideful mages held the belief that the powerless humans shouldn't be able to achieve anything with their strength, their numbers were simply too great. Furthermore, their iron armor could some way or another withstand the magical attacks from the mages and that their swords, when skillfully swung on the mages, could also slice them into pieces. The war between the mages and the humans grew protracted. Not long later, a group of mages brokering for peace for both sides appeared. This third faction would later become the gods that founded the Castell Nation. However, at that time, the super-conceited King of Magic of Pandora, kicked their pleas for peace to one side, claiming that those who possess such feeble mindsets have no rights to be mages, and ended up with attacking this third faction of mages. Having said that, the humans too, couldn't accept the ideals of the third faction as they couldn't trust mages at all. It was around this period of time when the King of Magic died all of a sudden and a new ruler was crowned. This ruler was later given insulting nicknames such as Queen of Darkness, Queen of the Undead and the Ruler of the Rotting and Decaying, and was considered the evilest Queen of Magic. This Queen of Magic didn't give a damn to the appeals from the third faction and of course, ordered the advance of her troops to eliminate the humans. It was truly an intense battle. Among the mages under the Queen of Magic were her necromancers. They were rare mages who knew how to control the dead. Because the dead could rejoin her army, mages that were killed by the humans could be revived and on the other hand, humans that were slaughtered were revived as part of her army. Yet, this zombie army would mistakenly kill mages who were supposed to be their allies, thus, creating a bloodbath for both the humans and the mages. Most could only think about escaping from it. Unfazed by the deaths of her own allies, 
the Queen of Magic continued to steadily expand her domain. We can no longer stand this, was what the mages in the Third Force thought and cooperated. Eventually they managed to corner the Queen of Magic, bringing a stop to her zombie army. And next, they vowed never to repeat history again and started their own country. Thus, the country known as Castell was born. The mages, in a bid for unity between humans and mages, swore never to tyrannize the humans and promised to give them a prosperous life. The humans were grateful to have been saved from the grasp of the Queen of Darkness and the Bloody War. Once again, humans revered mages as gods and agreed to build a new nation with them. The whole plan to have the mages grant riches to the humans while the humans' job was to worship them, gave birth to the current black organization. These mages slog away day and night for their sakes. It is a tragic sight. From what I have seen at Tyrene Sand's work, this legend could be a historical fact. Classroom learning has ended so the young masters are currently having sword practice. Apart from the laundry and other miscellaneous work, I decided to sit at the place where I laid out the stones and firewood in the morning and wrestle with the construction of the spinning wheel. Seems like Mary Sam had finished washing the clothes since wasn't there any more. To start off, I took out a clump of cotton which I had obtained from Stella San and confirmed the process of producing thread, it was likely to be similar to how coiry can be made from tissues, it was probably twisted until it became a thread, I started twisting some cotton, it took some time but after some twisting, a thread like thing was made, the more twists on the thread, the better it felt but, as expected, doing this manually took a lot of time, I want to make it easier to increase the number of rotations, speaking of rotating, a spinning top, it is a toy targeted at small children in my previous life, it could with a single turn, revolve for many rounds, I searched for a twig near the area, and tried winding the thread on the twig but it looks like the weight, of the twig, wasn't sufficient and I couldn't smoothly rotate around it, this time, I tried tying a rock under the twig and did it again, and rotating it, felt great, oh, as I was thinking, I continued pulling the cotton, rotating and did what you might call coiling around the twig, which in itself might be called spinning yarn. TN, not much explanation and description for this. Check out YouTube for yarn spinning to gain a better idea. P, nevertheless, while this might be a feasible technique, the method which I had envisioned involves a spinning wheel and should have, you know, a wheel-like thing to spin cotton. Most likely, if that was the case, in sync with the rotation of the wheel, the produced thread would be coiled around a rod, it would work as the wheel spun. In all honesty, I have only seen pictures of its schematics during a history lesson in school. Hence, I might not be very sure but I think this should be how it works. If it comes down to the wheel-like object, I would require a kind of belt to propagate the rotation, that could be made with wood later, and would it involve shaving of wood? I would have to assemble some equipment but hey, that requires money and I don't get paid, Mew, so you were over here huh? What are you doing? When did Kane bout Charma and Alan got so close? Ah, this is bad. I put too much concentrated at work and completely did not notice. Has it been a long time since they were here? Sorry, bout Charma. Sword practice must have ended. We have to clean off the sweat don't we? I shall make preparations. I got up in a hurry to ready the bath but Kane bout Charma stopped me squatted down and looked at the spool of thread that I was holding, no, it is fine for now, by the way, what is that, this is called a spinning wheel, I am still thinking about making it and have been testing with some prototypes, what is a spinning wheel, Alan and Kane bout Chama's eyes were both fixated on the tool, it is a tool to spin thread from cotton, I thought about building one as far as I could with my own abilities but gathering the required tools for construction seems too difficult for me so I have been thinking about sending a drawn up blueprint to Claude Sama. He should be able to at least vaguely understand the blueprint, I wager so. Between building it all by myself and discussing it with Claude Sama, the latter approach would yield faster results I believe. While I'm at it. I could try to present another blueprint on Wells too. For writing materials such as pen and paper, they are easily obtainable from the lessons, therefore, the equipment needed is all there. I shall do that, that there existed such a tool. I didn't know that, 
What about the campfire-ish stones and firewood that you have piled here, are they for the spinning wheel? said Kane Bouchama as he pointed towards the set of stones and firewood that I assembled in the morning. No, that has nothing to do with the spinning wheel, that is for Okusama's bathtub. I am thinking of placing some heated stones into the water. There has been arrangements for the head chef to come here at night to set the stones on fire. Heated stones? Yes. Placing the heated stones in the water. The temperature of the water would increase and heating the water was the plan. The Okusama has been using her bathtub every night but, she would always have to personally use magic to heat the water so, I thought if only we could prepare that on our side. Is that so? That would be good, said Kane Bouchama, beside Kane Bouchama who was smiling gently. There was a child that was acting in an awfully strange way ever since started talking about the madam. Of course, that was Alan. It was like, as though he heard something really amazing from me, because he did that, it cannot be helped. I took a look at Alan, and he looked like he was about to utter something and that he was racking his brain for the right words. Dot dot you, Okar-san. Is she in good health? Alan had at long last, squeezed out his thoughts, and said in a feeble, e voice, while frantically putting on the guise of being uninterested in it, it would to talk about her health, it would be that she is healthy, however, she has been very busy with work, and has been in a constant state of fatigue, he h, i s c mumbled Mr. Allen. He seemed like he wanted to ask more questions yet he was unable to do so because he didn't what was good to say. Nevertheless, she has been concerned about Alan Sama and Kane Sama. When Irene San got wind of the information from Stella San that Alan has been acting violently without his boss, she made a prompt decision to send me back. As I conveyed her concerns, Alan's expression became more cheerful immediately. Next, Alan realized that he became delighted unconsciously and knit his brows awkwardly and returned to his usual cheeky expression. Well, I couldn't care either way. It's all right without Okar-san anyways, he said pretending to be tough. His bluff was clear as day. There were no indications of him trying to hide his bluff. No wait, he might be trying to hide it but he was totally unable to conceal it. Or, what is this? Cute. So readable. Oh, oh, did he long for his mother that much? Just as I was about to grin reflexively, the cane bout charmer next to me was grinning. It felt like Kane Bouchama was also able to understand Alan's affection for his mum. What is wrong with both of you? Weird faces you're making. What is going on? Alan's face went all red and he started barking in his usual style. The grinning Kane Bouchama started patting on Alan's back to calm his agitation. If the spinning wheel is completed, there would surely be more time for Irie and San to have dinner together with them on normal occasions. The family time that Alan and Kane Bouchama deeply wanted, the one thing that I truly wanted, at all costs, in my previous life. Loading. May Dark 14 brought to you by the The Nay I Digest. Nay I means domestic affairs in this context. The author wrote the The Nay I in English. Thus I am leaving it as it is. The chapter felt kind of fast-paced. Probably because the author is rushing the plot. Enjoy as always. Loading. The heated stone bath was a total success and Irene Sand gave high praises for it. The minerals from the stones started to seep into the bath, causing the water to naturally feel somewhat smooth. The job of the heated stone bath was later added to the daily routine, and I became responsible for the fetching of water and the filling of the bathtub, whereas another servant was in charge of chopping firewood and heating the stones, that is because it would be dangerous for children to handle fire, nevertheless, my role of using a bucket to fetch water is crazy tough, countless of round trip were needed and my muscles would be aching all over after doing so, however, I won't be lamenting about it, after all, this is the black organization. Also, I completed the blueprints for the spinning wheel and the well, and brought it to Claude San. He decided to postpone all his other work, in order to focus entirely on the blueprints. However, as for the well, it's a little. The feel wasn't right. Somehow, there appears to be contraptions resembling wells in this world, for a biggish city like the capital. There are various districts that have such wells. Just that, in the past, when they wanted to build the wells in the rainforest domain, the people would say, A, drawing water from a well is hev, Y, 
and it will take Tim, e. It is unreasonable for the weak and would hurt the wastes of the age too, it's impossible, impossible, and similar other complaints. Back then, there was a sufficient number of mages, and they thought there should more than enough mages to handle this job, so they settled on using a bond method instead. No, when I heard about it, I was like seriously, R? I won't be generous with my words, can't you all at least draw water from the wells? But could that be because I'm narrow-minded? Could it be that my heart has already been tainted by the ways of the black organization? Is that it? Claude Sand suggested that with the lack of mages currently, there could be no other option but to rely on Wells to deal with the problem. Thus, I desperately hid the black rue in my mind and replied that I would try my best to come up with an improvement for the blueprint, something like allowing water to be drawn while hardly requiring any strength and took back the blueprint from Claude San. K. Later on, I presented to Claude San a pump system that can replace and improve the pulley mechanism for drawing water. I drew insights from a piston made for a squirt gun during a primary school science lesson to design the pump system. A kind of vacuum state would be present inside the well when it is filled with water. If a pipe is installed and pressure is applied in a piston motion, I believe that water would squirt out. I haven't really conducted an experiment so I don't really know if it would work. Hence, I came up with a second plan to improve it. For the time being, I would build a sample to test this second enhancement. The spirit user could detect where the water veins were and intuitively knew where to apply his magic to dig. He did so and water emerged from the hole. From then, Irene San once again casted her magic to surround the hole with stones constructing a well in about the same time it takes to say R. Indeed she was a top class mage. With a mage around, there wouldn't be any need for a shovel nor heavy machinery. The town's odd job worker, mages, the prototype model of the spinning wheel that I had devised in the blueprint was reproduced by the nimble fingers of the servants. The method to spin the yarn was uncomfortable from our initial testings, so we had it slightly adjusted, but apart from that, the spinning wheel was completed, by turning the pulley handle, the spool of thread would start revolving producing a clack clack sound, while the cotton would whirl and twist into thread. Seems somewhat fun, for the people who were first introduced to the spinning wheel, it took some lectures and training before they could spin the yard easily and match Tyrene Sand's production capacity. For starters, the spinning wheel was placed at a village located nearest to us. This was a scheme aimed at encouraging farmers to spin yarn with the additional time they have on their hands, thanks to the thousand tooth thresher. The yarn made could be sold for extra cash, albeit it being a small amount. Upon hearing this, the villagers' morale ran higher than usual, a fraction of the harvested crops would be collected as tax. As for the rest of the crops, it could be for self-consumption, could be sold or exchanged for other crops or other items. It appears that most farmers would use up all their harvest in this manner, they do not face much hardship in their lives, but they are hardly able to maintain any savings at all. Under the aristocrats' domains, work for them is easy, however, the tax is rather high. Back at Garagari village, there was hardly any taxation. I believe what they call pioneering rural settlements were simply villages that have been abandoned. It was an experimental area to see if the fields could be cultivated without the help of the mages. When tax collectors came, they didn't really seem to be expecting any tax from us then. Translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com, many different things were introduced all at one go but in the end, the demerits of the new installations appeared. Firstly, regarding the wells. A pump model would be effective so we proceeded with the installation of wells with pumps all over the rainforest domain. Nevertheless, words of opposition like this, scooping water from the stone water reservoir is faster and we are very used to this system too, would be heard every now and then. Noisy, shut up, is what I really felt like saying but I endured it. And at the information session, I persuaded them by saying water from wells are more hygienic, the water temperature would be more constant, and furthermore, using the handle to draw water is fun. I did so while giggling like a five-year-old, portraying the fun I had while drawing water. As for the spinning wheel, I knew that no matter what, 
using magic to manufacture yarn compared to using the spinning wheel, could increase the absolute quantity of yarn produced. In other words, using the same amount of cotton, magic can mysteriously produce more yarn compared to physically producing it with the spinning wheel. Speaking of which, back at the Garagari village, the mages were able to use three strands of straw to make the fish trap when three strands shouldn't have been enough. It seems that magic has the ability to augment the amount of material. What is the mechanism behind it? No, does it even have a mechanism or it is just magic? Magic doesn't need a logic behind it? I can't understand anything anymore. Nevertheless, the quantity produced in a day through the division of labor between villagers far outstrips that of magic, so we can afford to overlook it. It was decided that we proceed with manufacturing yarn using the spinning wheel. The production of yarn was progressing smoothly. On the contrary, we ran into a new problem of exhausting the supply of cotton and already used the last harvest of cotton. There were times when I had to do work related to the well and the spinning wheel, and had to leave the residence temporarily but I still serve mainly as the young master's maid. Occasionally, while I'm at work in the residence, a certain female with a super angry expression would come storming in while yelling. She is a mage. As another fellow mage of the rainforest family domain, her main duty was to use dyed yarn made by the dying master and turning it into cloth. In short, she is a weaving mage. From my conversations with Claude San, the production of yarn recently has become too fast and she can't keep up with the weaving. Her workplace was teeming with yarn, so much so that all that she sees and breathes is just yarn. Key I, this was the complaint she brought up. I see, I see, she must be on the brink of depression. No, however, she should be all right if she can still squeal. Key I energetically, while you are still yourself. It should be possible to finish it, for our dear company, we would work hard. I, who has completely embraced the ways of the black business, was going to admonish her like that but Claude San, who was beside me, launched a preemptive attack by replying, I got it, now then, what shall we have you build for us then? Hey, what about my opinions of it? No way, Ki I, as my final act of desperation, I tried asking, this job is just about producing cloth products, how about the other mages, are they doing well in their work? But they were alright, so I had to reluctantly accept the task of drawing up a blueprint for a weaving loom. The entire process of producing cloth products is something like this, farming, seed planting, humans, greater than forced growth of crops, mages, greater than crop harvesting, humans, greater than yarn making was mages previously, greater than dyeing, humans, greater than weaving, mages, greater than sewing, humans, some parts mages, greater than shipping and selling, humans, the part on forced growth of crops, mages, is something that I cannot change, so I treated it as though I didn't see it, and if I can clear the weaving part, most of the later portions can be completed by humans, come on, even weaving was delegated to mages, what is the meaning of this? R. However, even in olden Japan, there existed a princess called Orahim Sama and she was the goddess that weaved. I see, I see. Then there is no helping it. I know, I know, some way or another, even though this was an appropriate daydream to console myself, I was still left in a sulking mood after finishing the blueprint. The stance of a person stretching out the warp and connecting the weft in a zigzag way, using a skew-like object to help squeeze in the thread. This was what could be seen from an illustration of a weaving loom left behind by history. I used the first prototype to weave and the completed cloth was not bad. Still, the speed of making it was slow. The mages could do it fast. By chanting their incantations, the thread would dance on their own and weave themselves into cloth. However, do not forget that we humans possess a skill very typical of ourselves, human wave tactics. Doing so, we shouldn't lose out in speed. We installed a large amount of weaving loom and recruited workers for this the weaving. Some people from the yarn spinning group came over. Basically, urgent jobs would be done by mages whereas the rest would be made manually with weaving looms. It is likely that with more and more experience with the weaving loom, the people's speed of production should increase too. My prediction is that burden on mages would gradually decrease. After this, every once in a while, 
an exhausted spirit user guy would come with an expectation like, help, Doraemon, and plead for any tool to make his job easier. I am not a convenience stall. No by can. The only thing I knew about the job scope of a spirit user is that they force growth of crops in the face of their cheat-like abilities. There was nothing much I could do to make a difference, was what I told him. Despite that, the persistent spirit user wanted to discuss further so I decided to listen and found out that recently, the number of spirits in the fields have decreased. I can't see spirits so I have no idea what they are, yet. For the time being I told him about fertilizers, I recommended that he burn the non-cotton component of raw cotton and scatter the ashes in the fields. Still, I couldn't wipe off the thought that at any rate, as long as magic was used, this would all be meaningless. Magic is really imbalanced. As for now, with the introduction of the spinning wheel, the villagers around here would be able to use their free time to spin yarn and weave. Also, in order to reduce the constant waste of time waiting for mages to come by the farmer's fields, the time needed to wait for a spirit user to help grow the crops would be shortened. Translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Next, once I managed to complete all the troublesome work, I organized a family dinner for Irian San, whom I requested, and her sons that proceeded without a hitch. For their first dinner together, Alan, Kane Bout Charmer and even Irene San were frozen with tension and could only make forceful attempts at laughing. Claude San later joined in to have his meal, however, only Claude San was eating without any awkwardness, causing him to stand out. That too was interesting. Nevertheless, after repeating the same dinner every day, they became used to it and nowadays, they had their meals quietly as a happy family. I was extremely happy at this outcome but, honestly, my jealousy of their happy family was in no way insignificant. Just a little bit. Alan's anger management issues have decreased and regarding who helps him in his change of clothes and bathing, even if it wasn't me and was another male servant, he wouldn't yell at them. It seems that Kane Bouchama has persuaded Alan that it would be better for a male servant to assist him in his change of clothes and bathing. Indeed, it looks like Kane Bouchama has become bothered by receiving help from female servants for such kind of activities. When I had first met Kane Bouchama, he was around eight years old but right now, his was already nine. He is slowly approaching adulthood. I'm now six years old too. From around this period, a rumor that there was a sketchy man searching for me started to spread. Loading. May Dark 15 Irene Sand's secret plan and the story from now on. Um, this chapter was just WTF for me. When was Irene San so naughty lol? Have fun reading it. Loading. I was called by Claude San to come down to the guest room. At the room, both Claude San and Irene San were intensely awaiting my arrival. They were staring daggers at one another. I am dearly sorry. It appears that I have been somewhat late. Right? I was told to come after finishing dinner so I stuffed dinner down my stomach as fast as I could and race walked my way to the room and still. I was late. The aura that loomed around the room was petrifying. Nope. You were early. Will you please sit here? Up till now, Claude San had been making a slightly angry expression but upon seeing me, the gentleness in his face returned and he prompted me to take the seat beside him. I was charmed by his kind offer and sat right next to him. Mew, I have asked this of you many times over but, do you really not have any clue about the man who has been searching for you? Ah, this issue again. Recently, there has talk about this mysterious man who has been prying into my background and had gone around the neighborhood to seek out information on me. Moreover, for some reason, this enigmatic man covers his head with a jute bag to hide his identity and no matter how much others asked for his name, he wouldn't give a reply, and when we tried to capture him, he managed to escape without a trace. Yes, I do not think this person is an acquaintance of mine. I do not have any knowledge about a person who hides his identity like that. In response to my reply, Claude San said, I see and started mumbling to himself while casting his sight downwards. As I have feared, it could be an aristocrat from another domain, or a person from the royalty. Either possibilities means that someone has set their sights on you. He grumbled without a hint of emotion. Don't say that with a blank face. That's so ominous. 
The mysterious man that was looking for me knew that I was the one who played an integral part in developing the new tools. The theory that this man, who has been snooping around for my information, is a spy from another domain seems the most plausible among others. Well, Anisama, I can understand the possibility of the spy being sent by another aristocrat but there is no way the royalty would go so low as to secretly send a spy? No. There are things that Irian don't know. The royalty is terrifying. Under the worst circumstances, you could just vanish. Hold up, saying that I would just disappear. Am I really in such a dangerous position? I don't recall coming up with a tool that merits such treatment. This is too disturbing. No way, Anisama is exaggerating things. There's no way such things can happen right? However, there is a possibility that the other aristocrats have taken notice of the tools that we have put up on market. They must have dispatched people to investigate on it. The fact that Ryu was the one who initiated the development of these tools should have been concealed. Still, in either case, as Claude San said so, he placed his arm over my shoulders, triggering Irene San to stare penetratingly at him. Ryu is my property. I have no intention of handing her over to anyone. Claude San was giving an unusually serious look at Irene San for some reason. The aura of the room that was momentarily peaceful ever since I came in became tense again. No. You is mine. Didn't you say the other time that you bought her from me? Irene San was putting up a fight against the stern-looking Claude San. Somehow, the both of them have been fighting over for this merchandise me. Good grief, I wish I wasn't left out from this discussion. Annual income, welfare, job scope, location of workplace and workplace environment. Please examine all this before coming to a conclusion. Such were the rights that I do not possess. 8. Irene San and Claude San, which one shall I pick? Or more like, will my job scope change? Whichever way I choose would be the same won't it? No, I'm not selling her. You will stay by my side, I had purchased her originally for one gold coin you know. Claude San jacked up the price in a nonchalant manner, wasn't it just three silver coins? This person is really shrewd. If that's the case, I willing to fork out two gold coins. No way I'm selling her, she will be my maid. How about platinum coins? Platinum coins? N eh, no, it's still a no. No matter how much you offer. I won't sell her. Claude San wavered for a second there. Why, Anisama, didn't you promise me from the start that if I'd take a liking to her, you would sell her to me? That was the case but I have also taken a liking to her beyond my imaginations. So I decided to have her as my maid. Hence, when Cardendono returns, I would be taking you to my company. Eh? What did you just say? Cardensamu is, if I am correct, Irina Kasama's husband? Is he returning back? I couldn't help but interrupt the auction. Yes, that's right, Ryu. Unfortunately, Otisama has to stay in the capital but he managed to reach a point where he can take a break and would be coming back, said Irene San in elation. This means Kane Bout Charmer and Alan's further is coming back. Hey, this is a good thing. However, if I remember correctly, the reason for Claude San staying at this residence is because the head of the household was absent. I see, that's why he is going back to his company. From their conversation, Claude San's company is headquartered not too far away but even then, movement still requires the use of coaches, and that going back cannot be done on the spur of the moment. If I became Claude San's maid, I would have to be separated from this place. I have gotten along well with everyone here and gotten used to my work. If it was possible, I really, really, don't want a change in workplace. Staying behind and working under Irene San seems to be the better option. All right, let's support Irene San. Go for it, Irene San. Irene, why are you so eager to have her by your side? Even Alan has become more tamed as of late, and that there shouldn't be any work that specifically requires the help of you. Furthermore, there is this dodgy person investigating on you too, and it would be much safer for her to be at my company. That may be true but I, truthfully, need Ryu's help, said Irene San as she fidgeted restlessly. A, eh, what could it be? Apart from the things I have been today already, is there anything else? Dot could be this be a new startup? There is always a lack of personnel in black startup companies. What is it? If that's the case. 
Can't we have her complete it before joining me at the company? However, this is something she cannot do now. This is a request that can be done only after a few years have passed. A few years later? Specifically, what do you want? Immediately, Irene San turned to meet my eyes. It feels as though she wanted to say something and that after being slightly troubled by it, she said it out straight. I want her to conduct sex education for my sons. Eh? What did you just say? You said sex ed. Dot, is that the so-called thing? Or do you mean something like health and physical education? No, I could have misheard it. There's no way it's that. However, the Claude San beside me began to panic. From his flustered expression, I felt that it was more likely to be sex ed, real, intercourse. W what are you saying, Irene? That is something for the older and more experienced to handle isn't it? Exactly. Totally. Claude San. That kind of thing should, indeed, would be best guided by a veteran. But, back in my time, my partner was Gouda Ojis. Compared to boys, girls' sex education doesn't go all the way but, when I was first shown it, the thing I felt was Gouda Ojis. I still have nightmares on it now. That's why I won't allow the same thing to happen to my sons. Alan and Kane Bouchama both fancy you too, so isn't that a good arrangement? WWWW What are you saying, Irene? That's no good. Firstly, Mew is far too young. She obviously doesn't have any experience. Such a partner wouldn't be appropriate. We need to get someone who is experienced. That's right. You said it right. Claude San. I was inexperienced even during my previous lifetime. I'm still very pure. I was initially hoping to join Irene's faction in my job search, and now, in a complete reversal. I pinned my hopes on Claude San instead, if we did it that way. It would be the same as Anasama, Mary would have to do it won't she? A, eh, Mary? The lady that was washing the clothes. She had a kind nature and had a good physique, but just a bit older Mary San. R, that's what it is, Claude San's first and the most important experience was taken care of by, I see. Dot R, whoops. I was kinda picturing it. There's nothing particularly bad about Mary. No good. Even you are still single at this age Anisama, because your first with a female was with Mary who was past her prime. As of such, I'm sure she wasn't very good at it, and that you've lost interest in girls. Having a young partner, especially one that is on close terms would definitely be a better choice. There won't be any bad memories. Wah. There's no way that I have no interest in females. Moreover. Mary wasn't that particularly bad, she was extremely g gentle to me. Claude Sand started to blush. Please, I beg you, stop describing your memories of that. I would subconsciously play back how gentle Mary San was in the back of my mind, so please, stop. A maid's coaching on cleaning the first hole I scrubbed. R, oh no. I even came up with the title, My Brain. Reboot. Even after erasing my mind of these extraneous thoughts, I couldn't shake off the image of an irremature lady. Ah, it's not working. I couldn't reboot my brain at all. Eh, furthermore, don't we have many young and beautiful maids? For example, wouldn't Stella be great? Ark, stop. Claude San. Stella San or anyone else. Please don't add new characters. No way. She is a clean freak. In addition, other than you or Mary. There are no other maids that are not of an aristocrat's lineage or kin. I can't make such a request to them. Looking at how Irene San spoke about it while scowling, Claude San's shoulders drooped and he sighed. Eh, don't give up Claude San. Keep at it. I was thinking about this when the day's second firm expression was made. Irene San winced for a brief moment. That being so, we need to hurry up and bring a professional from the town. No matter what is done. You would stay with me so that proposal is a no-go. You wouldn't be bothered by that right? Yes. I'll be in your care. I shook off all the wild delusions in my head and gave a reply to Claude San that was much better than when I first came to the residence. Irene San pouted. The way her cheeks puffed up was cute. Anyways, she appeared to have given up. That was close. Although I was just six years old, my chastity had been threatened. Good job. Claude San. Translated by Wami on Yamit Translations. Blogspot.com. Translated by Wami on Yamit Translations. Blogspot.com. And after that, I, Claude San and Irene San, who was sulking, 
continued on discussing about plans for my future. Going to the company with Claude San would have to wait for the return of the person called Carden San, hence, there is still some time left. Next, surprisingly, Claude San said he wanted to adopt me in some time in the future, when I am 10 years old and would be of age to enter a royal school. In this country, only the super elite get to enter school. In other words, the country's education system is solely represented by this sole school which only accepts royalty and aristocrats. Previously, I had discussed with Claude San that it would be beneficial if there was a place to educate children in this domain on at least, language and arithmetic, I was informed that regarding the education system, the king held full control over the reins over it and no one could build schools without his permission. The home tutor assigned to this residence also came through the good offices of the royalty machinery. This means that attending school was impossible for someone like me with rural origins. Claude San gave exceedingly high praises to me and that made me happy but, to the extent that he was willing to adopt me, the reason behind becoming Claude San's foster daughter was because the royal school only allowed sons and daughters of aristocrats to enter. It seems that Claude San held a considerably low level of peerage known as Merchant Lord. His reason for adopting me was pretty clear and I understood that it was a necessity. However, to become his foster daughter would mean becoming Claude San's family and that very thought depresses me. Honestly, I am very bad at being family. I have had my fill of bad experiences up till now. It's just that, judging from the circumstances of Claude San, I knew exactly that this didn't mean he wished for me to be family. Well, considering this to be simply a contract, I accepted the plans about becoming his adopted daughter. While I am at it, I strongly insisted that there is no way I would call him father. Claude San did not originally plan for that anyway, and that he didn't mind it being just the way it is now. I have more opinions on this matter but becoming his adopted daughter is a concern for the future. Before entering the school. I would be adopted and after graduation. I wonder if I would be helping Claude San at his company, I am not sure of what Claude San plans for me to do after that but, it doesn't seem like it is going to be a terrible life. Still, living as per planned would make me feel somewhat guilty, as I would be entering the nation's one and only school. I am sure there are more people who need to enter such an educational facility. Loading. May Dark 16 Allen's Objection. Here is another chapter of Tensai Shu O. Oh, we are near the end of the arc, just two more chapters. Happy reading. Why am me? Loading. Hey, Mew. When Otasama comes home, is it true that you would have to go somewhere else? Alan absent-mindedly popped his question at me while I was fiddling with the handles of the pump well to draw water. As soon as the lesson with the home tutor ended, we went together in our usual three-people group to fetch water for Irene Sand's bath. Alan's line of sight was directed towards the bucket placed on the ground. He wore a stiff expression with dazed eyes. This morning, during breakfast, when he heard from Irene Sand that father was coming back home, he was of course, trying his best to calm himself down, his face, however, betrayed him and it was obvious he couldn't put a hold on his delight because of the good news. Despite so, he was feeling slightly down now. Yes, there have been arrangements made for me to be taken care of by Claude Sama. Why is that? Wouldn't it be great if you continued to stay with us here? Alan, don't put you on the spot. Right on the dot when Alan was about to unleash his temper, which has been on hiatus, Kane Bouchama followed up with some positive feelings, as though he was reining in a wild horse, he gently stroked his back, it felt like he was saying whoa, whoa, to a horse, visit yamitranslations.com for the latest release, Alan Bouchama, these circumstances are made by the adults, hence, there is nothing I can do about it, even so, Alan Sama, to have made such an expression, are you that lonely without your boss around? Without a moment's delay, I laughed Fufu and agitated Alan. If he had any slight bit of his ordinary defiant attitude, the shitty brat Alan would have spontaneously recovered his anger. If he was still a shitty brat that is, dot yeah, I'll be lonely. Wasn't that obvious? Won't you be lonely too? He said so while gazing at me with eyes of strong will. Ever since time with Irene San, his mother, had increased. Alan had rapidly grown to become more frank, 
There were some remnants of obstinacy left behind in him but right now, he can no longer be described as an Amanojiku and can properly express his own feelings. Visit yamitranslations.com for the latest release. I, somehow I was at a loss for words. Of course, I would feel lonely, but whatever I say, nothing would change. I was overwhelmed by this feeling. What an emotionless human I must be. I could appeal on my loneliness at this point of time, that of course I would feel lonely. So lonely that I might die insert Mr. Dot Rabbit emoticon. But I feel that my unfeelingness would be exposed since the Alan of now would able see throughout my half-baked lies. Visit yamitranslations.com for the latest release. And as for me, I really didn't grow at all. What is this one-sided growth of Alan? In spite of him seriously being a shitty brat just a year ago. Alan Chan, you have really grown up. I am glad, was what I thought but, I felt like I have been left behind. Right now, I might even be unqualified to be his boss. Furthermore, Alan is no longer like before, he has become difficult to handle, he has become more honest and many times I find myself in a loss as to how to reply to him. Alan, the place where you is going to is Claude Ogisne's place, it is not that we would no longer be able to meet you at all and when Alan becomes 10, we would go to school together, and then, we would be able to see one another every day. Kane Bouchama couldn't just watch and do nothing about me being at a loss at words. So he followed up with that. Once again, he consoled Alan by stroking his back, and threw an ambiguous smile at me. Thank you, Kane Bouchama, for following up when Alan was going to rage and when I couldn't find the words to say. What a spectacular followist he is. That's true, Alan Sama. Certainly I share the same loneliness as you but. We would see one another again, so it will be alright. In order to not make any eye contact, I carried the bucket that had long been filled up and walked out. Similarly, the two of them followed behind while carrying buckets of water. Visit yamitranslations.com for the latest release. At first I was like, how can I let the young masters do this? But since I didn't tell them to do it for me, they were doing it as they pleased and that Alan was my henchman. I gratefully accepted their help. For one child alone, the job of transporting buckets of water and filling the bathtub was considerably laborious. Hence them joining in was extremely helpful. As I started to transport water, Alan didn't start questioning me like before. TCH. Lots of water has spilled. Or holding it this way is more stable. Or he would proudly talk about the discoveries he made while appearing to be enjoying himself. Thank you for the help today. It was very helpful. I gave my thanks while wiping off the beads of sweat on my forehead. They too were perspiring. The young masters did not enter a bathtub how Irene San always do. They stood in a simple open air showering area, wiped their bodies with a wet cloth and rubbed their hair with a herb powder that cleanses off dirt. It must be because they are boys. Their assistant for bathing was a male servant, so I was just about to call for that person when Alan pulled back my arm. Uh, Mew. I still think you should not go. Naturally he wasn't just referring to going to prepare for bath, when he said should not go. It was likely about continuing the talk we left off at the well. Alan Sama, I do not have a say in that matter and it would only just be a short period of time. I said softly while looking downwards. When I told him that there was really nothing that could be done about the situation, I felt that there was something that actually could be done. Yet, I didn't think that I wanted to go that far no matter what. I heard from mother, that you accepted to go to Claude Ajayzama's place. But for me, I don't want that. I want to continue drawing water and having lessons with you and Anisama. Even though you would only be leaving temporarily, even if it was just for a short while, I don't want it. Looking straight into Alan's eyes hurts. They were glittering with hope. To think that a child's honest feelings was such a terrifying thing. I stayed silent towards Alan's question as per usual and he continued on with the conversation. When the other servants see me, they get scared of me, and pay pointless respects to me. All they see in me is that I am a mage. But you, you are different. Even today, you didn't request me to help with my magic despite having needed to do this tiresome work of drawing water. You view me as an individual without my magic. You attend to me and Anisama as though we are like any other average pair of brothers. The only person that could do that is you. You. What do you think? 
Visit yamitranslations.com for the latest release. Please don't stare at me with those sparkling eyes. My replacement could be found anywhere else I suppose. The only difference about me is that I am insensitive to all these otherworldly magic things. Alan might have wanted me to say I want to stay. Being together is fun. Or something of the sort. If it was the Alan of these days who has been surprisingly perceptive about others. Since this was a decision by the adults, he should be able to understand that there is no changing about the fact that I have to leave for a period of time. I think. Even despite knowing so, he continuously urged me for a reply so that he could confirm that we shared the same feelings about it. I am not the only one that is like that. I'm sure if you search long enough, there will be more of such people out there. Even if others think of you in terms of your ability to use magic, there is no need fear because you are who you are, Alan Sama. And for now, to allow you to prepare for your bath. Would it be acceptable for me to excuse myself? I had accidentally refused him a little too bluntly. Alan brows knitted, face reddened and eyes became moist. I couldn't make the reply that he was likely seeking. Alan violently shook off his hand that was grabbing my arm, and shouted I'm off to wash my face. Before running off somewhere, as I was watching the Alan leave, I thought that under normal circumstances, Kane Bouchama would be chasing after him but, instead, I felt that he was coming closer to me. Mew, sorry for Alan's selfishness, it must have troubling for you. No, no problems about it. More importantly, is it alright for Kane Sama to not be chasing after Alan? I'm sure you are having it harsher than he is, said Kane Bouchama as he hugged me and with his hand around me. He tapped on my back. My heart that was on the edge managed to regain its calm. Alan had always been protected by this hand. I'm so jealous, I'm sorry. In truth, I would have had to stop Alan but I had the same feelings with him about this so I couldn't muster the strength to stop him. Once again, he expressed his apologies and patted on my back. I am seriously so jealous of Alan now, he has such a kind brother by his side, his mom is also around and his dad was coming home too. Honestly, looking at how Alan has all the things I ever wanted in his hands, all I can do is be jealous over him and jealous over him, I was relieved that I could go to Claude Sand's company, that is because I wanted to leave the residence before I become unseemly mad with jealousy on Alan and start hating him, loading, May Dark 17 surprise, somehow my eyes missed another chapter, two more chapters from now and it will be another recollection chapter and then finally the bandit arc enjoy the read loading irene sans husband has finally returned back to the rainforest domain he was handsome man and traces of kindness could be seen from his face i estimated that cardin san should be in his early 30s kane bouchama looks just like his dad there had been lots of commotion on their father's long awaited homecoming furthermore Card and San was returning together with numerous other mages so this means Irene San and the other mages who were left behind in the residence could have their burden reduced. The mages were all extremely jubilant about it. Moreover, from what I heard about Card and San from the other servants, he was apparently of royalty too. He was the seventh son born from the previous king and his concubine. If a member of the royalty was unable to use magic, he wouldn't be considered part of royalty. Hence, in general, most of them would be married to another aristocrat mage. Incidentally, the previous king had a fairly large number of sons and daughters. Hence, there are many former royal family who are currently the wives or husbands of aristocrats. The current king was Cardin San's elder brother and Cardin San was working directly under him. Cardin San is really impressive, with such an impression. With him being a former royal member and being the master of the rainforest domain, he is a very popular person. From the day Cardin San came back, there had been nearly buffet parties every day and the servants in the residence have been stressing it out. Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. The day after Cardin's welcome home party settled down, Claude San began making arrangements for Cardin San to take over the work in the rainforest domain. In just a few days, I would finally be moving. I was polishing the glass windows with cloth while feeling pensive and doubtful about the whole moving affair. Alan's sword practice had ended and he came along to my side. TN, to avoid confusion while reading. 
For the two paragraphs below here, you would be recounting the events that happened in the past few days. Ever since it had been decided that I would be leaving the residence together with Claude San, the atmosphere in our three-person group had become dissier. Afterwards, we hardly ran into one another. I could feel that the young masters were hiding something from me and that they were always doing something behind my back. They might be planning a surprise, acting on my good judgment. I pretended to not realize anything and feigned indifference to what they were doing. Mr. Allen had been busy doing for the past few days up till now but finally, today, he came to me with his chest puffed up. He had a big smile on his face. Could this be the day of surprise? To the best of my abilities, I presented a mood as though I had not seen through anything at all. Acting as per normal, I placed the cloth over the bucket and gave Alan a servant-like bow. Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. You come here for a moment. There is something I like to give you. Alan said and took my hand. I was dragged all the way to a separate building in the residence. Was this indeed a surprise? I had to be magnificently surprised by it. I was saying something like, Oh dear, Alan Sama what is it? All of a sudden, I am still cleaning the windows, even though I was obediently letting Alan pull me along. Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. When I looked towards the direction Alan was bringing me to, I saw Kane Bouchama waving at us. It was the unchanging, refreshing smile of a noble youth. Alan was guiding me, in a rough manner, to another separate building in the residence. Over here, there were many crystal and minerals that were purchased from merchants. Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. For magicians like Iron San, these mineral crystals could be used to make glass panes, swords and other kinds of equipment with magic. However, as a venue for a surprise, would this not be a little too plain? Why specifically choose this place? I threw that kind of expression at Kane Bouchama. Kane Bouchama was holding on his right hand, a dagger that was flickering under sunlight. A, eh, a dagger? Huh. Don't tell me this is how I get imprisoned here? It wasn't a surprise party but a surprise jail? No. I thought Alan was a tsundir but to think he was actually a yantir? Noticing that I have gone pale. Kane Bouchama hurriedly followed up with, don't be afraid, it is okay. I had no idea what he actually meant was okay so his follow-up had no effect. Couldn't he at least put away that object on his right hand? This was quite a tactless act for a follow ST. I have specially made a dagger for you before your departure. While saying that, Alan was carefully inspecting each and every mineral crystal piled in the building. A dagger? Indeed. The dagger I am holding on now was made by Alan. Kane Bouchama showed me his dagger as he said. Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. It was an unrefined dagger without any decorations. Somehow, the edge had a slight curve but of course, there would not be any problem with using it as a dagger. In this country, when magicians make swords and give it to someone, the sword would be proof of the trust the magician has in that person. In order to pass it to you before you leave, Alan has been training as best as he could. This dagger of mine was one he made while practicing. Kane Bouchama gave a friendly smile. He appears to be happy with Alan's maturing and growing. All right. I shall use this crystal. Mew, do you have any shape in mind? Alan walked over beaming and must be happy with the crystal he was picked. Thank you so much. It seems that you have worked hard for my sake. I don't really have any design in mind. If it is made by Alan, anything will do. I smiled while bowing, a proof of trust. Somehow, I was overcome by a feeling of guilt but I will still accept it. It would be convenient to have a knife too. Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. I got it. As Alan said. He put on a cryptic face and tightly gripped on the crystals. Kimi gat tame, Haruno no need it. Wakanit samu, wagakura motani, yuki ha fury tsusu. Literal meaning, for your sake, I will make the fields of spring come, and pick herbs, with my sleeves, despite the falling snowing. As Alan chanted, the crystal that he was holding on to changed shape, size and color and slowly took the form of a sword. Compared to the speed of Irene Sand doing her work, Alan's creation of the sword took much longer but it was neatly becoming a dagger. However, 
compared to the dagger that Kane Brouchama showed me earlier. It looked clumsier, the tip of the dagger was wobbly and pointing diagonally from his orf groan and the slumped look on his face. It must have been a failure. I will do it again and sing it in a gentler voice, he said and took a deep breath before chanting a different incantation. Esoberic, Yujinoka Wigiri, Tadina Harara Uteru, says no Jirogi. This time, the dagger he made earlier crumbled into sand, and was collected in a bucket placed underneath in advance. And holding on to the bucket of sand, he once again chanted Kimi no Tame, and began his process of trial and error. Ah. This looks hard on Mr. Allen, wouldn't it be better for him to have made a skillfully made one in advance instead? That was the question I faintly had in the back of my mind. Kane Bouchama who read the atmosphere and sensed that I was thinking of that explained secretly by my ears, Allen wanted to be able to make it right in front of you, insisting that he wanted to shock you. Allen who had become slightly like an adult was behaving immaturely here and there huh, and for the time being. Alan continued to use his magic. I could confidently say that during my time helping Irene Sand's work, the incantations of this world were, for some reason, from the language of classic literature in the world where I had previously lived in. These incantations were from the short poems in the 100 Poems by 100 Famous Poets Anthology. The meaning of the short poems do not seem to be linked with the magic's effect so I cannot make conjectures on the effect of the magic's based solely on my understanding of the short poems. In any case, the incantation to make swords was the poem that started with Kimi Gat Tame, and the poem as a break was the incantation to undo the magic. The incantation that started with as a break was used by Irene San occasionally for other things as well. Hence, it was an incantation not just for undoing swords but also for undoing other magic. Incidentally, could magic be used just by chanting their incantations? I quietly recited the short poem myself but nothing happened. It seems that one has to be a mage as well to activate magic. With this and that, roughly ten minutes had passed. After Alan struggling with the making of the dagger, he finally made one that he was satisfied with. Alan happily brought the dagger for me to see. The length of the blade was around 15 centimeters. It was a double-edged dagger. Unlike previously, the tip of the dagger was pointing straight. Both the color of it and sharpness was good. This chapter was brought to you by Wyami from www.yamitranslations.com. With a contented face, Alan proudly handed over the handle of the dagger to me. This is used from now on. This will be a charm to ensure that you will be safe without Kane and Izama and I. I made this while thinking that this dagger would protect in place of me. My my. So you wanted to protect your boss, Alan? Well, given that Alan has now matured somewhat, it might be insufficient for him to just be my henchman. Amu, I shall grant you your independence. I stood upright in an exaggerated manner, respectfully accepted the dagger and gave my thanks. The solemn feeling that I would be leaving the residence soon intensified. Loading. May dark 18 the day of departure. It was a trap. Anyways, it's going to be the weekend soon. So more releases to come pretty soon. Dash. Loading. The transfer of work from Claude San to Cardin San was going smoothly. In fact the whole process ended faster than I thought it would. It appeared that they hastened their pace because of the sketchy man that had been looking into my background. However, that man had vanished. Who the heck was the guy I wonder? After the transfer of duty, the day of my departure had finally arrived. We were leaving at a time when the sun has yet to have shown its face. The members of the journey were, Claude San, Smith San the coachman and another two bodyguard knights followed us for whatever reason. It appears that in recent days, there have been rumors that say bandits have been spotted in the area. If bandits really appeared, we do have two knights accompanying us as bodyguards so we should be able to manage somehow. Claude San also added that at worst, they can have goods we brought on the journey and that is okay since there is nothing important among them. This made me feel that the bandits of this world were lenient. Claude San's strategy to deal with them was rather bold. When we were leaving, Irene San, Cardin San, the two young masters, and Stella San, as the representative of all the servants, came to see us off. Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. We gave one another a farewell hug before leaving. 
Alan was already in tears and desperately said nothing, whereas Kane Bouchama, with an Ikeman smile, gave me a good luck bracelet. It was a supreme quality item made personally by him through the spinning of yarn and knitting. It was likely that he had thought that since Alan gave me a dagger, he himself should make something for me as well. Anyways, to have made this bracelet by hand, what high level of femininity he has. I, once again, formally expressed my thanks to everyone for taking good care of me, and left the residence. Right now, we have traveled a fair bit of distance on the coach, and a long time had passed since the residence disappeared from our sight. I clasped onto the dagger which was made by Alan and wrapped in cloth and held the lucky bracelet tightly, while reminiscing in my memories of my maid life. As expected, you are feeling lonely. Claude San had been observing me and decided to ask. I am feeling a bit lonely, but I know we will meet again. As I said so, thoughts about the future drifted in my mind. Speaking of which, I will become Claude San's adopted daughter soon. I wonder what it would be like to be adopted as the daughter of a bachelor. When Claude San finds himself a wife, would she dislike me? Would it be like the Cinderella story where the stepmother would abuse her stepdaughter? Claude Sama, regarding being adopted as your daughter, when would that roughly happen? Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. Any time is fine but it would be better if it was done early. When we reach my residence, why don't we handle the formalities first? That was somewhat hurried wasn't it? It was much earlier than I had expected. No, isn't this too hasty? If by any chance a marriage proposal came at this point of time, wouldn't it be a hindrance for him, or perhaps, could he have already given up hopes on marrying a wife? He is still young and handsome so I do feel that giving up now was way too early though. Yes, I understand. However, would that be really okay? I have heard that Claude Sama is still a bachelor. Wouldn't you be facing difficulties when you marry if I am adopted? Ah. You do not have to be concerned with that. There won't be plans for marriage in the near future and when you become of appropriate age for marriage, I would take you as my wife. Without warning, Claude Sam announced as so. Eh? What did this person just say? I'm sorry, because of the wind. I couldn't hear clearly. Just to confirm, Claude Sama said that. You will marry me? Indeed. Eh? What? Wasn't that something strange to say? You wouldn't mind though? That was the expression Claude San was making. It wasn't a joke. You are joking with me right? I made direct contact with Claude San and he appeared to be making a serious face. You are for real? Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. No way. This person was really a lilican. He had been seeing me in that angle that the whole time right? Pervert. Claude Sama. It seems that what Irene Sama had said was true, because your first night was with a mature lady. You have unfortunately developed a sexual preference for kids. I glared at Claude Sama with a gaze that was as though I was looking at a dirty thing. And even so, as expected of the shameless Claude San, he waved his hand left and right in a fluster to deny my accusations. I don't have a taste for kids. The society is really in need of a person like you and to prevent you from going somewhere else, I have to keep you by my side. And look, if we had a child, he or she would surely be a bright child, you've even considered children. To think you have thought out that far, I gave a glare contemptuously at Claude San. No, of course, while you are still a child, I wouldn't lay my hands on you because I have no special preference for children. Speaking of which, Mew. Did you understand the conversation I had with Irene San back then? Dot being just a six year old, how in the world do you have such knowledge of what we were talking about? Claude San let out a sigh, it felt like he was whining. I have the knowledge he was talking about, mainly because I remember my previous life. I was brought into this world just when I was in the full bloom of puberty. Visit www.yamitranslations.com for the latest release. Well then, for now. Please do not start showing any sexual desires to a stick-like child. Is that acceptable? Of course. I don't have interest in children. I don't have a guilty conscience. I need views, knowledge and skills. Once again, I stared at him with disdain. I am innocent. He raised his inner hands in protest and awaited my judgment. Nevertheless, while he has promised me to not lay his hands on me while I still am a child, 
He certainly did say that he would someday have a child with me. That pervert. But wait. Claude Sam is quite the Eichmann too, and is quite rich too. Ah, he won't be too bad. A fine candidate. Still, there is quite an age gap between us. Anyhow, it feels like he fell in love me not because he fell in love in me but rather in my worth. That will be a better way of thinking about this issue. All right. For the time being, I shall proceed on, and as soon as I get disgusted with him, I will make my escape. I shall do as such. Translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Well, I got it. It's just that if you show any sexual excitement before we get married, I won't forgive you. I told him in a threatening voice. Claude Sand sighed with a puff and acknowledged. If I remember correctly, the minimum age for marriage in this world was 15 years old. If there was that much time left, there will enough time for me to ponder about my next step. Anyways, we have made it very far now. We zipped through the mountainous path. Initially, the scenery had been enjoyable but now, there were only trees, trees and more trees. I've gotten sick and tired of it. Back in Garagari village, magical beasts appeared time to time in the mountains. I wonder if it would appear here though. Hi Hin. All of a sudden, a loud cry was heard from the horse and the coat shook violently. I took a look at the horse to assess the situation and it seems that the horse had been shot by an arrow in its butt. And, by the side of the path, a rustling sound could be heard and what appeared next was a bunch of gangster-like people. These people were most likely bandits. I covered my head under my arms petrified and cowered. Claude San noticed that I was cowering and tried to protect me. The jolting of the coach stopped after the horse was brought to a standstill and sounds of weapons clashing kin. Kin. Gaka. And shouting could be heard. I opened my quivering eyes and saw the two knights that were acting as bodyguards springing into action and facing off with a bunch of brawny and fierce looking men. There were about ten or so of them using their hose as weapons while blocking our path. This chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Smith the coachman murmured in a soft voice that we have to retreat from here, and try to get the coach to go in the other direction but, we didn't perceive it at all, that a skinhead bandit was already in front of us. He boarded the coach and directed his sword in front of Claude Sand's eyes. Loading. May Dark 19 The Sudden Attack. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Are you the owner? While drawing his sword at Claude San, the skinhead bandit displayed an evil image and questioned Claude San threateningly. Yes. I can give you all of our goods. Just spare our lives. His face was pale. Yet he was still able to maintain a firm tone. The skinhead bandit nodded in approval. All right. Dot 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 then get down the coach. He continued to point his sword at Claude San as he waited for us to get down. That's when we heard shouts from the front. Oi. Kawim are you? Restrain this person in ropes. Right. A slendy looking man who resembled a monkey raised his head in response. He brought the two bodyguards over and had their arms and limbs tied up with rope. The two bodyguards were dead tired from the battle and were groaning in pain and suffering. The man that looked like a monkey who also was called Kawimayu came over to tie me, Claude San and the coachman arms and legs with a thin rope in a similar fashion and threw us by the side of the road to prevent us from taking any actions against the bandits. Claude San reflected light with his dagger as a signal. Meanwhile, the bandits moved all our goods to their own horses. Up until this moment, I was staring in a daze from the flow of events. I finally regained my sanity. Even in my previous life, I did not encounter such an earth-shaking incident. My brain was plain blank from the fright I've gotten from the bandits raid on us. These bandits are scary. Who the heck is that skinhead? His bandit style was to put on a loincloth and a fur vest. The muscles packed around his body were real dangerous though. Underneath my maid clothing was the good luck dagger that Alan gave me. But there was no way that charge at the oppressors alone. No way could I get past those muscles. And that dude was a skinhead too. Instead of being as scared as I am. When I took a fleeting glance at Claude San. He didn't look flustered at all. He did factor this into his plans when we departed that, that if the bandits did appear, 
we would simply just hand over our cargo to them. Well, this might just be a normal risk that has to be considered for Claude San, as expected of his shamelessness. Anyways, after transporting this cargo away, would we be released? I had imagined the bandits would kill us without any further chit-chat. This is rather cheaper than I thought, huh? After transferring most of our cargo, the skinner had murmured as such. From the very start, Claude San had been ready to hand over the goods. If in the rarest occurrence, we did encounter the bandits, we would simply hand it over as he already made sure the goods were nothing impressive. Well, that is fine. Then we have no choice. Let's make our escape, the skinner had said so in disappointed and looked around as though he wanted to load up something else and pulled out another string that was used to bind cargo. At the skinhead's words, the bandits took the loot and left. There were some of them on horses but there were others without horses that were leaving by foot as well. Also, the bandits were pulling our horse sand that had been shot in his rear by their arrow. The horse's staggering gait was painful to look at. I feel sorry for the horse sand but I am glad at the overall outcome. We were seriously spared our lives. Phew. And then, the dreadful skinhead turned back with one heave. He carried me off under his arms just like how they did for any other regular goods they stole. Eh? Hey, hey, where are you lifting me off to? The skinhead sniggered at me and said, huh? To what I have said on reflex. No, I'm afraid. Didn't you say that you would spare our lives? Leave that child alone. Claude San who had managed to stay composed throughout the entire ordeal was thrown into disarray. This must have gone beyond in calculations. We'll be selling this kid. This is the spoils of our raid. Anyways, isn't this thing just your servant? You wouldn't have any issues with it right? The bandits said so in a nonchalant manner. That child isn't just my servant. She will be my wife too. Claude Sand's furious rebuttal froze the entire atmosphere. You are ha ha. The skinhead laughed at the plane as Dalalik and Claude San and threw me a pitiful gaze while he was at it. Rest assured, pervert, this is my merchandise so I don't have any intentions to kill her, it is that just she would be sold to another pervert like you. To her, nothing would have changed. True indeed, I strangely agreed with his logic. Nevertheless, there was a possibility that what awaited me was a greater pervert than Claude San. I am no pervert. Give the child back. Claude San was kicked in the stomach. Oi. You're being noisy. She would still keep her life so isn't that fine. As he said that, the skinhead tied me up with the string with the intention to put me behind the horse. Claude San continued in his attempt to save me and crawled over like a caterpillar. You sure are persistent. As the skinhead muttered under his breath. He started to give off an aura with killing intent. D dangerous. Claude's armor. I'll be fine. Despite so, Claude San did not stop. Was this person the type that had guts? If this goes on, Claude San could be killed by the skinhead. Bandits San, please leave right away. If you hurt him any further I would bite off my tongue to kill myself. If I died, my value as their merchandise would disappear. I don't really have the nerve to bite off my own tongue. Just saying it should be enough, I hope. Leave this to me and run. I managed to blurt out words that were similar to the lines an actress would say as a death flag. The skinner had scowled at me for a second and returned his line of sight back to Claude San. Foo. This one has been well trained huh? In consideration to your excellent bride, I shall overlook this one time. The skinhead declared and dashed off on his horse. I was laid sideways as I was bound on top of the horse as cargo, and by the time I managed to wiggle and turn my body to face Claude Sand's direction, I could no longer see the expression on his face. Still, I could imagine that he would be looking upwards in a daze right now. To think that I was abducted by bandits. I am sorry for Claude San who has been struck dumb but I am still glad that everyone else including the two bodyguards were safe. Looks like the bandits of this world do not arbitrarily murder their victims. Well, it's not like I really know how the bandits in my previous world operate. Claude San and gang have been tied up by rope but the rope was thin so I'm sure they would be able to find an object nearby to cut it open. If Claude San was there, they should be able to work out something on their own. The biggest problem as of now is me. Yes, I have been captured by the bandits and just like this, I would be sold round and round and would live with various other perverts I suppose. 
with each jolt by being on the bandit's horseback. These words rose up from my mind, I want you to treasure yourself. These were the words from Alan and Kane about Charmer. With this turn of events, I wonder if this would fall under the category of not treasuring myself. I knew this was something that couldn't be prevented but I still feel somewhat guilty to the both of them. Loading. Recollection Chapter 2. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. To be honest, I hate this world where I have been reincarnated to. I am very irritated at it. Firstly, I am disappointed that there is hardly any civility that matches that in my previous world. Also, I deplore watching the people of this world carry out their meaningless lives without thinking for themselves. During my time at Garagari village, I had been disgusted at the way the villagers had lived. They entrusted their faith to whatever that had been decided for them and had no plans for themselves. That's why I thought that if I worked hard, I could stand out by being useful, be recognized by my parents and finally gain their love. I had gotten ahead of myself and believed that I had been reborn in this world for the purpose of experiencing a more human-like lifestyle with these people. Nevertheless, I had been sold out. TN Author wrote I was sold but I intentionally changed it to sold out. Back then, I wanted to be loved by them no matter what, and spared no effort in doing so. Thus when it happened, I was in a big shock. After some time had passed, I came down to the conclusion that it's not like I really needed parents and resentfully resolved to go with the flow for the time being. At that time, I met Alan and Kane. I considered them to be cute kids. I could sympathize with them and had my first taste of a feeling like superiority. I spent time with them like this and later, believed arrogantly that I could save the pitiful them. At first glance, it seemed to stem from the warm intentions, but now, thinking back about it, it was nothing but a pack of lies to hide the dirty portions of my heart, to hide my elitist self and to give the impression that I was kind. That's why they possess everything that I ever wanted, while I could only admire their happiness from afar, languishing in deep regrets. I strongly believed that they were different from me. Truthfully, I think I am just being egoistic here but my feelings for them have tilted towards dislike. In the first place, there were many things that I disliked. Even though I said I hated this world, it doesn't mean in any way that I actually liked my previous world either. In my previous life, in the same vein, I was irritated whenever I saw others with their loving families. That's because they did nothing to deserve it. They take it for granted that they are loved. I even see them sneering at me when I work my hardest to attain that love they take for granted. Now that I look back on it, in my previous life, I valued pride over everything else. I studied hard, topped everything as an act of retaliation against everyone else and protected myself. I hated everyone. There were droves of people like Alan or Kane back in my previous world and I could always sense that they were always secretly ridiculing me. I know that it isn't true yet I still have that hunch. I like the two of them, there is no doubt about that. However, the present me, is incapable to liking. I'm sure that one day, I would hurt them. Having such thoughts would make me an evil child won't it? And perhaps being sold by my parents and being captured by the bandits were part of karma that has been handed down to me. Loading Bandit Arc 1 at the Bandits Village Loading Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. The place where I was brought on the bandit's horse was an ordinary village with nothing unusual. The sun had already set and the place was clad entirely in darkness so there weren't many villagers outside. D don't tell me this is another village they plan on pillaging from? That was my initial thought. Nevertheless, there were some villagers who should be night watchers, doing their night patrols and when they saw the skinhead, they greeted him with welcome back you've worked hard, so this must be the bandit's village. The skinhead's bandit party arrived at the village dropped off their loot and gathered at old man's, likely to be the village chief, housed together with four other people who looked like they were part of the management team of the bandits. For some strange reason, they brought me along as well. That being said, I am still tied up. What poor treatment for a young child. This is truly the work of the demon. No, 
more like the deeds of the bandits. The old man, likely the chief, was probably still asleep up till now and was blinking his eyes repeatedly. I could feel that he was a kind and good-natured old man. That he was the village chief despite so makes him all the more amazing. Chief. On the way back from hunting, we spotted a merchant's coach, raided it but we messed up big time. The coach that we attacked appears to be owned by an aristocrat that has blood relations with the House of the Rainforest. We even found a family crest that indicates the identity of the Earl of the Rainforest family, and the owner of the coach had black hair and pea green eyes too. So there is no mistake about it, the skinner had reported gravely with a shaken expression to the village chief and gulped down the cup of wine that had been prepared for him. Was he referring to Claude San when he said black hair and pea green eyes? The chief drank a sort of tea with a sip. At the same time, he took a breath of relief and asked then was it a success? In a barely audible voice, is this village chief all right? Is he really the boss of the bandits? He looks like he might just drop dead and die though. The loot that we plundered wasn't anything great and it would have been preferable if we didn't get involved at all but the youngsters weren't successful in their hunting and had been impertinent. Well, I suppose this won't happen but it is possible that the rainforest lords would dispatch a bandit subjugation team on us. The village chief responded high in a feeble voice. He was still rapidly blinking his eyes moments ago so I guess he had gotten a shock from what the skinhead had reported, quite likely. Well, we have zero intention to cause trouble here. So rest assured, either way, we had long intended to leave this place. Sorry, we might be taking some of the able-bodied chaps in this village too. You don't mind would ya? Glares, the skinhead glared directly into the village chief to confirm things. Please treat the elderly with care. Hi, no worries. TN. This is my attempt at translating this old guy's. The village chief was still speaking in his feeble voice and seemed to have acknowledged the hierarchical relationship between them somehow. It can be seen that the bandit's village chief is not necessarily the boss of the bandits after all. To have gone to the extent of exerting authority over him. Please treat this old man more kindly. Also, treat this child me, kindly too. By the way, we will depart by midnight. By daybreak, the spirit users might be able to track us. The old man nodded his head sluggishly and left his house. The villagers seemed to have called for him too. Incidentally, leader, are we bringing this fella along too? The monkey-faced person who had tied us with rope, whose name was if I remember accurately, Kawimayu, was pointing at me while asking. What a coincidence monkey face San. I have been thinking about the same thing too for some time now. Nope. I have been perplexed as to how to handle this kid too. Skinhead put his hand on Chin and tilted his head to the side in uncertainty while saying. Had she been a boy, we could have given her to one of our acquaintance who is in need of labor. But she is a girl. If she had good proportions, we could have sent her to a brothel. But her figure is, how shall I put it, not too bad but not so great either. Ain't no pretty flower yeah. She has eyes of a dead frog too. What? Are rude. Nevertheless, no matter how. This is a route that avoids the path of the brothel. I never had that kind of experience so I would be a little nervous about it. It might be preferable to over exaggerate my eye popping dead frog look. Well, it's not like I am doing that on purpose though. But what about that, leader? Wasn't the owner of the coach greatly attached to her? This sort of face might be what those who incline the other way might prefer. Fui the monkey made a dirty laugh. Stop making those unnecessary suggestions, monkey. HMPH. There could be that possibility. The skinhead leader took another look at me. Don't be instigated by the monkey, leader. As the saying goes, when you are confronted with a wild animal, never take your eyes off it. I trembled while continuing to stare at them. Staring like a dead frog. Indeed, I had been delayed because of that merchant's reaction. What are you really capable of? Dot don't tell me. You are a mage? This question again? I feel like every time I start a new journey, this question would be asked. Would it be better if I pasted a piece of paper that said I am no mage on my chest? How about it? My mind was assertive but there's no way I'm going to say that. That's because the other party is the skinhead. I straighten my posture in my tied up state. 
I wonder what would be the best answer. The only route I am being shown as of now is the brothel route. Because I want to go on another route, I need to demonstrate my worth in another aspect other than my worth as a female. I am no M, mage. But I can do arithmetic. I can read and I have good memory. I started off with a bit of a stammer. It can't be helped since I am being surrounded by them in a threatening manner. I think a stress interview is no good. The skinhead leader muttered that if I could use magic, I wouldn't look so much like a servant. He then paused for a moment to think, but you can do arithmetic and write. Why are you able to do those? I took lessons together with the young masters at the residence. Dot well then, I shall have you bought at a high price at Bashus. Bashu? A person's name perhaps? What in the world would happen to me if I was to be purchased there? Um. What would I have to do if I was sold to Bashu San? I had mustered my courage to ask but the skinhead went huh. He looked down on me and said, ask Bashu when you get sold. Hey hey, is there a need to look so fierce whenever I say anything? I am still a six years old here. This guy's appearance is indeed terrifying. He had been a foul-mouthed delinquent transfer student, but really? I had placed my hopes on the surprise possibility of him flashing a smile as he picked up an abandoned cat. TN. I believe this is a standard Japanese character. I had been shuddering because of the skin red when the door slammed open. Someone with a tall stature stormed in the room while yelling, Hey, what is this about leaving today? I have been busy with the treatment of the injured villagers because of you all acting violently. This person's way of speaking was peculiar. When chattering away. His waist would twist and turn and his pinky would be pointing up. The voice was evidently that of male. Yet, there is the reverberation of a failed attempt at using a high-pitched voice. Hey Kuki, don't be so mad. Those are just small cuts aren't they? Well, have a seat. Don't give me that shit about being small. If we don't treat him properly, it will become a big problem, for crying out loud. Furthermore, haven't I told you countless of times? Call me Kuchan. Was he a he or a she? Skinhead had faltered since he or she entered. He? He had reddish brown hair that grew all the way to the nape, just like a woman, and that it was plaited. She? Or wait? He? Would twist his waist in an exaggerated motion every time he moved and walk about with his little pinky pointing up. He wore a tightly fitting animal hide vest that covered up to his midriff and another similarly tight fitting pants. Among the people I have met in this world, he was definitely the most eccentric one. I actually know the term to express such a person. He was, most likely, an anee. An anee bandit. Loading. Bandit. Arc 2 sister bandit. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. The bandit head was telling Ani how they got to the current situation of planning to leave the village because they had assaulted a coach from the rainforest family. While he was explaining, a skinny guy with a good head on his shoulders from the management team said something like, this kid appeared to have called her master Claude San and this Claude San is most likely the merchant lord from the rainforest family I think. Claude San is reasonably famous. Hey, what in the world are you doing? Couldn't you have at least checked out the other party's identity before striking? Really, I give up on you. The infuriated knee was bending over and nagging at the skinhead. Get off my case. It has already been done. Either way. We have already said that we will head down to bash you later. True. Ani nodded in agreement and she turned her head away from the bandit leader. For the first time, she took a look at me. Why is there a kid there? She looked at me closely. Hey, what's with this kid? We kidnapped her today. She claims to be able to do arithmetic and writing. We have made plans to palm off her to bash you. <laughs> she inspected me from up to down. Could this be the promised fashion check? I am currently tied all up and dirty right now, so please go easy on me. A. Hey, instead of bringing her all the way to Bashus, why don't you hand her over to me? A knee bandit then clasped her palms together in a plea to the boss. I don't really care though. A A N. A leg. Thanks. I love you. I'll treat like our own and take good care of her. A knee banded through a sexy wink to the skinhead. Looks like the skinhead is called Dalek. Alek boss caught sight of a knee's wink and made a grimaced expression. Don't think of her as our child. Also, 
don't put too much feelings into her, don't forget she's our merchandise, and Alex skinhead boss made his familiar menacing expression. I froze in fear and my thinking speed dulled immediately but Ani Bandit was unperturbed. I knew, complained Ani Bandit. She then came over to my side and tried to undo the rope. Oi, you are going to untie the rope, isn't it obvious? There is much work that I would need help for. I'm the only medical therapist here while everyone is always getting injured. I always wanted to have a helping hand. Why has it got to be this kid? Can't you just pick any other villager? Aren't there no one in the village that can read? I took great pains to bring along a medical book, and if somebody was able to read, it would be more efficient to pick up the skills. Furthermore, her dead like frog eyes are tickling my maternal instincts. Alec Boss looked disgusted and murmured to himself, You don't have any maternal instincts obviously, the other people in the management team did not make any additional comments so it seems like there is no one who would go against our knee bandit. Anyways, does everything think the same way when they look at my eyes, is that true? As I held many doubts in my head, the ropes on me were untied and I finally tasted freedom again. But from the threatening glare of the boss, making any hasty movements now is out of question and I quietly sat straight up. What is your name? A knee bandit asked me. I am called you. Thank you for releasing me. Ara. This kid has manners. I am the Okaa-san for the hooligans in these parts. I am called Kuki but please call me Ku Okaa-san, not a further but a mother. Is that right? I had thought about it when Claude San asked me to be his adopted daughter but, to have that kind of family. I really hate it. I definitely don't want to call her Ku Oka Arsene. All right, let's try and dodge it. Yes, please treat me kindly. Kusama. Yu Chan? It's not Kusama but Ku Oka Arsene. Okay, one more time. But I am still uneasy about calling you that without reserve. A knee bandit glared at me as though she wouldn't take no for an answer. Yikes, super scary. There is no way around it. I can't defy a knee bandit. Even more terrifying is that the boss was nearby and he had been impatiently telling us to hurry up with the fuss. In the end, it is just a name. I would be sold somewhere else shortly after anyways, so I'll just call her that for now. Understood. Ku Oka Arsene, please treat me kindly. A knee bandit looked satisfied. Would I be assisting this Nissan shortly later? Since I am no longer tied up in ropes, should I just bolt off? But still, where can I run to? I had the feeling that making the return back to the rainforest residence is too far for a solo trip. No matter how, it looks like I would have to be with the bandits for now, but what shall I do? The skinhead looks like he has killed countless of people, and that he would kidnap a woman and eat up every inch of her. TN not sure how to interpret this, the other people from the management team look like they are in their late thirties but I can't discern the skinhead's age because of his scary face, maybe he is just not human, looks like it's still best for me to escape once the opportunity arises, the dagger that Alan entrusted to me was no longer in my pockets, I will definitely have to retrieve it back and then make my escape, later. The boss made the other bandits ready themselves in 30 seconds and immediately left. Bandits are so agile. Just before leaving, Alec boss told the village chief, If someone asks you about the bandits, play dumb. If by any chance, the village is to blame because of the loot being discovered, just say that you were being threatened by the bandits. He did so with a gentle face that it didn't suit him. From the way the village chief was trembling, it may very well be that he was actually being threatened, or it could just be a special characteristic of aged him, just maybe. Despite so, Alec Boss was making a heinous looking face and actually attracted a sizable following of villagers that looked up to him. Similarly, when he appealed to anyone who was willing to leave the village with them, there were many youngsters from the village, and on top of that, women who are in their adulthood volunteered to join them. However, they said that they would be in a bind if they brought many people along so they made do with three men from the village. Could it be that that creepy looking face is considered a common face in this world? If that is so, there is no way I am marrying an Ikoman of this world. The full strength of the leaving party was eight people, much fewer than I had expected. The mood felt just like a bunch of people going on vacation. 
The guy from the management team with the good brain over shoulders was grumbling that it was foolish to be afraid of the spirit users and try to avoid them by traveling at night since it was quite unlikely that they will be able to simply dispatch a team of mages on them. The boss told him to shut up. The direction where we will be traveling towards felt like it would make us even further away from the rainforest residence. Was Bashu's place in the opposite direction of the rainforest residence? If that is so, when I make my escape, it would be easier to lose my way. It might be wiser to be sold without protest and spend the effort on considering about the future instead. However, if I were to be sold to a faraway land, the probability of never ever returning to the rainforest residence would be very high. I would be worrying everyone back at the residence, huh? The faces of Alan and Kane floated into my mind. My heart throbs in pain just thinking about how much grief I might bring them. No matter what, I will stay positive. I wish I could tell that to them. Wait, maybe I am being too self-conscious. Perhaps they would that sadden to that extent by news of what happened to me. After all, we had lived under the same roof for only a year. They might feel some sadness about it but with some time, I'm certain that I would be forgotten. From my previous world to the Garigari village, all the people I have met so far would have, without a doubt, no recollection of me anymore. Loading. Bandit Arc 3 A Journey with the Bandits. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. From then on, it was a journey together with the bandits on horse. We would take short breaks occasionally and when night came, we would also set up camp. Nevertheless, these days had been exhausting. Kusan sat behind me to support me, but still it is very tiring to ride a horse. My butt aches as well every single muscle. What is this level of toughness? Furthermore, the landscape among the mountain was always the same, never changing. So the excitement I had for a horseback life worn out in a couple of days. All of the bandits looked fine, and could even knock an arrow while riding the horse to shoot birds the moment they caught sight of one. The shot bird would serve as additional food for dinner. These bandits live up to their name of mountain bandits at least. We reached our campsite once again and everybody were doing their own camp preparations. After getting off the horse, I rubbed my reddened thigh with an ointment I received from Kusan. This ointment is really very effective. This ointment is able to relieve pain and suppress inflammation. Its name is called Forget Your Pains with the Maiden's Embrace. As suggested from its name, it was an ointment personally made by Anisan. I was explained that the ointment helps with waist pain and other kinds of pains like the pain that follows after falling on your backside, without any cuts and wounds. I was told that I would be taught how to make it a few days later and I was somewhat looking forward to it. Kusan had gave me a very in-depth lesson about medicine and treatment methods in this world along the way here, though she is likely going to use my help. It is because Kusan was the only medic among the band of bandits. Shouldn't healing and treating people be like how it works in games? Just using recovery magic to heal in one go? It could be that there is no recovery magic in this world. The injured and the sick can only rely on the medicines produced by the medic. This means the magic of this world is less convenient than what I had imagined it to be. Speaking of which, when I had gone to the rainforest town's market, I was slightly surprised that the pharmacies were well stocked. The reason for that could be that there is no such thing as recovery magic. Since I have finished applying the ointment, I went on with making preparations for the camp with Kusan. Today we are camping by the side of a big tree. It was a good elevated open space. We were totally surrounded by trees but if we walked further up ahead, there would be a river. Still, I was told to never go towards the river, as there were demonic beasts. TN. In the past, I used magical beasts but after consideration, I think demonic beasts would be a better choice, in the area towards the river. I was also told that there would be demonic beasts beyond the mountains near Garigari village, but it looks like for this area, the beasts can be found in the direction of the river. The reason the bandits actually set up camp here was that because this place was a relative far distance from the river and they were afraid of the demonic beasts too. But hey, what are demonic beasts anyways? At first when I first heard about them, I had assumed that they were like wild dogs or bears. 
but since this is the world we are talking about, I could even expect to see dragons I suppose if I were to encounter that kind of gigantic reptile type of monster, I would certainly run off in fear, every time we set up camp, the males would be primarily in charge of heavy work while I, who was part of a group of females and a knee, male, would start the fire and prepare the meals, a knee banded kusan would show me the mountain vegetables and taught me the method to pick them the way to eat them and also the effects they can have. This world's treatment concepts is very alike to the concepts of traditional Chinese medicine in my previous existence. A balanced diet both prevents and cures sickness. It is a principle that treats both food and the medicine as the same thing. The contents of our food would always be simple, dried meat, hunted bird, grain and mountain vegetables. They would be thrown in together to a pot and cooked. The only seasoning used is salt. Even though each meal is simple, they are reasonably delicious. After the preparations for the camp is completed, the bandits would all be sluggish as though they were the dead. However, after having their meals and a short break, they would immediately regain the liveliness and sit round the campfire, drinking wine and making merry. It was the kind of mood that you get from festivals. So much so that the boss is smiling. A smile that holds traces of screwiness. A smile that feels like he was fully enjoying eating a baby whole. In order to avoid the eyes of the boss as much as possible, I read the medical books handed to me from Kusan diligently. This was a daily routine. Somehow, the bandits were more invigorated than usual. After making camp, they were waiting to contact Bashu who lived around here. It seems that the boss was unable to set foot in the town as he is a wanted man, that's why the only way was for Bashu to come over, I believe. I wonder what Alec boss was being prosecuted for, nevertheless, it is definite that showing his face up at the town would put him in a spot with that face of his. Even if he did nothing, there was no doubt that he would be reported anyways, that's why when tomorrow comes, the muslered guy. Brainy Rudelin one of the villager that joined the bandits, Poland would be heading to the town to make contact with Bashu, hence, they were having a banquet before sending them off, but we had the food as usual though, incidentally, the people left behind at camp including myself would be house sitting in the meantime, I felt relieved personally about it since there wouldn't be any more horse riding, my soft butt has reached its limits, ever since the three were told to call Bashu San here. We no longer travelled with the horses and for me, our life became calm and quiet. Alec and gang went to hunt while Kusan and I picked the mountain vegetation, washed clothes and did all sorts of miscellaneous work. Today was also spent pick vegetables with Kusan. As always, Kusan explained the medical herbs effect and how to use them while we were on the job. I had always been curious on who exactly were these bandits San. I didn't feel that they were from the bandit village from the start but even so, they didn't feel like feral children living independently in the mountains either. Both the monkey face Kuwamayu and the smart Rudel could somewhat do arithmetics and they were extremely familiar with the geography in this area, all the way down to details. Furthermore, Kusan expertise in medicine was mind-blowing. I'm sure it is not something that can be learned normally. Surely they have been taught somewhere. Nevertheless, if I remember correctly, there is only one educational institution in this world. However, that school is for nobility so I guess that's not possible. What's wrong? Yu Chan looks so dazed. Are you tired? Kusan was in front of me and was bending back and forth. S sorry. I was having some thoughts. Um. I was thinking, who exactly are you all? Oh? You are interested in us? Rather than interested, it is because everyone here seems to possess their own skills and I was wondering how they managed to learn them. Mufafu, I'm glad that you actually asked something about us. A knee bandit was really delighted and brought her clenched right fist near her mouth while giggling. We might be bandits now but back in the past, we were all young masters and young daughters of aristocrats. You can't believe that right? Then, you all must have gone through the education of the royal school right? I knew it. I might look like a child, but I have the brains of an adult detective. However, for these aristocrats to have become bandits, what on earth exactly happened? Yes, yes. You do know your stuff. We all met during our school days. I was from the medicine course while Kawamayu and Rudel were in the business course. As for a guy and Dalek. 
They were studying some kind of a knight's course but their courses were different yet they became intimate friends. By the way, the basher that we are meeting is from the business course. We are also on good terms with another person, my little brother, but we have become more distant and we hardly meet these days. When she was talking about her little brother, her face became slightly cloudy but for other things they did while in school. She talked about them to me with ease. Kawimayu was initially in the knight's course but the training was too demanding for him so he dropped out and transferred to the business course. Kusan was not an Ani at that point of time and was just an ordinary boy but still gained considerable attention from the girls. Yet she had already fallen for Alec Boss and had always been like that since. Various things happened and unfortunately, we became bandits. But that's alright. I have decided that I would live for love. I will continue to follow Alec around. Anisan's eyes were completely those of a carnivore staring at its prey. But from how I see it, Alec doesn't seem to incline that way. A touching, unrequited love. Even in this case, the boss is popular. Is his face really the standard of an Ikeman in this world? Speaking of which, I am interested in the various things, not Kusan's love story, that she mentioned. What is Bashusan working as now? R. Bashu is the master at the Ruby Fallen domain. The Earl of Ruby Fallen, yes. Master and Earl would mean that he is also an aristocrat. Am I to be his maid? Since I am already a maid, I have the necessary career background. I see, I see, that wouldn't all too bad, huh? Incidentally, Bashu San is no pervert, right? He's not a pedophile, right? I don't think he is a pervert. He is married a mage and they have kids too. I made a magnificent guts pose in my mind. Won't my new employment have even better prospects? But I still can't let my guard down. There is the possibility that the kids were another unmanageable shitty brat. While I do not know living conditions of the shitty brat, I am still relieved to know where I might end up before getting sold. Speaking of which, Kuoka Asen mentioned about various things happening that caused you all to become bandits. What exactly happened? Up till now, she generally had a smile on but her expression hardened when I asked that. It looks like it was a question that shouldn't be asked. Sorry, I didn't know my place. The reason why we became bandits isn't something that can come out from my mouth. I do not want to push our thoughts out. Anyways, how did we end up near to the side of the river? We have to get back now. Kusan was no longer in a mood to talk about it and move towards the direction of our tents. I hastily followed behind but I have become very interested to the topic that she averted her eyes from. Loading. Banded Arc 4 Secret of the Charismatic Boss. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. The three who left for Bashu's place have yet to return. As per norm, the men went on hunt while Kusan Mail and I went outside to pick mountain vegetables, do the laundry and other things. As of late, I have understood the treatment procedures and could somewhat help treat those who return with injuries after hunting. It might be called treatment, but considering their injuries, all I really did was wash their wounds, apply medication and wrap it up in bandages. Also, I have been taught how to mix medication and the make the forget your pains with the maiden's embrace medicine. In addition, there was something that piqued my interest recently. The bandits have yet to commit a single act of robbery since we left the bandit village. If that is so, they are no longer bandits isn't. Actually, there is a path not far from the camp where many merchants on their horses pass by, and yet, they have not made their move on them. All they did was quietly hunt for a living. Currently, we are just a simple hunting group. Perhaps they held themselves back because of the little child, me, in their group because it would be detrimental for educational purposes. Oh my, what a surprise that they actually had this kind side to them. Huh? We didn't really specifically take you into consideration. I had asked regarding my observation and it was immediately shot down by the monkey face Kawamayu. Monkey Face Kawamayu had basically ended all his sentence with Seiyo, Sam, and Sune, in the presence of the boss or Kusan like how a Kuhai of a club would have. Yet when he faced me, his speaking style would change to that of a senior. This bastard, in order to soothe my irritation, I had devoted myself entirely to work. Right now, Kawamayu and a villager banded Gauz San were scraping off fats of wild boar skins. 
The underside of the skin was disgustingly flabby and I found it pitiful for the bore too. Hence I wasn't too comfortable with this job. At first, the bandits treated me as though I was there and Kusan was the only one who would talk to me. I myself wasn't comfortable initiating a conversation with any of them either. However, as time with them went by, I found myself increasingly curious about them. It's also because of what I heard about Bashu San the Earl from Kuani San, that I was able to calm down and had the leeway to think about what might happen in the future. With this feeling, since I was already caught up in this, I might as well study sociology, the ways of bandits. As such, I began talking to them. And of course, this was how I learned about the two-faced nature of Kuamayu. Behaving all proudly to anyone who ranks beneath him while acting servile to those above. Such loathsome middle management staff. If we were to act violently around these parts, it would be extremely troublesome for ourselves later on. I don't really understand much, but even Boss San is a wanted man. Actually, what on earth did Boss San do anyway? Robbery? Currently, Gauz San was expressing himself like a coup high. He didn't do anything but us. Monkey face Kuamayu didn't even bother to turn and face him. No no. How could he be a wanted person if he didn't do anything criminal? Don't tell me it is really true that with his face alone, he got reported while he was in the town. Also, boss is not doing any raids because this is the ruby fallen domain. Now that you say it, I remember hearing it from Kuoka Asama. If I remember correctly, the lord of this domain and boss San are acquaintances. That must be why we aren't attacking people in these parts. I had heard similar things from Kusan, but I had completely forgotten about it. Their connection was probably that of friendship. Even though he is a wanted man, even though that may be true, it is not the only thing. Boss extremely hates mages and dislikes territories which depend on mages. Ruby Fallen had been said to be a cursed land, since not a single mage has been born out in it in decades. Boss doesn't pick on lands which have a weak link to magic. Even though this is the only territory which is experiencing such an issue though. Huh. This must be what they call a bandit's dignity. Anyways, this is the first time I heard of anyone who actually hates mages. Everyone else more or less respects the mages. So it is rather fresh to see someone showing disdain for mages. Ka. It's the will of the boss. Living much like a man. As expected, boss San is cool. My role model. My savior. The villager's spirit rose as he said. Speaking of savior, what was he saved from? What do you mean by your savior? I asked the Gauze San in a six-year-old like manner while maintaining an adorable and innocent expression. Even though they think I stare like a dead frog, I am very very sure that is not the case. I am supposed to be a cute young girl. I smiled as sweetly as I would. When posing for a photograph, we were from Gregory village, a pioneering settlement but the crops could hardly grow and crops that managed to grow were eaten by the wild boars. The mages couldn't care less about us and we were on the brink of starvation. This was when Alek Boss and Kawimayu gallantly came to the rescue, towards the boss which has been continuously called cool. Kawimayu gave a not at all dissatisfied expression while bashfully saying something like oh please stop. I am getting a little pissed at his contented monkey face. Wait a minute. Pioneering settlement. So we are comrades huh? And the name of it is Gregory Villages too. Were all pioneering settlements named in such a way? Who the heck named them? I would love to have a word with that person. No really, I am in your debt. You taught me how to hunt, how to peel off animal hide. Taught me about the various mountain vegetation and even how to rob merchants. I see, I see. That is good. However, it would be much better if he wasn't taught how to rob though. Well. The boss has that kind of personality so there is no way he would abandon others in need. Kawimayu boasted with pride. He spoke of boss having that certain personality but all I have seen from him is that chilling face of his. So for now, I don't see him in that light. But I suppose he does have a hint of humanity huh? Now that I think back on it, it is very strange that when we were on the verge of starvation, we didn't think that we could live on even if turned to banditry. Yet now. In order to protect my family and myself, I would do anything despite the fact that, during that time, all I did was to suffer in hunger while simply doing nothing but wait for the mages. All we did was wait for death. 
The villager scratched his head as he spoke with wonder. Still, robbing others is still no good, says the me who had been kidnapped. <laughs> but there are times when it cannot be helped in order to survive. Garigri village should be a pioneering settlement under the rainforest territory. They blame their starvation and suffering on the rainforest family but not on the management of the village. It may have been unfortunate but Irene San and Claude San had been so busy and they have done their very best. This is my perspective as an ex-maid, but nevertheless, I can't say it out to these villagers who had faced near deaths from hunger. This feels somewhat complicated. If I had not been born in Garagari village, I wonder if that village would have to turn to banditry as well. No, if that was the case, I'm sure it would have become a bandit village by now. Hiaha, tn. This is a sort of gangsterly snigger I think, as they laughed. A fleeting thought came to my mind, it was when Mary Wangjin, tn, it's like bro, was straddling onto his pony. Dot totally don't look like them at all, the inhabitants of Garagari village wouldn't have anything like their guts, I believe. I pray that Mary Wangjin doesn't end up higher ha ing and that he puts in effort to cultivate the fields. The three men who went to the city to find Bashu San came back, however, they were unable to meet Bashu San. They said that Bashu San went on a long expedition to find an agriculture expert so that he can invite him or her to assist in reforming agriculture. They have no idea when he would be back, but it shouldn't take that long, so they think. Upon hearing their report, Boss decided that we would continue setting up camp here and wait for Bashu San to return. Such bad timing. This would mean my re employment is a distant away. A blessing from this, however is that I can continue to enjoy this slow pace of life in the mountains. Not much damage was done. I can say, at first, it was very intimidating and I didn't dare to even take a slight peek at the boss's face but in recent times, I feel like I have gotten used to his face. I took a long look at the boss face by the side. Boss could sense someone looking at him and in that moment when he turned to face me, I looked away and acted nonchalantly. This little game of ding dong dash. Tn, press on a bell and run away, has been a favorite pastime of mine. From the excess time we had together, I became closer to the bandits. If only I had soap, I was scrubbing away at the bandits' clothes at the river. Among the bandits, the main person to do all the housework was me. And here I am, hard at work, washing their worn-out clothes. The water alone isn't sufficient to get the dirt to drop off and if I applied too much force, the clothes would tear to what to do, as a rule, going to the river is dangerous so Kusan would follow me to the river usually, but yesterday, Rudel San strained his back while hunting so Kusan, who was in charge of nursing him, stayed behind. Thus, I'm now doing this alone. Rudel San was always a careful person and carried himself with intelligence so it would have simply been alright to just get him not to hunt recklessly, in the meantime. Even though they told me that the river was dangerous. It was actually fine as long as I don't cross into the opposite side of the river. I have no desire to die right now, so I do not intend to cross to the opposite bank by myself, much less encountering a demonic beast like a dragon. If I did see one I would go all out to escape with great speed. Still, washing the bandits rags was really tiring. Time for a little rest. Just when I was about to rest, I lifted my head up and saw something across the river. I'm sure it was a woman. Her slightly curvy hair had the same shade of gold as mine, the tips of her hair was curved like waves, she looks like me. That female across the river gestured for me to come over, who could she be? This was the first time I saw somebody else other than the bandits around these parts, could there be a village nearby? If that is true dot dot would I be able to escape? Could it be that the bandits told me not to cross the river because there was civilization there to prevent me from trying to escape? Franking speaking, I have had no inclination to escape recently. Still, there could be people there. Um, what are you doing there? Is there a village near? I tried to speak to her but all she did was laugh without replying. What's going on? Could it be that she's mute? Or could it be that? She knows that there are bandits in the vicinity and doesn't want me to shout. As I laid down my thoughts, I went ahead and walked through the river. It wasn't a very deep river, its depth was only up to a child's waist like mine. 
The flow of the river was slow and there was absolutely no problem with walking across it. I kept my eye on the female that gestured me to follow her. Initially I thought she bore resemblance to me but, no, I had been mistaken, she was more like mother. Could it be that she was mother? Don't tell me that mother had been worried and came to look for me. I wanted to confirm the identity of that person. I crossed the river and reached the other side of the river. After reaching the other side, the person that looks like mother, continuously gestured for me to come. It looked like she wanted to hug me. It was mother. She had been worried and probably came to find me. She must have regretted selling me and she is telling me to come back to her. These were the thoughts in my mind as I was about to leap into her arms. Abruptly, the image of mother vanished. Unknowingly, a large black bear with nine eyes appeared in front of me. It swooped down its claws to attack me. Dash dash Zan. I fainted in fright. Loading. Bandit Arc 5 Ku Oka Arsen. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. I was hit by something from above, however, there wasn't pain as one would expect after being struck by claws. I opened up my eyes and saw red, it was blood. Somebody's back was drenched in blood. That somebody got in between the bear and I, and carried me away to protect me. Next. This person tried to run through the river, it was crimson red from shoulder to back. The person who carried me was likely cut by that monster earlier. This person was injured but continued to bring me across the river. I was laid down on the river before the person herself and fell to her knees with all her strength drained from her. She gave an intense gaze to the stunned me. It was the first time I had received such a stare. You went all the way across the river to that extent. A dreadful trembling voice straight from the depths of hell, Kusan shouted violently. This was the first time I heard that kind of voice from Kusan. S. Sorry. Just as I was about to squeeze out an apology, Kusan fell flat. Copious amount of blood was oozing from her back. If I don't stop the blood, I looked around for something to stop the blood loss and noticed an unwashed dry rag that could be used. There might be germs on it but it is far more dangerous for her continue losing blood like that. I grabbed the laundry and pressed it strongly on her wound. Boss. Kawimaya san Hey. Someone. Help. Kusan is. Kusan is. I called for help relentlessly. This place isn't really that far off from the camp, given that they all have good hearing. They should be able to hear me. If they couldn't, this would really be a big problem. As I screamed out loud, I took a glance at the opposite bank of the river, the nine-eyed bear was gone, no image of mother was left behind, surely that must have been a demonic beast, until boss and the rest get here, I continued to scream for help while trying to stop the bleeding, it was because of me that she gotten slashed, if she died on me dot dot there's no way I could accept it, not long later. Boss and gang came, and carried Kusan back to the camp. While trying to stop the bleeding, Boss looked at the greatly shocked me and said, Now you are the only who knows how to treat her injuries. Do it fast. I took another look at the pale-faced Kusan and finally regained some composure. It's true. Only I could do it. In order to help Kusan, I have to do it. I removed the rag that was pressed on her wound, washed off Kuoka Arsen's blood stained back with water and smeared a special ointment to stop bleeding. It was a green ointment made from the paste of Yamogi. In the past, when Kawamayu's arm had been scraped by a twig and there was a rather long cut on his arm, wasn't there a need to stitch the wound? As far as I remember, it was a gaping wound though. I probably won't need to do that since this ointment could stop bleeding and close wounds too. I have a feeling that the bodies of the people in this world were more sturdy than the people from my previous world. Or maybe it could be that the Kusan's medicine is really effective. I applied the ointment on the wound generously, and on top of that, I fastened the cloth around her wound that had been sterilized by boiling. Most likely she will be alright. The wound was big but, it wasn't as deep as the one Kawamayu had before. From then on, I kept night watches on Kusan to nurse her, or it could be that I couldn't sleep. A short time later, Kusan started having nightmares from her fever and pains. I made her drink a medicated soup that relieves pain and alleviates fever, wiped off her sweat, changed the dressing and placed a wet towel over her head to cool her down. I tried all I could to reduce her pain and to help her. Occasionally, 
Kusan would shout my name in her nightmares, and to check if she was alright, I would take her hand and tell her that I was alright. Rather than me, Kusan was the one that wasn't alright. The other bandits were worried sick too and didn't want to leave Kusan's side. Boss told them, with a bunch of dirty dudes gathering around, the one getting treated obviously wouldn't be able to recover comfortably. And then, he chased them out. I apologized to the boss about being lured by the demonic beast to the opposite side of the river and did ending up with Kusan protecting me. I had resigned myself to the possibility of boss becoming enraged at my foolish act. He might have killed me for my mistake but the boss simply muttered, I see. And then, Kusan who was still in her nightmare, started to shout Alek, the boss's name. Alek, don't live dangerously, defying them. Alek, it's impossible. Alek replied, it's fine, to all her incoherent mumblings. That was how things went for the entire night when we were caring for her. Boss told me to get some rest but I had stubbornly declined. Boss face was entirely impregnable but more fascinating was that he never once left Kuoka Arsene's side. At the crack of dawn, Kuoka Arsene's breathing had stabilized. She stopped having nightmares, and her fever went down. Perhaps she managed to calm down. As I looked at Kuoka Arsen, I, who had been fatigued by looking after her through the night and being anxious, slowly lay down to rest near her. I was reflecting on how all this had happened. There was no way mother would come all the way here yet I had been successfully tricked into crossing the river. That was a demonic beast wasn't it? It had deceived me and tried to get me over the river. I was under the impression the demonic beasts would be something like a dragon or a slime. I was really that stupid. My hands shiver just thinking about it. In the first place, why had I been lured by mother? Hadn't I given up on that already? I told myself that I couldn't give a damn, and will forget them forever. Even though I resolved myself to forget, I could feel somebody gently caressing my forehead, causing me to wake up. I had drifted to sleep while thinking about all those things. It was Kusan who was gently stroking my forehead, one way or another. We have made it past the most difficult phase. I was relieved that Kusan was now safe and that nobody died because of my carelessness. The warmth emitted from Kuoka Arsene's hand was comforting. S. Sorry. It was because of me. Sorry. It's okay. Dot. I'm glad you are fine. These bandages and medicines are done by Ryu Chan? I nodded. I don't really know how but. It feels as though the inside of my throat had stopped working and I lost my voice. I see. Well done. Thanks. This was due to Yu Chan's efforts. You are really good at this. But dot dot why did you stick out your body to shield someone like me? Wrong. Not someone like me. It's because you are Yu Chan. Dot. You are just like how Alec was back in the past. Tinged with hatred for the world in the A's of a defeated. I couldn't just leave you alone. Boss who was seated nearby was fidgeting restlessly and grumbled. What the heck man? It might have been a brusque remark from him but from his voice, I knew that he was relieved that Kusan had regained consciousness. I forcefully eked out a hoarse voice from my throat. Kusan, I uttered, didn't I say this when we first met? I would take care of you. And please call me Kuoka Arsene. Kuoka Arsene smiled tenderly as she said. And then, I endured the pain in my throat to gather whatever voice I had. Yes. Kuoka Arsene. Thank you. I was overjoyed. So much so that I gradually could see the world glittering. Somehow, layered inside my fluffy emotions, another level headed me whispered, You will be sold anyways. It has been decided. You would be betrayed. I know that. I can grasp that. Even then, no matter what, a me that hopes for something remains. Loading. Bandit Arc 6 The Anguish of an Applicant to the Organization. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. After a few days, Kusan's condition had stabilized. She is now able to sit upright and eat on her own. Since she was able to hold conversations, I have been receiving instructions from her on following treatment procedures. The scars on her back were still there and looked as though they were slightly inflamed. Nevertheless, because the wound has closed up, whether the scar would disappear entirely depends on the treatment. Right now, I am replacing the ointment which stops bleeding, which also relieves pain and suppress inflammation, 
and changing her dressing. In the period when I cared for Kuoka Arsene, I felt somewhat blissful. Kuoka Arsene is really kind. I feel that she actively tries to cover up for my fallings. Still, what awaits me is getting sold off to somebody else. I wonder what Kuoka Arsene plans for me exactly. She has been so kind to me, so much so that I have gotten the wrong idea about her. No, it's as though it's already become an expectation. After all, she protected me with her life. Doesn't this mean she regards me as something very important? When treated in such a way, anyone would have their hopes without doubt that Kuoka Arsen obviously loves me. I mean, she even said at the beginning, that she was going to think of me as her child with boss. She told me to call her Oka-san. I have believed it again. However, if I were to be backstabbed again, if I were to be sold again, as of now, Kuoka Arsen is unable to move so I'm the only medic for the bandits, that's why, they allow me to stay by their side all the time though. As long as Kuoka Arsen is lying down on the bed, I am the bandit's precious medic, that's why, in the meantime, I won't be sold. That's right, at this rate, if Kuoka Arsen can be bedridden forever, preferably both her hands and legs, that, that's impossible. I am a Yanda. Scary. I am definitely not a Yanda. Honestly, I don't have a good idea of how Kuoka Arsen thinks of me. Furthermore, asking her would be scary, but I understand my thoughts clearly. I want to continue this life with them. I want to continue being with Kuoka Arsen, boss and the other bandits. With this newfound conviction, I'm sure I can muster the courage to achieve anything. Also, I want to try my very best. I am very aware that effort doesn't equate to results. Even in the past, whenever I had an inclining that my parents were getting closer to me, I would push myself harder, but even then, my efforts were not rewarded. Still, even if that was the case, I still want to cling on to this little hope that I have. More often than not, effort goes unrewarded everywhere in the world. Still, at the very end, I want to hang on to, to this hope. This would be the last time, all right. This shall be my bandit debut. I knew in advance that I was going to be the Earl's family maid and I had considered that to be good vocation but being a bandit isn't bad either. I want to continue living as a bandit. The slow life had been fun. It's just that I don't want to be involved in something like robbery. After all, I hail from the relatively safe Japan. Regarding the act of robbing, there would be no problems as long as I correct the ways of them bandits. Yes, that's it, yes. I, who is presently supposed to be a cute little girl, would tell them, boss, for my sake, please do not go against me. With that, they would stop for sure. However, was it even possible for boss to change his ways even though evil has seeped deep into his face? No, let's stop thinking too deeply into it, for now. The most vital thing is to join their banded gang. I wonder if there are any formal procedures to join them. Such as a test, a rich Laura baptism. First of all I need to confirm if boss would even let me join. No, wait. If I suddenly requested to join, he would probably say something like, There is nothing that a kid like you can do, don't ever ask of that again. Even I wouldn't dare to ask a second time after that, I know. How about increasing my appeal before making my request to join? Yes, that's it. If I can get them to tell me, please join us bandits, that would be good. I swiftly drew up and refined my plan. I would swing into action starting from tomorrow. The morning for a bandit applicant is early. I woke up earlier than everyone else, and started mixing today's portion of medicine. Next is collecting vegetables nearby. Today, I am also planning to join them in hunting. So I looked around for a long wooden stick that can be used while hunting. The leftover ashes from the bonfire could be used to make soap so I kept it for later and also did some sweeping around the perimeters of the tents. Next, I started a fire and prepared breakfast with the vegetables that were gathered and wild boar meat. The bandits eat plentifully during breakfast. After that, being lured by the scent of food. The bandits woke up one by one. I greeted them with an invigorating smile. Oh, oh, boss, good morn. Wow, you still look as cool as ever. What do you want? Alec boss became unsettled at my invigorating greeting. Oh that's right, up till now, all my greetings weren't as casual as how the bandits would greet one another with good morn. Yep, I might have overdone it. 
for now, I'll treat it as though nothing happened and continue in my usual way of speaking. Even though I returned back to my original way of speaking, I still won't forget to pepper my words with compliments for the boss. Later, because removing other obstacles are equally as important, I would excessively praise the bandit management team too. As for Kawimayu, I told him, you're the best bro, as expected. And he was put into a good mood. As for Gay Isan, the musclehead, I complimented his bulging muscles and he twitched his chest muscles in delight. Rudel San was suspicious of my drastic change in behavior so my compliments didn't work well on him. The reaction from boss was equally as bad. It's okay. This is just the first day. I will proceed without panicking. After finishing with things like helping Kusan with her meals, preparing her medicine and changing her dressing, I conveyed my interest to join them in hunting to boss. However, he rejected me and said, It's impossible since you can't even ride a horse. Still, to get here, I rode together with Kusan so I probably could help out by shooting with a bow while paired with someone else on a horse. I had achieved decent standards in archery during my previous life. I told the boss that I knew how to shoot from the bow, and the boss said, if you say you can, why don't you show me, and lend me his bow. I tried to pull the boat string, but was unable to do so due to lack of strength. Cute. If only I had the body of my previous life. I resolved to add push-ups to my morning program. In the end, I wasn't allowed to join them in the hunt. The boss stroked my head, very unlike of him and said, well, if there is a chance in the future, I would teach you how to hunt. Eh, no way, the normally scary him became so kind all of a sudden. How startling. If the boss was a little bit more handsome, that would so much better. Sadly, from how I see it, the boss has a scary face that looks like a bulldog or a gorilla. Sorry, but that's definitely not my type. Furthermore, I don't want any as my rival. I don't feel that I would be able to win his, oops I mean, her femininity. With that, the days went by with me contributing to the bandits primarily by being responsible for all the housework. And then, the hardworking me showed everyone that I wasn't just a housework girl. I borrowed a hoe from the village bandits, tilled an empty space, fertilized the land with horse dung and tried to grow some potatoes. The very next night, some wild boars dug out everything and ate them. I got scolded by Kuoka Arson for that too. I tried to make soap with water mixed with ash and animal fats but the bubbles from it were terrible and the soap reeked of smelly fats. Furthermore, the bandits who do not give a damn to whether they are clean or dirty weren't concerned with hygiene and said, won't washing with water do? Rejecting the soap right away. Using clay from the mountains and heating them with the ashes of bonfire, I made some straw rope pattern bowls, but aren't the wooden bowls we're using now good enough? They said and treated the straw rope pattern bowls as ornaments. I tried to flaunt the musical talents I possessed that annihilated all my competition in my previous lifetime. This was a plan to turn them into slaves of my art, so I stole a bucket that was used as armor by the village bandits and used twigs to play drum. However, the hypersensitive Rudel told me to shut up. And right now, I am in the midst of making bricks from clay. I am making a cooking stove with the bricks. Also, I plan to build a wall as a partition to shield people from eyes when they are wiping themselves with wet cloths. This time for sure, I would impress everyone. That was how I enjoyed my days to the fullest even though no matter how I see it, it was all fruitless effort. Could it be because of my impatience? I've never experienced things that haven't gone elegantly until now. However, it is strange. Even though things haven't gone smoothly, I am still having lots of fun. With regards to whatever I do, anyone who had seen it all gave some feedback. Even though I might have failed, and that they show some displeasure, none of them would actually be disappointed. Could it be because they do not have any strange expectations of me? Somehow, the load on my shoulders feels extremely light. Loading. Banded Arc 7 Magic Sword. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. 
please calm down myself. The me that was in a slump took on a nirvana pose to compose myself. Too many things have gone wrong but the fundamentals are holding fine. I did the housework perfectly and I performed my job as a medic well. I even got to learn how to handle a horse from boss and can mostly ride on a horse now. Also, I can dress the meat of small animals too. More or less dot dot even though this is merely it, even though there have been some failures, this should be enough to cover up for it. I wonder how the boss would evaluate me as of now. Sometimes I have too much fun and I would forget about this. The others around me treated me normally too. Hurry up and scout me please. I peeked at boss but he showed no signs of wanting to do so. Speaking of which, aren't everyone treating me too normally? Is this the normal way to treat their latest merchandise, me? This feels as though I have already become one of them. In the end, due to being unable to contact Bashusan, months have already passed since I was kidnapped. When discussing about Bashusan, they didn't mention about selling me either. Could it be that discussion on selling me has not gone through smoothly? Does that mean all I should do now is continue acting innocently? If it is good now, won't it be fine? Uck. My live in the moment personality is whispering to me. Quiet. The alone me. Still, I never once thought the day when I aspire to be abandoned would come. Honestly, life like this is difficult, dirty and dangerous. Dot dot isn't this 3D? TN. It was 3K in the original text. Yo. You dot dot what? An afternoon nap? Saws but won't you lend me a hand? Kawimayu bro came along and saw me in a nirvana pose. It seems like he wants to scrape off fats from boar skin. Of course I readily okayed to it. At first, I was still sympathetic to the boar and also found it a challenging task but as of now, my hands have gotten used to it. Furthermore, we used knives to scrape fats from the skin and thus, they would return Alan's dagger back to me. Hence, I agreed to do the job, though after I became accustomed to their bandit life, they returned it to me just like that. Hey. Doesn't that mean I'm already part of their gang? Isn't that so? Nevertheless, even though I am glad to have the Allen's dagger given back to me, I never did expect to use it to remove fats from wild boar skin. Alan wouldn't dream of that either. That dagger of yours Ryu, was it a gift? Kawimayu asked me as he scrutinized me from the side as I scraped fats. The young master where I was last employed gave it to me. It seemed that he became somewhat interested in it as he raised his eyebrows in reaction. The young master is a mage. Yes, he made it for me with magic. I heard that a sword made by a mage with magic is proof of trust that the mage has for the receiver. Trust her, said Kawimayu bro as he smiled meaningfully. By the way, I personally made this dagger with metal, he said as he showed me a blunt dagger that had been made shoddily. Yourself? Hey. Ah, impressive. Whoops. That was close, I nearly forget my usual compliments. Which reminds me, in the legends, the humans made use of swords and armor refined from minerals during the war, which means that there should be people working as blacksmiths right? If that is the case, why bother the mages to make swords and the like when you can entrust it to the blacksmiths? Irene San's job included a decent load of assignments to refine swords and armor from mineral. I think it would be better if humans made these themselves more proactively. That's why this is a god killer dagger. God killer? Kawimayu bro. What a chayunabi way of saying it. And sooner or later his right hand would start hurting right. Tn. Something to do with how Chayunabius imagined that they have powers stashed away in their eye, arm, etc. Ha, ha. I had no idea how to deal with people with Chayunabiu so I did was give a half-hearted reply. A more appropriate reply might be something like, from a third person's perspective dot dot that looks dangerous. Oh oh, it looks like you have no idea how awesome a god-killing dagger can be ha. Huh? Oh oh. Somehow, Kawimayu bro was in high spirits. He must be very proud of his dagger. A self-made object with emotional attachment is really different ha, huh? really. This was not made by magical powers. Therefore, it is a dagger that is able to slaughter mages. Ooh, slaughter, what a disturbing choice of word. But hey, since this is a sword we are talking about, if it is sharp enough, it would have the ability to kill any human, regardless of whether it is a mage or not. Even a dagger made by a mage would be able to pierce a mage without problem I think. After I said that, Kawimayu bro raised Alan's dagger up to take a better look. Honestly speaking, 
It feels much better than the dagger made specially by Kawamayu. However, Kawamayu Bra laughed in a mocking manner. Ha! Huh? How humiliating. Yu's one is still very much lacking. A sword made by a mage can easily be erased by magic did you know? Eh? That being said, when Alan was making the sword, he turned the sword into dust countless of times whenever he failed. This means, as long as it is a mage, he or she could erase anything made by magic. Something made strongly with magic by the royals would be difficult to erase but others can mostly be erased. All it takes is the incantation. Well, if that person does not know the incantation then it would be impossible. But most mages should roughly remember the dispelling incantation. Well, no matter what, the dagger I am holding is totally awesome, because no magic can erase it yeah said the all smug Kawamayu bro. Speaking of which, that, how should I say it, um, how, huh? there are many places where normal people forge and make swords right? Nope, it's probably only made in a secret underground of the underground world in the capital. Among the demonic beasts, there are some that do not get hurt by swords made from magic, for that express purpose, they have some swords like that. Even for me, when I was attending school, I secretly made it. Actually it was a special lesson on how to make coins and currency but I did it such that the teacher didn't notice anything. And then, because he looked as though he wanted to be praised, I interjected with my compliments. However, as I was complimenting him, my imaginations could not be stopped. The fleeting view of a clawless, fangless and lifeless beast living in a big cage came to mind. Surprisingly, the mages after the mythical era might have been very shrewd. That's because in order to prevent a second uprising from the humans, they carefully maintained and trimmed their claws and fangs. Loading, Bandit Arcade unable to contact Bashu-san. Loading, Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Rudel-san and the rest who went down to the countryside to investigate Bashu-san's movement came back. Has Basha not returned? It appears so. Rudel San reported emotionlessly to Boss who became enraged. Looks like Bashu San had been serious about the agricultural reforms and had gone looking for talents in his territory. This would mean that he would only be back in one to two years, despite the repeated trips down the mountain by Gai San and the others. We were never able to meet him. We had been tangled up in hopes that Bashu San would return and as such, we had concealed ourselves in the mountains for a few months. I casually turned seven years old like this. Personally, I was greatly welcome this slow pace of life. But as for the boss, all he did was sigh aloud. Seriously, the bastard bash you better be prepared. Come on, let it go. Wasn't living in the mountains fun? Let's continue this and build a home here. Ku Oka Arson drew closer to the peeved boss wiggle by wiggle. It's not about this being fun or not. Also, I don't remember building a home with you. The boss made a terribly sickened face and stepped away from Kuoka Arsene. This was a usual scenario. And so you might claim. Did you know that I knew? That you have been secretly been giving Yu Chan horse riding lessons secretly beneath the shadows. Weren't you talking about hunting enthusiastically? What? Boss talking enthusiastically? Boss's face had always been scary so I couldn't read anything like enthusiasm from his face. I see. So he had been enjoying himself then. Ah, what a sinful young girl I am. What? Seven years olds do not qualify as a young girl? How about no? He he he. My strategy has been rather masterfully executed. Shut up. Enough of it, Kuki. For now, we have no way to meet Bashu-san. Why don't we make a trip back to Gurugri village? It has been quite some time since we left. Any lingering ruckus should have died down by now. True. I'm also curious on how the village is doing. Shall we go back? Rudel-san replied. Rudel-san was part of the planning team it seems. His clever face was not just for show. Kuki's injury shouldn't be of any problem. Can you ride a horse? Ah, Alek is worried for me. H-A-P-P-Y. But, shouldn't you be referring to me as Ku-chan? Again, ku oka Arsen started to creep closer to boss, while boss retaliated in return. If Kuki is able to move like then it should be fine. Alek, 
when are we leaving? As he was watching their scuffle obliviously, Rudel San raised his question to Boss. Stop fooling around, go away, said Boss as he thrusted Kuoka Asna away and recovered his footing. Blokes, get ready, we are moving dot dot now. From Boss's signal, the bandits meeting had adjourned. All of us moved on to make preparations. However, to have addressed everyone as blokes. How troubling that this cute young girl here had been forgotten. Furthermore, poor Kuoka Arsene. So sad that she got pushed away. I rushed over to Kuoka Arsene and called out to her, but she was making an entranced look and muttered, Ah, as expected, Alec is so charming. No problems on her side, I guess. My belongings consist of Alan's dagger and some red pepper seedlings. Some time ago, I had uprooted the seedlings of red peppers that can be found in the mountains. I transplanted the seedlings to my self-made clay pots, as a substitute for planters, and placed pots on the horse so that it does not be too much of a burden. Guy San who was proud of his strength was in charge of carrying my luggage. I gave him the red peppers planters and gave an amazed expression that in an instant, he managed to heave them onto the horse while saying, Orfs Gaisan has the tendency to end all his conversations with, Orfs the things that Ryu Chan had brought to Long Shore is strange huh, it may be true that red peppers may serve as medicine but dot dot we don't really need it, also, all we need are the seeds too. Kuoka Arsene struck a conversation with me after lifting me up to the back of the horse. It is embarrassing that I am still unable to ride on a horse on my own. I am not of the right size now. If only it was a pony, only if it was a pony. I am thinking of using it to protect the crops from wild boars. We might be able to acquire red peppers there but I am bringing them just in case. I heard from Gozel San, TN. Previously I called him Gauze, but I realized Gozel is a more accurate translation that the fields at Garigri village were often ravaged by wild boars and that it is a pressing problem. Yes, ever since my potato fields had been ravaged, I have been researching on countermeasures against wild boars. The results of my research are that red peppers can be used to protect the fields. I experimentally found that wild boars no longer approach the fields when they are enclosed by red peppers hedges. I plan to unveil the fruits of my research in Gurugri village and have everyone say, good job, Yu Chan. This is a tactic to have them call me amazing Wu. I don't really know but because it is Wu. This seems like another one of your dubious stuff again. Rudel San joined in the conversation and knitted his brows. I mean, the only person Rudel San knits his brows to is me. Rudel San does not appear to like children. That is not to say he is a terribly evil person. Personally I think he is well natured. Still, saying that they are dubious stuff is kinda hurtful though. Right now all he might see are my eccentricity but it is the back from the dead view from now on. And then, the journey on horse begun. Perhaps the three villager bandits were delighted that they could finally go home. They looked especially cheerful. Even on the road, I heard them talking about their moms and sisters that they had left behind at the village. I see. I see. Being able to see their family must be good. It's not that I am particularly envious of them. Loading. Bandit Arc 9 Gregory Village. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. When we arrived at Gregory Village, the appearance of the village had transformed to some extent. The fields are well maintained. When we left the village, even though it was late at night then so I might not have been able to see clearly but the fields appeared to be in a messed up state. We bandits went straight for the village chief's house, just as we did before. Chief, did you encounter any problems when we weren't around? More than anything, it seems that this place has changed. Have you all started tilling the fields? Yes, that's right. The truth is, some days after Alex Sama left, the mages came. The crops had been grown with magic. Sip sip. He had been talking for some time so I guess his throat had become dry. Chief was slurping his tea. Mages huh? Dot they came to chase us? It seemed that way. It's just that, instead of being focused on subjugating you bandits, they were more interested on the whereabouts of this girl, who is with you. The village chief fixed his eyes on me while sipping his tea. 
Don't tell me the mages were really activated. Rudel murmured with a pale face. That reminds me, before we left the village, he argued that there was no way the mages would come so soon. How did the chief and the rest answer to their inquiries? I told them we had no idea. They used a light spirit user to search but because Alexama left in the middle of the night, they found no traces, and since they made the effort to come all the way here, they assisted us in growing crops. However, because we did not plant any seeds cough hack hack. Oh old man. The tea, drink the tea. Don't talk for so long, phew. My apologies. Because we did not plant any seeds. There was not much of a harvest, and show, the mages gave us seeds and something called fertilizer, and that is what we are growing with right now. Ah, I saw it when he came to the village earlier. Buds have started to sprout in the fields. Yes, that's the case. Anyhow, that the seeds were able to grow into buds. It is something to be joyous about. It's all thanks to the fertilizer. We are now cultivating the field by mixing in ashes of burnt grass and decomposed soil that can be found in the mountains. Fertilizer? Speaking of which... Dot dot, I seem to recall teaching the spirit users of rainforest about fertilizer. Could it be that the mage that visited the village was a haggardly old man with sunken cheeks and dark circles under his eyes, who also looked like he was dying all the time? The could it be popped into my mind and so I cut into the conversation. Yes, in died, I knew it. It is definitely the spirit user from the cruel black enterprise who always look as though death was upon him. I see, he came all the way here to do business. Well done. Your acquaintance? Boss turned to face me. He might be called an acquaintance. When I was a maid, I gave him some help. Also, that spirit user is really doing a great service to the villagers by educating on fertilizer. Alexama, would you be staying for a short while? Ah, I was planning to do so. I would be borrowing a room. As he said, the village chief turned to his back. Boss's face was stoic. Boss and the rest left the chief's house and were guided to a vacant house that had been prepared. En route, the three village bandits were about to return to their homes and back to their families but for some reason. The boss stopped them and we entered the unoccupied house together. No way. This house is so small. How can we squeeze all nine of us here? I certainly wish the villager bandits returned to their own homes though. Everyone entered the room and shut all the windows and doors. Do you hear it? The boss muttered with an indiscernible expression. Ah, I hear it. The sound of horse hooves right? This time it was not the composed Rudelsan but a slightly flustered Rudelsan. Most likely, they have gone to inform the mages so that they can capture us. A, eh? in short, you mean that huh? That this bandit village has sold the boss out? It can't be. Why? There's no way the people in this village would do that. Retard, keep your voice down. The villager bandit trio were greatly shocked and could not believe it. Kawimayu raised his voice to remonstrate the bewildered trio. But, Kawimayu bro, boss and the rest are our benefactors. There is no way that anyone would do that. Everyone may not all think your way. Do not forget that this time, the mages have bestowed their help and that there would be some who desire to lead a life dependent on the mages. Kawimayu looks slightly dejected. Heartbreaking. T that can't. All this time, the mages have abandoned us. The one that gave us a hand when we nearly died was dot dot even though it was boss San and the rest. And now at this late hour, just because they grew the crops. It can't be. In order to calm the somewhat agitated villager bandits, Kawimayu placed his hand on Gozel San's shoulder with a bonk. You understand? This is how a portion of the villagers think. It's not that everyone think like that. You got it? The villager bandits casted their eyes down and nodded. If the horses set off from today, it is unlikely for the mages to be able to reach here by today. We leave by sunset today. Boss had carefully timed himself to give these orders only after the villager bandits have composed themselves. The leaders among the bandits likewise agreed with Boss. Next, Boss shifted his eyes to the villager bandits that are still in disbelief and who are still frozen in their thoughts. Gozel, Poran, and Bucket. What about you guys? Will you stay in the village? Once we leave, there will be no return. Are you prepared to never see your family again? The three villager bandits slowly lifted up their face and stiffly looked up to boss. Their faces were pale. It feels like they still have many considerations and that they have yet to sort them out in their heads. Boss, 
Can we have more time to decide? Nope. Decide now. If you have hesitations, I have no need for you. Towards Boss's unrelenting words, the three of them could only gulp. The room became so quiet to that extent that the air in the room froze over. The first to break the silence was Bucket San. When he left for the village, he was the villager bandit that put a bucket over his head as a substitute for armor, and so he was nicknamed Bucket San. He was generally shy, and hardly said much but still. He treated me kindly. When he returned to Guragri village, he had been worried for his mother that stayed behind in the village, and asked how his mother was doing while stuttering. Bucket San removed the bucket that was over his hand with his trembling hands, and dropped it. Clunk next he went down to his knees. He started crying while kneeling down. Sorry. I cannot abandon my family. Bucket San had decided to remain in the village. The other two who had been watching him, crumbled down to their knees too. I, too, am very sorry. In the end, I want to be with my family. Being able to be on a journey with Boss had been very fun but, that is only because we definitely had a place to return to. And then, the three of them kowtowed. Ku Oka Arson said in her teary voice, It's alright. We'll let you stay by your family's side. Raise your heads, and patted their backs. Ku Oka Arson is easily moved to tears. I see. I understand. If the mages were to come, just tell them you had been forced to follow us against your wills. Boss revealed gentleness in his expression. As for Kawimayu bro, he looked like he was having it tough too. Probably because he would no longer have them little brothers around. Mew, what about you? All of a sudden, Boss directed his eyes to me. Eh? What about me? Dot dot what do you mean? In any case, your future husband dot dot Claude was it? That guy, to the extent of using the mages. He had been crazily searching for you it seems. Would you stay here? Eh? Even I would be given a choice? Being asked this question out of the blue. I took a hard look at Boss's face. It was never changing deadly looking face. I could not read his true intention from his face. If I chose to stay, does it mean I would be able to meet with everyone back at Rainforest Territory? From Alan to Kane to Irene San to Claude San to Stella San. The faces of everyone with whom I had spent time with over there resurfaced in my mind. However, if I did that, I would no longer be able to be with the bandits. With Kuoka Arsen, I took a long look at the bandits. They all had their eyes on me. They await my answer. I will. Loading. Bandit Arc 10 escaping from the village. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. To say that I was not confused would be a lie. However, since I have already made my decision, I immediately replied, I will go, together with Boss. Boss's grim face changed momentarily into a dumbfounded one as though he was shocked. He must have found my reply surprising. Is that alright? I nodded. From behind, Ku Oka Arsen who had been patting on the villager bandits back to cheer them up started to totter towards me. She looked to be in disbelief. Are you really, really okay with it? Yes. Do you not want that? If they disagreed with me joining them, just thinking about what to do next would be scary. All of a sudden, my body temperature felt like it dropped several degrees down. Totally not. You are definitely not happy with it at all. Ku Oka Arsen had tears and mucus choked in her eyes and nose as she hugged me tightly. As I was hugged, knowing the fact that I was together with Ku Oka Arsen made me very happy and subconsciously, my cheeks slackened. If Ku Oka Arsen is happy dot dot I too will be happy. And next. I also wrung my hands around Ku Oka Arsen to hug her. Why does the sensation of hugging someone feel so good? Her warmth, softness and breathing was being transmitted to my senses through my hands that were on her back. I wonder if Ku Oka Arsen could feel the same emotions as she hugged me. As I filled myself to the brim with a human's warmth, I heard next to my ear, Thank you, Mu Chan, Gomzabaschchvgan. Her words were jumbled with voiced sounds. I could not catch the last few words she said because there were too many voiced sounds but Ku Oka Arsen was sobbing for me. She embraced me because she was so happy that I would stay together with them. With this alone, I am satisfied. I looked at my own arm as I hugged Ku Oka Arsen. It was the same old skin colored arm. I wondered if I had a family. 
Would I grow a horn out of overexcitement or maybe my skin would turn green? But such a thing did not happen. I had always wanted to be loved and that because I was never loved, I always felt worthless. Still, I had already been in bliss because I had loved somebody else. Proof of that can be seen in that I had long become fond of all the bandits. I had long been in happiness. Since we have agreed on leaving after sunset, we gave the red pepper seedlings to the three villager bandits who were going to continue to stay in the village. It was something that was brought along as a countermeasure for the wild boars that constantly attacked the fields. In truth, it was my tool to be known as impressive you and that I wanted to directly unveil and explain it to the villagers, while observing the aftermath of using it, however, doing that would be difficult so I explained it concisely to Gozel San before entrusting it to him. To use it to protect the fields from the boars. Plant as much red pepper seedlings as necessary at the spots where the wild boars frequently come from. If there aren't enough seedlings to do that, transplant red pepper seedlings from the mountains, where it can be found in the wild. If there still is a shortage, he could try to grind the seeds and scatter it all over the place. I told him that might be effective too. Even though the sprouts were able to grow in the fields because of the fertilizer, it does not mean that those sprouts will not be attacked by wild animals. Gozelsan was half convinced and half in doubt so I don't know if he will put it to the test but for now, I shall teach him all that I can, and in exchange for the red pepper seedlings, only if it is possible, I hope that he could help me pass a message to the mages that are coming to the village. I am healthy and alive so do not worry. I do not want to return to the rainforest territory so if it is possible, Please do not search for me and the bandits as well, please, the villager bandit, previously, listened to my message with a complicated look but he said he would take care of it anyways, at the same time when the sun had set, so as to not raise the attention of the villagers, we left in secret, as always, I sat in front of Kuoka Arsen, Kawimayu, Gei San, Kuoka Arsen and even Rudel San, everyone lost their energy and were downhearted. We planned to head back to the Ruby Fallen Territory from here on. From the discussion we had on where should we go from here, we concluded that our destination would be, as I have thought, Bashu San's place. We have settled on chasing after Bashu San, since we do know that he is making his rounds around farmlands. Actually, we don't seem to have any idea on where he might be, but as long as we know the general direction he went and asked the locals on the way, we should be able to advance. Frankly, I do not know how long it would take before we would chance upon Bashu San. It could take one or two years. Despite so, Boss said that he had to meet Bashu San because he had something to tell him. As we got further and further away from Guragri Village, I looked at the outlines of Guragri Village and got somewhat sentimental. Guragri Village is to me a village which I had given me complicating emotions. Not only was this the village where I was brought to after being abducted. It was the place where I became determined to be with the bandits. It was also the village that betrayed us. That is not to say that all the villagers had betrayed Boss though. Compared to the instability of hunting and pillaging, living a life under the protection of the mages would seem to be more stable and would obviously be a better choice. That is what most people would have thought. Even for me, if I had been given the same options while I was at Garagari village. I would have definitely picked the more stable choice, however, by doing so, somewhere inside, I would feel that I have lost something important. I have some opinions about this village but in no way do I hate this village, perhaps it is due to the how this village resembles Garagari village. For a brief second in front of me, boss's back drooped down, indeed, he must be feeling dejected. Well. As expected, I get this feeling that Boss treats the three villager bandits as through they were his younger brothers. Also, when we started on the journey right after I had been kidnapped, Boss had been very popular among everyone in the village. He must have had never imagined the day when he would have to escape from the village. Would come, keep your spirits high, Boss. I would be supporting your back. Loading. Bandit Arc 11 a year after all that happened. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Isn't this clay pack awesome? You are right. Feels great. I'm gonna spread all over our arms, 
legs and everywhere else that is exposed to the sun. Ah. Me too me too. It also helps as a sunscreen too. It has been approximately one year since we left and escaped Gregory village. Many things have had happened during our journey but the bandits are all doing fine. However, we have not met up with Bashu-san yet. Nevertheless, we did not spend the time fruitlessly waiting for Bashu-san. Ku Oka Arsen and I started a beauty seminar to enhance women's femininity, spending our days on polishing up one's figure. Today was a seminar on clay packs. It was an ointment that had been made with fine soil mixed with medicated water and then thickened into paste. You were Kuanizen, is it? What are you doing? I totally thought you were some demonic beast. Buahaha, Ku Oka Arsen delivered the clean hit to Kuwamayu Aniki who had been talking straightforwardly. What do you mean by demonic beasts? After Ku Oka Arsen shouted back with dagger-like sharpness, I joined in with, yeah right. That's rude. After spending more time with Kuoka Arsen, I have acquired a womanly tone. It is a good thing. S. Sorry. You um. The boss is calling. As Kuomayu bro held his beaten cheeks with his hands, he stood up unsteadily. Oh? Alec called? Well, then I shall make my way. Kuoka Arsen went off while covered in mud. A. Are you going in that state? Kuomayu bro interjected with a soft voice after waiting for Kuoka Arsen to be some distance away. Aniki has returned her, huh? have we made contact with Bashu-san? Right on, said Kawimayu bro as he gave his thumbs up. Finally, some days before, Bashu-san has finalized his team to undertake the agricultural reform. However, having boss appear out of nowhere and saying, Gahahaha, I have finally found you, would invite suspicions that he might be a demon lord and we were afraid that we might be subjugated by Bashu-san's escorts. So Kawamayu delivered a message instead. Well, it is easy so long as you leave it to me. First of all, I went to a nearby village and approached the girl. I gave her some pocket money and I told to help me pass a bouquet to the person in the carriage. And then, inside the bouquet was the message addressed to Bashu so. Hey, are you listening? Bro stopped in the middle of his story to shout at me because I was still smearing the mud on every crook and cranny of my body. I'm listening. So the size of it is that Bashu-san found the letter in the bouquet and is coming to us right? Impressive, impressive. What's with that half-hearted praise? Why you're treating me pretty bad these days you know? Just one year ago, you were still so docile. You must be imagining it. As I continued applying the ointment. In order to get back to the main topic, I said, and then, Kawimayu Aniki roughly understood my intent and continued with his story. And therefore, the strategy worked out well, just that there was this extra guy. Extra guy, you say? It was Kuanizan's little brother. He is together with Bashu-san. He is a spirit user, from another domain, Yamato domain. For him, Ever since he kind of eloped with the Ojusama, the royalty has been alienating the Yamato Earl family. I wonder if he would be driven out from Ruby Fallen, said Kawamayu as he laughed meanly. Thereafter, Kawamayu switched to grumbling and complaining that, damn, that he would appear was totally unforeseen. Still, there was some delight hidden in his voice. It was more like he was actually thrilled. It sounds as if, you were close friends? We ain't close. Disgusting. All we have is a fatal destiny. I see. From his reaction, they must be really intimate friends. Boss and everyone are friends from the school yes? I heard about it from Kuoka Arsen. Did boss and everyone often hang out with this Kuoka Arsen's brother? Well, yeah. Still, he was a mage so the worlds we live in are different. Monkey face Aniki looked somewhat gloomy. However, that boss hanged out with him shows that they got on well with another though. Furthermore, earlier, Aniki said that he actually eloped with a princess at that, doesn't that mean he was a charming person? What? Charming? No way. He was immature. He said while laughing and crumpling my hair. At the part when he said charming, he made a terrible shrieking voice. He had better not been trying to imitate my voice when he did that. My voice is definitely cuter than that. A cute voice that young girls have. To display my indignation, I gave Aniki a hug while covered in mud. You are, hey you, you'll dirty me. Aniki yelling resounded through the mountains. The meeting with Bashu was arranged to be ten days from now. Ever since that was decided, somehow, 
Boss had been on his toes and Kuoka Asuna was less lively. After having our dinner around the bonfire, the rest started drinking and making some noises but something felt different about today's atmosphere compared to other days. Everyone seemed to be drinking with a tinge of weightiness. I grabbed hold of a handmade bamboo flute. TN, specifically, a transverse flute. I had always played a tune or two after our meal but what should I do today? A life in the mountains would not have the usual entertainment we have normally, so I was thinking of what could I do before finally choosing music. Hence, I made this bamboo flute myself. It was made such that the notes were accurate. Usually, together with the party, I would blow a nice pihaiara, tn. The sound of a party horn. Music with a refreshing rhythm and the intoxicated gay Isan and Kuwimayu would dance to it. However, it looks like the audience do not have that kind of fervor today to dance to the music. From the atmosphere, if I did that today. I would undoubtedly be regarded as someone who cannot read the atmosphere. In the end, I played as solemn classical music as the BGM. As I blew from my flute, as always, Rudel San glaringly gazed at my hands. Rudel San had a boundless interest in the sounds of the flute. Even now, as he observed my hands, his hands were vaguely moving too. No doubt that he is practicing in his head right now. Occasionally, he would secretly ask me to teach him the flute. He was an excellent disciple that spared no effort. Yu Chan can play it like that too, huh? No, it is more like he was originally better at playing these calm compositions. Ku Oka As nodded while Rudel San went into his analytical mode without a moment's delay. That I was good at classical music, I could somewhat agree. In my previous existence, I had endlessly played them in musical performances. They were music from the sheets to allow me to win awards at contests. I had never imagined in those days that this music would. After I had been reincarnated, for the sake of letting others listen to it, etch on a melody that describes the current state of my heart, I never expected the day when I would play this music so naturally, so much so that I would say that this is exactly my rock. However, it is so miraculous. Despite having no lessons in it, that she can play it so well. True. Basically, only spirit users can play musical instruments without practice. It seems that in this world, playing music with an instrument is not common. There is a strong connotation of it to rituals that spirit users conduct to execute large-scale magic and that it has been sanctified too, so it was not something the average person would lay his hands on. Ultimately, on that day, Boss continued to be serious throughout while the curtains on Yu Chan's classical concert closed. The reason for Boss being tensed up after having decided the meeting with Bashu San was something that I could vaguely guess at since I have been with him for the past one year. It might be something that Boss is trying to do or what he wants to say to Bashu San. I pretended not to notice anything and continued with my childlike innocence. Loading Bandit Arc 12 The meeting with Bashu San. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Finally, it was only a day before we meet Bashu San. This time, it was not just Boss that was feeling all fidgety, but the rest of the bandit gang too. It was more like they were up on the edges in fact. Right now, Ku Oka Arsen and Boss have already readied themselves, wrapped themselves up in thin blankets and pretending to sleep. I want to sleep, but somehow they cannot sleep. That is because, everyone is too anxious. However, it was nearly the time for children to sleep, so I had to pretend to sleep. I no longer have to be worried about being sold. Hence, recently I could cast delusions, without any worries. On what kind of person might Bashu San be while sleeping? He is not only Boss's friend, he is only an Earl, so he must be someone with a peculiarity or two, I feel. I get the feeling that he was probably a person with tons of facial hair and chest hair. And then, plucking his chest hair would be too lonely and so the hair on his head would fall too. I am praying for the roots of his hair to be healthy. It was meaninglessly to continue my wild delusions so I was about to sleep when I felt something rugged and stiff patting on my head. It was Boss's hand. Somehow, once in a while, when Boss had thought I had fallen asleep, he would pat on my head slowly, with difficulty. It is likely that if I were to open my eyes up now, 
the bashful boss would embarrassingly withdraw his hand immediately. Foo foo. Therefore, I would go on with pretending to sleep, and enjoy bosses there, there to the max. I must be overly fond of being patted on the head so, I almost wanted to tear up due to the profound emotions seeping out of me but I would be found out if I started crying like that so I tried my fullest to hold them back. He he, it is all thanks to him I cannot stop pretending to sleep. Hey, Alec, won't you reconsider? While enjoying the patting. I could hear the Kuoka Arsons whisper in the quiet tent. Right at Kuoka Arsons words, boss stopped patting me. Oh if, what's with this all of a sudden? What you are trying to do is reckless. Why don't we take a look first? Ha! Huh? What are you saying at this point? I knew from the start that this was reckless. Still, I have to do this for a certain someone. You should very well know that we can't turn back now. This is bad. Is this a couple's squabble? What now? I wonder if I should be awoken by their voice. Maybe it would better to laugh embarrassingly and interrupt them after they have changed the topic. Then, what about you Chan? What if something dire happens to us? Would this child get involved in it? No way. My name came into the topic. Now all the more I cannot wake up. Furthermore, this gives off some turbulent vibes. This kid, came with us because she likes us. She shouldn't have any complaints. Come on. Alec, at the very least, wait till this child grows up, please, this much should be okay right? Even for Alec, you dote on her yes? All right, keep it down, no matter what, Bash is the priority, anything other than thing, I would not acknowledge it, as boss said that, he removed his hand that was on my head. I turned over in my bed and brushed along the blanket, probably, if I were to wake up now. Boss and Kuoka Arson would lie down and face their backs at me from the opposite side. I could hear Kuoka Arson's tiny sigh. I could guess that Boss and Gang were attempting to start a peasant's revolt or some revolutions of sorts. Sometimes, I would hear talk about weapons, mineral mines, mages, and gathering the support and unity of farmers. I do not really understand the workings of the world, but I still know that doing so is reckless. Still, it does not matter either way, Kuoka Arsen, do not worry too much about it, it is alright, if I was told to offer my help to the boss, it is not like I would be hesitant to lend my assistance, being family is just like that I believe, I still hardly know much about family though, the meeting between Bashu San and boss started, the representatives facing us was a spirit user and Bashu San, our representatives were boss and Kuoka Arsen, a two-on-two -two dialogue. Well, even though this might be a dialogue, they were actually talking while standing in the mountains surrounded by trees and greenery. If there were too many people, it might feel too overwhelming for both sides so the two-on-two -two mode was decided upon. Still, after being told that it was not like we all had to be around to convince Bashu San to have an intention to join us, or more like just join us, so we were situated someplace just a little far away where we stand by while observing the four of them. To allow me to have better view, Gay Isan gave me a lift on his shoulders. Gay Isan was a roughly two meters tall and big guy so the view on his shoulders were wide. Speaking of which, the spirit user who tagged along with Bashu San looked somewhat familiar. We were looking from afar so I cannot really be sure but, from that red hair, could it be that spirit user who visited Garagari village the last time? Even Kawamayu Anaki said that the spirit user was from the Yamato region. Not going to keep it a secret anymore. Garagari village is actually one of Yamato's pioneering settlements. Still, it is an indescribably far out place in Yamato though. For the time being, Bashu San doesn't look a very hairy person. I'm kind of disappointed. This is despite me imagining every night recently that Bashu San was a hairy person, and that he laughs like this, foo foo fo, laughing with his white hair, foo foo fo. Even though that was my Bashu San, he was in reality a man with light brown hair and has a camp look without any normal facial hair. The discussion proceeded without a hitch and started off with a mood like, yo, long time no see dash and they embraced one another as a form of greeting. Kuoka Arsen looked like she was extremely happy to see her old friend and her little brother, to the extent that she wiggled more than usual. However, I wonder how the little brother thinks of his elder brother becoming an Ani, or what he thinks of her wiggling, from afar. 
I could not peek into his mental space. Boss smiled with his menacing face, and pointed far out to our direction. He was probably trying to say that his other men were in that direction, and would it be all right to bring them here? Bashusan nodded his head, giving his assent. And then, I thought he would fling his hand overhead to gesture us to all get there now but boss looks strange. He looked at his feet and panicked. Kuoka asked too. Or more like all four of them looked down and got into a fluster. Don't they look strange? Rudelsa nodded. And then, Boss lowered himself down to his waist and pulled out his sword. He drew his sword, at the same time as Kawamayu Anaki's surprised voice. We rushed towards their direction. While on Gai San's shoulders, I grabbed onto his head as hard as possible so as to not fall over and continued to observe Boss. Something must have had happened, it did not look like a normal situation. He was looking down and then he became agitated. What? Something is fixed onto their feet? Ice? Boss had noticed that we came to their side and he shouted, Stop, don't come here. With that shout of his, we could all tell that it was not something ordinary. How could we stop then? As I was thinking, the sword that Boss was holding onto, crumbled away into sand. That was something I have had seen before. Crumbling and disappearing away into sand. That was when Alan or Irene San wanted to redo their failed swords or armor. It was magic to undo a magician's work. Be careful. There is a mage nearby. Loading. Bandit Arc 13 Magician vs Young Bandit Girl. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryurikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. A magician is here. When I shouted that. It was already too late. Gai San seemed to be pulled by something, and suddenly he lost his balance and fell forward. Due to him falling, I was thrown off, and landed on a tree branch. I was caught like a circus performer landing on a trapeze, and spun around with a whirl, before I started clawing back up on the tree. I was like Tarzan. Good thing I lived in the mountains for some time. Staring down, I saw that Gai San. Kawimayu Anaki and Rudelsan had all fallen to their knees and collapsed. There was ice from the ground connected all the way to their knees. When Kawimayu Anaki noticed that I was alright because I managed to climb to the safety of the tree, he took out his god-killing dagger from his pockets and threw it to me. Throwing it in order to pass it to me is fine but that was too fast. If it was anybody else, it would not have been caught. As such thoughts occupied my head. I held on to the dagger that I had somehow caught onto safely and took a look at my leather waist pouch to confirm that my DIY red pepper bomb was still intact. Great, it did not tear. One of the secret tools when used in a wild boar hunt. Red pepper, Japanese pepper and ashes were grounded into fine powder and then placed inside a small cylinder that was made by heating clay. The cylinder is then covered with a lid when thrown at wild boars. The powder would scatter and disperse, causing the wild boars to be unable to perceive with their eyes and smell with their noses. When they try to escape, all they would do is to crash into trees and die like that. It was a deadly hunting weapon. Even on humans, it can be effective. Thanks to Kawamayu Anaki's sacred sacrifice, its effectiveness had been demonstrated. If I see the mage, I would throw this at him. As I thought. I looked around but the surrounding trees were in the way, and a vision was poor. Walking from tree to tree, I moved towards where boss and the rest were. This is, Ryuki isn't it? What is the meaning of this? The shout came from the red-haired spirit user. That is what I want to ask of you instead, father. I had noticed that you had been acting all strange the past few days. Why are you having a secret meeting with these evil-looking people? Immediately. A young man's voice emerged from some distance away from where Boss and the rest were. A. Eh? From that far out, he was still able to use magic? Isn't this range too wide? Mages are really scary. Speaking of which, he said Ryuki, if my memory serves me right, that was the mage who visited Garigari village. He was handsome so I remembered him. A pretty youth with light blonde long hair. In addition, the red hair spirit user was indeed the spirit user from back then. If I was correct, his name was Seki San. He did call him father, so these two were actually father and son. While thinking, I continued advancing through the trees to get into a range where I could fling the pepper bombs. 
It seems that he has no idea that I had climb onto the tree and that I going to help them. It was because I was quite far away. Oi. Don't judge a person simply by his face, you little boss's savage like voice could be heard. However, boss, aren't bandits bad people? Ah, but we had been pretty obedient lately so I guess that is fine. Just barely across that line of being bad I guess. From that fiendish face of his. He has similar characteristics to Alexander, the ideologist. Even if he is able to trick Bashu Sama and father, he won't be able to trick me. I will hear what you all have to say after I have captured him. Ryuki, calm down. It's all good so release your ice magic. No, father and Bashu Sama must have been cheated. You all must be trying to overlook this guy. Looks like words can't reach you. That being said, Seki-san the spirit user tried to chant his magic, but at that time, from the shadows of the trees, a knight-like person appeared and wedged a cloth into his mouth to seal his voice. And then, another knight, while saying sorry Seki-sama, used his hand to restrain Seki-san from his back. Wah! What is the meaning of this? As he shouted, more knight-like people appeared to restrain Bashu-san in a similar fashion. Sorry. We are under instructions from Ryuki-sama. They seem to have said and then brought their arms to their back and restrained them. Please be quiet. Bashu-sama and father, I will capture them. I will hear what you have to say later. After saying that, he gave a signal to the knights. The knight-like people tied boss and the rest with rope. The rubbing of metals created jarring gasha. Gasha noises. This is very bad. This is really really bad. This is very bad. As I realized how nasty the circumstances have gotten, I made some haiku in my mind to calm myself. Ryuki-san has entered my range of the pepper bombs though. By throwing this at him, I would be able to seal his incantations. Yay. Though I feel this can be so easily resolved though. First of all, since I have to get rid of the magic that is binding boss and the rest's feet, smashing Ryuki's throat is out of question. Furthermore, I have to get the knights to retreat or else. All right, I shall proceed with the hostage plan. I climbed from tree to tree, getting to a spot directly above arch enemy Ryuki, held onto the god killing dagger from Kawamayu Aniki and dropped. I was aiming to drop on his shoulder. A lovely tossoon sound was made as I straddled on his shoulder. The sudden weight on his shoulder affected his balance out and he fell forward. Hey, from the looks of it, doesn't that make me heavy? How rude. In order not to get flung out. I gripped onto him. Ryuki pushed his hand onto the ground and was about to adjust his position when I placed the dagger on his throat. If you value your life, free boss and the rest. You are. Don't say anything unnecessary. I'm ordering you to undo the ropes on boss. However, even without Ryuki commanding the knights, they had already realized the tables have turned and obediently removed the restraints on boss and the rest. Oh. A good decision by the knights. It is because mages are their gods. Very well. Ah. Those two are okay. That is what he said to the knights that were restraining Bashu-san and Seki-san. Those two are bad though. It would have been better for them to still be tied up. I still cannot trust them yet. After releasing boss, I had the knights stand back and line themselves with their hands up. Cancel the freezing magic. Even though the knights had removed the ropes on boss and the rest. The ice was still there and they were still unable to move. I tried my best to sound as scary as possible while ordering Ryuki. Nevertheless, my cute voice did not command that kind of authority with it. There is no helping with my cuteness. Fufafu, Ryuki seemingly laughed in a ridiculing manner and accepted my request at the same time. That was definitely the incantation to cancel magic. It was the same incantation that Irene San and Alan said when they were cancelling their magic. Yet, the shackles of ice did not disappear at all. Besides being shocked myself, Ryuki the mage was shocked too. However, Ryuki was looking at the dagger I was holding instead of what I was looking at. Ah so that was what happened. It is because this is a god killing dagger. You can make it disappear with magic. Stop with your little tricks. Remove your magic now. That was why he was able to smirk earlier. In the face of the god-killing dagger, Ryuki turned slightly pale. Really, just release your magic already. Even for me, I don't like pointing weapons at others. Don't think that just because I am a child, I wouldn't stab you. 
I use this every day just so that you know. Yes, mainly on wild boars. I am always using it on my arch enemy wild boars, I kid you not. And then, Ryuki appeared to have made up his mind and chanted another incantation. Hearing the start of the incantation. I quickly jumped off Ryuki's back while grabbing his hair and greeted his face with a kick from my knee. Hey, stop trying to be funny. That's not the incantation to dispel magic. I shouted at the Ryuki who was now bleeding from his nose and who became greatly frightened. The one that should be surprised is me. Why is it you? He grimaced and looked at me with a face that says, even my old man wouldn't beat me like this. Even for me. This is my first time kicking someone with my knees, I was really astonished, that was because I knew that I had to quickly stop the magic from activating, so my legs moved on reflex, my knees are still shaking in pain too, I think I should demand medical fees too, you dot dot can understand the incantations, rather than understanding, it was more like your incantation was obviously different from the previous one, how did it not occur to you that I would be able to discern the difference? I'm telling you, undo your magic now. There won't be a next time. Throwing away all traces of an adorable young girl, with a threatening low pitch voice. I pointed the dagger at him. With that, Ryuki finally gave in and chanted the dispelling incantation. The ice trapping boss and the rest disappeared. Loading. Banded arc 14 to think that we would meet here. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Boss and the gang were released and this time around, the knights and Ryuki the idiot were the ones restrained in rope. Of course we did not forget to gag Ryuki the idiot. Based on boss's decision, we released Seki-san and Bashu-san too. Ryuki, you bastard. What is this about causing harm to Bashu-sama? He is an El sana you know. Mew Mew. Towards Seki-san's words, Ryuki seemed to be trying to rebut him. Now that was gagged. There was no way to tell what he was trying to say. Seki, no matter what, wasn't calling me that terrible of you? And to think that the person behind it all was you Ryuki-kun. Bringing all these knights along, what happened to Tigasaku-sama? He had better not be alone. This time. It was Bashu-san who was talking to Ryuki the idiot but again, since all he could do was mew mew, and just like a resident of Valley, there was no reply. The knight next to him who was also tied up spoke up in an apologetic manner, with all due respect, we had believed that we were going somewhere near, we were requested to conceal ourselves nearby, most likely, that place would be, as he said. His eyes flickered to one side to show roughly where that place was. As soon as Kawamayu Aniki entered that place, which was a grove of trees, he came back with a person who wore a hood over his eyes. That person was acting very hesitantly. Ta Tigasaku sama, my humblest apologies. I have caused you to be shaken, Kawamayu. Treat him with more courtesy. He is the great Tigasaku sama. Boss took custody of the hooded man from Kawimayu who brought the hooded man as though he was grabbing a cat by its head. Who exactly is this Tukasaku? This gentleman is the advisor for our territory's agricultural reforms. Ha! Huh. So it is this hooded man ha! Huh. Anyways Bashu, aren't these knights the knights at your place? They betrayed you. Bashu-san was a bit down upon hearing that. Boss, please don't say any more please. Please don't cause him heart to hollow out. To fill in the gap from Bashu-san's silence, the panicking restrained knights started to vindicate themselves. W we have not betrayed you. Ryuki-sama said that Bashu-sama had been acting very strangely and we heard that you were being deceived by a demonic beast so, we came to see it for ourselves. It was certainly not that we have been swayed by Ryuki-sama's promise to reward us with newly made swords and armor if we cooperated. I see, so you guys had been bribed. What an honest chap he was. Ha, huh? it cannot be helped. Ryuki-kun would eventually be wedded to his daughter and be the next earl. Furthermore, he was a mage that they were convinced to help him could not be helped. Bashu-san's shoulders dropped as he muttered to himself. Being unable to endure staying in this place any one bit, nobody said anything. It was just the echo from the cries of the valley. Mew, Mew, Dot. Ryuki is Seki's son, so he is the child you had with Agnes? He really resembles Agnes. 
the royal blood in him runs deep. Rudel San spoke to Sehi San as he closely looked at the mewing idiot. Ah, he has the makings of a magician. PFF, well, he would be my nephew Chan then, a somewhat handsome youth. Even his nose bleeding posture looks cute, to the Kuoka Asan who seemed like she was salivating. The idiot who had been mewing up until now immediately became silent. A direct hit, as expected of Kuoka Asan. Nonetheless, despite being excellent as a mage, he was still no match for you. Boss praised me painstakingly with an extremely pleased voice and carried me to his arms. And I repeat myself, he carried me to his arms. You fu fu. Our daughter seemed to be more talented it seems Tilda. But my heart was on my mouth the entire time though. Kuoka Asan responded delightfully, a child has got to be at least that lively yeah, I'm so glad. I thought that they might be angry at me for kneeing him but he actually praised me for being that full of energy, boss. Dn, kind of need help for the underlined part. R, elder brother, you finally had a child with a Lexan? Sehi San commented and turned slightly pale. Boss immediately sent a sharp glare at him and threatened him to stop trolling. Ah. I guess that's actually impossible. My apologies Alex San. Could you come here for a moment? Sehi San said and moved away from us and started whispering. Since I was carried along, I could hear his whispers clearly. I am sorry to have allowed my son to get wind of this. Despite what he has done earlier, he is actually an obedient child. It is just that his thinking leans completely to the royalty and that he is surprisingly quick-witted. I am not very confident of this but it seems that he is very suspicious of Alex San's motives. Where on earth he got his information from though dot dot I'm sorry but I think it is best we keep quiet on those motives now. I get the gist of it. If you are planning to do so, don't call out my name in front of your son. Didn't you just call me by Alex just then? I see. You're right. My apologies. Well, what's done is done. Anyways, we would be leaving soon. But before that, I have to have a word with Bashu. Sorry but I would be borrowing Bashu for a moment. Am I not included? I was planning to have an understanding of what Alexan's plans were. But you are a mage. Your son too. I'm sure you don't have that resolve to wager your life for this don't you? Sehi-san could only lower his eyes and stay silent. I got it. In any case, we need to keep a lookout on my son. That leaves me with that job. I shall relay what I want to say to Bashu San too. I feel bad that we have to talk while standing but I want to privately ask Bashu San something too. Ah, I understand. Boss nodded to what Seki San said and both of them returned back to their gang. I was lowered back onto the ground. Oh, is carrying time already over? Bashu San was inquiring if Tigasaku Professor was doing fine when Boss placed his hand on his shoulder and discreetly told him, Bashu. Sorry for the inconvenience but it's about the situation. I want you to come alone. Somewhere far away. I wish to have another talk with you. I was doing nothing in particular and just stared at the hooded man that was adjacent to Bashu San. Our eyes met. As soon as that happened, the hooded man opened his eyes wide in shock. Similarly, I was shocked at him being shocked. Eh? What is it? The hooded man vigorously removed his hood and with a smile wide across his face he shouted. Could this be you? My bad. I mean is this you Sama? Eh? Who? I'm you but who are you? I observed closely and scanned through my memories for him. And his name was Tigasaku Professor too. One of his most defining features was his aquiline nose. And next is. Well. I feel like I have seen him before. No. I have definitely seen him before. I remember that handsome face. Even though it is not within my acceptable range. Pardon me for that. He was around the latter half of his twenties and he had youthful skin but he was already balding. A balding head. That. Where have I seen that? Ah. I got it. Garagari village chief. Dot son. The eldest son of the village chief, whose trademark was his balding scalp, nodded as he beamed. Loading. Bandit Arc 15 Garagari village of today. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Ooh, the village chief's son, how nostalgic, wasn't he the honor student that attended the villager meeting, 
that I launched to discuss the future of the village. Nearly all the time, back then, it was a meeting to gather volunteers to talk about improving the cultivar of crops, or about my investigations on fertilizer, basically a discussion platform with the goal of increasing crop yield. I see, his name was actually Tigasaku, I have always called him as chief's son. I see, Tigasaku, looks like you've made yourself a good name in cultivating fields huh? Ah, I had thought that you looked familiar, so you were that child from that time? Sehi-san nodded as seemed to have connected the dots. Ah, so you have finally remembered? Thanks for the care from then. Much thanks for specially telling me that I was not a mage. Ah, it can't be. To think that I would be able to meet Ryusamu at a place like this. Professor Tigasaka cried out with increased enthusiasm. Yes, indeed. I believed we would never cross paths again. It's been a long time. I am happy that we were able to meet after so long. I would really like to hear how he ended up here or maybe about how Garigari village was doing. However, there is something I cannot comprehend. Something about Professor Tigasaka reaction. For starters, Back then, he never did attach Sama when referring to me. Eh, this child is the divine messenger from the heavens that Professor Tigasaku was always talking about. You are Usama? Bashu san joined in the conversation with the same mood as Professor Tigasaku. Wait a second, you called me a divine messenger? Maybe I heard that wrong. It must be the fatigue from the Versus Mage episode earlier. I must be hearing things. Yes, she is the savior of Garagari village, a divine messenger from the heavens. Immediately, as soon as Tigasaku said it out loud, louder than I had imagined, the captured knights started a commotion. The Mew, Mew, resident of the valley that had been silenced by Kuokaas not long ago, started to Mew, Mew, excitedly again. Tn. I found out that resident of the valley is a reference to Moomin. Look at this video to get a better idea of it. https colon slash slash uta dot b slash 8 mh 2 do one lvw You mean she is the person who said at birth, north, south, east, west, nothing in the world is more sacred than me, that Rusama? Said one of the knights in an uproar. Don't say such things about me. Hey, why are you smiling and nodding your head off, Professor Tukasaku? I said no such thing. Furthermore, it's not like you were present when I was born. Yes, not only was Yusama born from the bud of a flower, us villagers at Garagari village cried uncontrollably when she was born too. Born from the bud of a flower? And that I caused everyone to cry. Are you trying to say that I am the pollen of flowers? I have no intention to cause nasty allergic reactions to everyone. And in the one year that she was born, she gave the people food to eat and invented straw sandals. Oi, how could a one-year-old do that? Dot dot ah, I actually did that. That was me. But anyways, just stop, saying all those is so scary. You um, what are you talking about from just now? We were talking about Rusama. It doesn't sound right though. Ha ha, you don't have to be so humble. I understand everything. No you don't. I spoke just because of you spouting all that you know. Are these guys even sane? There is no way a human could be born from a flower. Boss said in a muffled voice low enough to be inaudible to the ruby fallen camp. Hearing that, I regained my composure. Thank goodness. I knew the weird one was Professor Tukasaku. He lost his rationality together with his falling hair. My sympathies. I managed to calm down after looking at some of the bandits who reacted normally. I will just forget what Tigasaku just said. Um, boss, this Tigasaku-san is the son of the village chief from where I was born and raised. Somehow, he is saying all sorts of things that even I don't know, so please pay him no attention. I explained the circumstances to boss as coolly as I could. Boss glanced at the boisterous knights and said, ah, while nodding. By the way. Tigasaku-san, how is Garagari village now? Why are you here as well, Tigasaku-san? Tigasaku-san was still blabbering away to the knights with his fictitious story but I asked him anyways. The people at Garagari village are cultivating the fields with the wisdom we have received from Usama. Later, Bash Usama came after hearing about the rumors of your knowledge in agriculture and invited me to assist him to represent and spread Usama's teachings. Currently at Garagari village, 
the meeting to heighten Rusama teachings that Rusama began to discuss fertilizer or improving the cultivar of crops, is undergoing and continuing. Oh, somehow, Garagari villagers have become awesome after all these years. However, there is one point that I have to clarify, and that would be that I inaugurated the villager meeting but definitely not the meeting to heighten Yasama's teachings. Ha, so everyone is working at the villager meeting. Great. Also, incidentally, how is my family doing? To ask or not to ask? I lost my control a wee bit. Nevertheless, I was truly concerned. Ah, the family that took care of Yusama ha. Quite some time has passed since I left the village but I will just tell you about their situation before I left then. Sabrukan, Marukan and Shakan are mainly maintaining the fields. Especially Marukan, he is quite the tenacious worker and is quite well liked in the village. It is just that your parents and their eldest son, Hajamshi, are basically lazy bones. They are very annoying. Well, they are the ones that did not join the meeting to heighten Yasama's teachings in the first place. The people who did participate grieved when we heard you left. However, no matter how flawed they were, we could not strongly condemn them since they were part of Yusama's family. Selling of children was a really common thing too. I beg for your forgiveness. R. There is nothing you need to apologize for, it is all right, as long as everyone is doing fine. Then it is good. Still. You did not mention Jiruanijin? As soon as I spoke of Jiruanijin, Tigasakushi groaned and frowned. Ah. He was. As soon as Yusama left, he went off somewhere else too. It was said that he most likely went off in pursuit of Yusama. I suppose you two have yet to meet. A. Eh? Seriously. I have not seen him. Jiruanijin, you seriously went after me? I wonder how he is doing. Don't tell me. He died a dog's death by the roadside. R. However, it was true that when I was at the rainforest residence, there were rumors circulating that there was a masked man searching for me. Though. Could that masked man be Jiruanijin? No. Wait. If he was Jiruanijin, why would he conceal his face with a mask? Usama, please do not be disheartened. He should already be an adult. It will be fine. Tigasaku-san tried to comfort me as he noticed that I'd gone silent suddenly. I see, indeed. Jiruanijin should be 15 years old back then and would have been considered an adult by this world's standards. He was a person of few words but at a lot so he had a sturdy build. I suppose he should be fine. That is what I want to believe. As I was still shaking from the impact of the facts surrounding Jiruanijin. One of the knights said, I see. So this secret meeting that Bashu Sama is having was conducted so that he can be bestowed the advice of the divine messenger. The other knights went into uproar as they shared their newfound revelation. A, eh, this atmosphere is getting too scary. Even though I am still thinking about Jiruanijin. Is that the case? The knights sent a gaze that seemed to ask this question. Next, Bashu San extended his one hand to me in a dignified way. Ahem. Well, that is right, excuse me, but now we will be having our sacred, clandestine meeting. It is absolutely rude for this many of us to be here so only I will be asking for advice. Please wait quietly everyone. Bashu-san said eloquently. Loading. Bandit Arc 16 I thought waiting obediently was good enough. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. In order to have their own private meeting, Boss and Bashu-san moved to a place where they the captured knights cannot hear them. Sehi-san the spirit user also requested the wind spirits to temporarily prevent sounds from escaping too. Wind spirits are really convenient. In the end. Bashu-san alone entered a dialogue with all the members of the bandits. Alec, sorry, I never imagined that it would so rowdy. Don't give me that. You are always so careless all the time. Ha ha ha, give me a break, that was too much. By the way, why are you together with the Divine Messenger Sama? By Divine Messenger, you mean you? Did you actually take that baldy's words seriously? There is no way she was born from a flower. Ha ha ha. I don't believe him to that extent. It's just that. Professor Tigasaku was so passionately in his speech that a portion of the knights and Ryuki Kun idolizes him. You. How scary. In addition, Bashu-san smiled as cheerfully as ever. He is a totally different type compared to boss. He looks a good person. 
idolizing. Well, it was true it felt that way. We kidnapped you from the rainforest merchant Earl. Now she is living together with us. You kidnapped her? And from a merchant Earl no less. Isn't that a semi-aristocratic peerage? Don't fret. She was going to be made the bride of that Lycan man too. Well, anyways, we abducted her. Anyways you say ha. Huh? Bashu san sighed greatly upon hearing how far boss went. Good grief, Alec is really crazy. Whatever. That's fine. Thanks to that, I get to meet the divine messenger. And in this way, I am also able to peacefully have a discussion too. Bashu said this and that about needing the advice of a god and smiled lightly while also greeting the other bandits. Long time no see, before springing back into a light-hearted conversation. Just when I thought this would just be an ordinary class reunion, boss dropped a bomb. So, how are the preparations going? I managed to negotiate with the guys at the mines. It's quiet on the aristocrats' side and as a result, they are able to sell some to us through a back channel. Also, there are several villages with people that seem to wish to help us. Shortly after, Bashu San's cheerful expression became distorted and an apologetic aura drifted about. I see. That is, Alec, my apologies but the matter that you have spoken to me about would have to take more time. R? What happened? Don't raise your volume. Your shouts are terrifying. I'm sure you know but, now that we have Professor Tigasaku lending his aid, the productivity of the agricultural sector has gone up, the suffering and hunger of the people might end very soon. I wish to continue observing how it goes. You want to continue watching. Are you for real? Observing uphill now. Has anything good happened? Even if the agricultural industry is advancing smoothly, the monarchy would continue. Education will still be restricted, our freedom denied and our ideologies contained. Didn't you say that last time? That we might as well be livestock. We are not just any livestock or pets. We are humans aren't we? Boss shouted at Bashu San as though there was a parental feud between them. Bashu San stuck out both his hand and tried to still his anger and calm him down. I know, I know. I understand your feelings. It's just that this feels too impulsive. I do not deny that I have no confidence in this monarchy that discards people it deems as surplus to the pioneering settlements and so I had once thought that we have no other alternative but to do this. However. The situation has changed slightly. I am now a territorial lord. I have to prioritize the people in my fief ahead of everything else. There is no way I can endanger the people when there are perhaps other paths left for survival. Just earlier, Bashu San had been intimidated by bosses shouting, but he still took on a heavy posture like an obstinate father. From how I see it, any other arguments at this point would be useless. Ha! Boss gave a deep sigh and became silent. The other bandits wore a marveled expression. Even breathing became difficult. I can understand your thoughts. You observing how it goes is fine. We would just continue with our plans. It might take more time but dot dot we will definitely do it. Towards boss's determination, Bashu San looked down and responded with, I see. And then, he nodded gently while saying, sorry. Bashu dot dot if you feel bad about it, there is one thing I like to ask of you. As boss said, he placed his hand on my head. Bashu San rose his head up again and met my eyes. I would like you to take the trouble to take care of this. I want her to go to school. Eh, that, that means, in short, that I would be entrusted to Bashu San. Alec, what are you saying? Ku Oka Asan entered the conversation without a moment's delay. I agree, what are you saying, boss? What is it, Kuki? Didn't you say it too? That you want this kid to go to school too. Also, you said you don't want her to get involved. That is dot dot true. But, Ku Oka Arsene and Boss took alternate glances at me. I was taken aback and rendered speechless. If it is Bashu, then I can have a peace of mind. Even for Bashu, won't it be his honor to take care of a divine messenger? R. Well, personally, I feel grateful about it dot dot but is it alright? Bashu San said while bringing his line of sight to the other banded members who have started to become noisy. Boss, are you serious? You is dot dot already one of us. Kawimayu Anaki was also dazed. Yeah that's right, do reconsider, boss. That way is better for her. She is an awesome fella. Didn't you see that earlier for yourself? 
she was able to compete with a mage. Furthermore, rather than being with us retards from now on, she would be better off with more decent people. Boss looked like he had ironed his resolve. Nevertheless, I am against it. Could you not arbitrarily decide that for me? What do you mean by more decent people? Boss and the gang is more decent than the rest. I don't want to be alone again. Please don't leave me behind. Don't go away. I don't want to be abandoned by anyone else. You is fine with that too right? Boss asked me like that. There is no way I am fine with that. Obviously I am against it. But if I said that, would he be shocked? Would I be hated? In addition, even if I am hated, and my opinion of it might not be heard either, and then I would be, again, while lost in thoughts, I had unknowingly faced downwards. Boss assumed that I looked downwards to nod and continued talking. That's how it is, please take care of her. I don't want to stay here for too long, since I am done talking to bash you. We can leave now. Boss was about to walk away while facing his back at me. The rest of the bandits gazed at me while following behind Boss. Kuo Kaasan looked at me intermittently while walking to Boss. It was the same again. It was the same as when my parents sold me at Garagari village. I could feel my consciousness drifting far away again. Is this reality? Just not long ago, I defeated a mage and didn't you declare that I was the daughter of you all? How many more times do I have to go through this? Once at Garagari village. In my previous life, tens of thousands of times. In my previous life, when I see the back of my parents who leave the house either for the sake of work or meeting up with their lovers, I would tell them, take care, see you. I would wave my hands, even though I do not know when they would be back. If I worked hard, I believed that their backs would turn back one day. I was always being a good kid, waiting for them to turn back once I became acknowledged by everyone. If I do according to what boss says and go to school, even if I obtain stellar grades, I wonder when would Ku Oka Arsene turn back, what about boss, would he turn to look back at me, I don't want this, I don't want to be separated from them like this, Ku Oka Arsene, please be aware of my feelings, boss, please look at me, I hate it, but, I could not say a word, I mean, if I said something that selfish, if I became hated, I would be, I, but, would I be left behind again, what should I do, please tell me, someone, anyone, I don't want that, I want to be together, didn't you say I was your daughter, you said it all with pride didn't you, you liar, liar, I want to go with everyone, from somewhere, a sloppy voice overflowed and shouted as a proxy for my feelings, who was that, I thought and everyone stared at me, boss and Kuoka Arsen stopped and turned to look at me, everyone was staring at me excessively so I felt my own face, it was sticky with mucus and tears, the voice earlier was mine, a voice that I did not think would emerge, soon, it became embarrassing, being childish like this, I wondered if everyone would hate me as I looked downwards, I had it, suddenly, I was hugged by someone with a crazy strong force, a force welled up with emotions, I lifted my face and saw Kuoka Arsene, sorry, Yu Chan, sorry, she cried as she apologized, and then, her line of sight moved to boss, sighed, Alec, forgive me, but I am out of this, I want to be with Yu Chan, Yu Chan getting involved in this would be my fault, Kuki, I can understand your feelings but dot dot you getting involved would be my fault, I willfully kidnapped her, and willfully invested emotions too, wrong, Ku Oka Arsen shouted at boss like that, and continued, for the child loving Alec to have feelings for Yu Chan is understandable, you knew that, that's why you handed her to me then, I was in disagreement when you tried to do that, I cannot believe that you would go to your death for your ideals, I am still willing to put down my life for Alec but I am definitely will not approve of you dying for a dream that may or may not be realized, therefore, if there were things you had to protect, I wondered if you would change your mindset, however, for the half-baked woman me, I was not enough to be something that Alec had to protect, nevertheless, and that's why, I hate other women that might stick onto Alec, at that time, Yu Chan came, if by any chance, if this child was around, Alec mindset might change, therefore, with this baseless idea dot dot I was the one who got Yu Chan involved, Kuki, boss muttered her name and froze with silence, 
I glanced at Kuoka Asen who was crying in tears as she complained to boss. Soon after, Kuoka Asen looked at me instead. New Chan, I am sorry. I am sorry for being such an underhanded adult. But, right now, my feelings for you, that you are important, is the real deal. If you could forgive this kind of selfish male woman, I want to continue being together with you as your mother. I said nothing but just nodded repeatedly and hugged Kuoka Asen so that she would not go anywhere, to confirm that the Kuoka Asen that returned was not just some hallucination. Kuoka Asen came back to me. She turned around, and came back for me. Call this an excuse or whatever is fine. Even for me, at the start, I did not think of Kuoka Asen as anything special. Right now. Kuoka Asen treats me as her daughter and wants to be together with me, and that I am fine just like that. She came back to me because of those words I said, just with those. Why have I been, up until now, been an obedient child and simply waited? That's right, I should have said so right from the start. I had been pretending and was afraid that I would be disliked. Until now, I have yet to say about my feelings. Right from the start, I had said honestly and plainly that I was lonely and I want to stay with them more, that would have been better. I am as a female a blockhead, also as your comrades. I am a blockhead, but as the parent of this child, I would no longer do half-assed things. I am breaking out from our gang. Kuoka Arson stood up while carrying on to me and said with a firm attitude to boss. Loading. Bandit Arc 17 Somehow I have become interested in it. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. After bidding boss and the rest goodbye, it was decided that I could join Kuoka Arsen and Bashu-san. Before we separated, boss placed his hand on my head and stroked it. I asked if we would meet again and he replied, Of course, we live on the very same earth, if we wanted to meet. We could do that any time. Kawimayu Aniki told me, it was a feast for the eyes to see you take on the mage, and gave me his god-killing dagger. Honestly, I could not accept something this incredible but he said he would forge a new one and forced it back to me. Gai-san only said, you Yusu, and sniffled. I too responded in the same way, sniffling as I nodded. Rudel-san brought out the flute that I had given him and asked, I can't seem to be able to bring out the higher sounds. These are basically the same old things he would ask me, so I once again, I showed him the way to hold and press the flute. A, hey, won't you play one more? I considered for a second but that would it would feel too much like a last song so I kept silent. Also, Kuoka Asen explained briefly to Rudel-san and Kawimaya-san on distinguishing between the different types of medicine and the usage of medicine that was left in the camp. And finally, since they had work to do, boss and the rest left in a hurry. Their departure felt almost too natural, and was freshly imprinted in my mind that I had the feeling we would meet one another as per normal tomorrow. I am not sure if it was the loneliness of boss farewell or the joy I felt because Kuoka Asna was staying with me, or it was the mix of both, that there was a surge in emotion in me. I sobbed and wept like a monster, my memories were hazy after that. All I remember is that I cried even more after that. When I regained my lucidity, I found myself on a coach with Kuoka Arsen and Bashu-san. The plans from now on would be to first have an agrarian reform provincial tour. And once that is done, I would become an adopted daughter of Ruby Fallen. I would live in the capital and take the school entrance examinations. While waiting for the results to be released, I would be studying etiquette and taking part in the matriculation programs. I would be living in the dormitories, whereas Kuoka Arsen would live nearby, in the capital and look for a job in the capital too. It was okay to leave the dormitory as long as approval is obtained so I should be able to meet with Kuoka Arsen during holidays or after classes. After one night passed since the parting, I calmed down. My eyes hurt from the swelling after from the non-stop crying yesterday. I had spent nearly all my time crying yesterday. While we were on Bashu-san's coach, I was crying. Tigasaku looked at the me who was crying uncontrollably and said, Ah, Yusama is grieving for this world. She is embracing all the sadness of this world. His interpretation caused the knights, who are the devotees of the Tagasaku cult, to react by praying to me. At long last, 
My tears dried up, however, honestly, I did not want to do this, I mean, I did not want to stop the flowing of my tears which contained my emotions. This Tigasaku cult is scary, Ryuki who had been grandly knee-ed and suffered a nosebleed thereafter was no longer gagged, thus, the Mew, Mew, resident of the valley was no more. He was now sitting on the same coach as us. After taking the knee and being threatened by me, I had expected him to be bare hatred for me but nothing happened. He too was a member of the Tigasaku cult. He understood Bashu's secret meeting as a meeting to assume custody of me so that they could secretly obtain the revelations of the divine messenger from the heavens. The influencing ability of the Tigasaku cult is terrifying. He too had believed that I cried the previous day because I was grieving for the world, just like how the other devotees did, he prayed to me as well. Even now, Tigasaku was preaching. At that time, Usama told me, if you are going to weave the left straw sandal, please weave the right sandal too. That was what she said. Ryuki was furiously transcribing all that on paper. I wonder if he is noting it down with the same grandeur. This religion is seriously insane. I wonder if these devotees are all right. Won't they be easily scammed one day? Perhaps it was already too late. I worry that they have been sold an expensive vase by cult founder Tukasaku. I can only clasp my hands in prayer for them in my heart today. I wore myself out crying and don't have any energy left but once I get my energy back, I must stop that cult. Thankfully, Sehi-san was not a devotee of the Tigasaku cult and occasionally, he would remonstrate the Tigasaku disciples for making a racket. Thankfully, Sehi-san is Kuoka Arsen's little brother but he has not gotten used to Kuoka Arsen being completely an ani, so he looked somewhat perplexed. Sehi-san's appearance looked young so I had assumed that there was quite a gap in age between the brothers, but that was not the case, rather it was because mages age slower than normal humans, how enviable. I opened my puffy eyes and looked at Kuoka Arsen who was next to me. She was leisurely staring at the scenery outside the coach. I do not hold any regrets saying that I wanted to be together yesterday. But, now that we are together. I wonder how Kuoka Arsen feels. Kuoka Arsen really liked Boss and before then, she always said that she would always be following you. To Boss. However, due to my selfish desires, she was unable to continue following him. I do not regret any one bit but, for Kuoka Arsen, she did not say a word. I am sorry, Kuoka Arsen. I caused you to be separated from Boss. She seemed to be startled by my sudden apology and said, Ara. Why are you apologizing? I am with Ryu Chan because I want to be with Ryu Chan. She stroked my head at the same time. From her expression, it does not seem likely that she was lying or faking it. Seeing as I smiled with relief, she said, Also, once someone else who loves Ryu Chan appears and that you want to leave the nest to be with that person, I would continue to chase after Alec. Once I locked in, I won't let my prey get away. She had been maintaining her serenity until now but abruptly, she transformed into a ferocious beast. There was no way Boss can get away. I think that I, too, would meet Boss and the rest again when I become an adult. Kuoka Arsen, you are against what Boss is trying to do right? Kuoka Arsen was taken slightly aback by my unexpected question. However, I wanted to know the answer badly so I did not look away, soon. She sighed with resignation and answered me. I do not oppose it because I am against it. In fact, the ideals spoken by Alec is also my ideals. When we were students, we could hit it off and be friends was because of our shared ideals. Still, in the pursuit of these ideals, countless of people would die. I do not want that. I see. I agree. I do not like that people would die. I wanted to share with Kuoka Arsen what I think and somehow or another. All at once, the things in my head flowed out. I only understand vaguely of what boss and the rest are trying to achieve but I pretended not to know anything. It was likely because I was hollow. I was just thinking all about what I lacked and did not consider seriously about this world and the people living in this world. I did not consider this world as mine. Kuoka Arsen looked at me with a tinge of worry to indicate to her that I was fine. I continued with a wide grin. Nevertheless, I finally realized it, that's why, I will go to school from now on. 
learn all sorts of things, see with my own eyes, meet with more people and fill up the hollow me to some extent. On top of that, I will form my own opinions. I want to make my own decisions. I want to live like that. Once I have solidified my own opinions, I would meet boss and the rest. If I believe that what boss wants to achieve is the right thing, I would assist boss. However, if what boss is doing is wrong based on my opinions, I will stop boss. Probably, this is, doing this would be, what I can do for boss as a family, I think. Kuoka Asen smiled radiantly at me, who had declared with such vigor. I see, that may be for the best. For me, living through one's youth enjoyably, without hoisting such a grandiose objective would be better though. And then, saying up till then, Kuoka Asen fixed her eyes on me and continued, Yu chan was totally different when we first met. You have become a fantastic girl. If I was a boy, I would have perhaps fallen for you. Dot to the Yu Chan of now, I have one advice before you enter school. Her eyes stared at me with considerably more force. I was slightly uncomfortable at the if I was a boy part, but I pretended not to notice and awaited what Kuoka Arsens had to say next. If you catch sight of a cool man, don't ever let them go. Then bring them to me. What would you do to them? I would check if it is a man worthy of Yu Chan. To do that I would be sampling them. It would be troubling if it was some weird man, you see. I see. If I have a boyfriend, I would have to keep it a secret from Kuoka Arsen. I nodded my head while secretly hardening my determination. Kuoka Arsen happily nodded likewise. Later, I entrusted my back at the rear of the coach. I became exhausted from yesterday's crying and today's weather was good, so the sunlight felt comfortable. I shut my eyes for a bit and shortly went into sleep. School life would last for five years. In that time, I would slowly creak open my hollow interior. Think about what I want to do, what I want to be. I have lots to think about. I will meet with all sorts of people, learn from their different viewpoints and at the same time, think about it on my own. That way, I shall move on facing the world earnestly. That is because, I have gotten interested in the world I live in now. Volume 1, Reincarnated Girl's Childhood Fin. Loading. Prologue. School entrance ceremony grumblings of a certain teacher. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Author Notes. It is no longer a first-person perspective from the protagonist so please be careful. Even if you skim through this, I believe it would not be too much of a trouble. Speaking of which, it would be great if I could submit the first chapter for the volume. I will be in your care. I have been a teacher at the Royal Castell School for seven years now. Today is the freshman school entrance ceremony but this year again, there were very few mage freshmen. Year by year, the number of mages have gradually thinned down. I wonder how many people are there who feel a sense of crisis because of this. If we let the situation be, this society which relies on magic would probably collapse. Nevertheless, not only did the king not enact any special policy to prevent this collapse, even now, the king handles his governmental affairs in the same way. It is not that the current king is incompetent, I suppose he is simply just afraid that he would, with his very own hands destroy the social order that kept its tranquility for over hundreds of years by the same system. Dreading the very thought of destroying the values that are still being taught today, the king is unable to deem it an option to destroy these values. Now that I think of it, the previous king's sense of crisis was greater than others. Still, he was an idiot. He thought that if the problem was that there were few mages, all he had to do was to have more children. He went ahead to keep many concubines, and without much thought, left many seeds behind. Still, in the end, only four of them had the ability to become mages. Just for four mages, he had many children without an aptitude for magic and who were also part of royalty. Furthermore, the previous king who lacked forethought made most of his children marry into influential aristocrats. Therefore, 
There were many aristocratic children now who were fellow cousins, nephews, niece, uncle and aunties to the king. This generation's children would likely dispute over their marriage relationships. Marriage between cousins is acceptable but marriage between kin with close blood relationships would basically be frowned upon silently. Freshman representative, Katharina Guinassus, step forward. The principal who also holds the chairmanship, Baldinger, called out the name of the student representative to give a speech. She shifted her focus onto the principal and likewise, the principal glued her hopeful eyes on Katharina. Katharina Guinassus, the daughter of Guinassus Earl. The prince's son was among the freshmen of this year and it would have been a sounder choice to have picked him as the representative to give the speech. The Guinassus domain was a neighboring land separated from this country, by mountains and demonic forests. It was an affluent land which had a port where trading can be safely conducted, unlike the other territories which face difficulties due to the declining number of mages. The Guinassus domain were able to decrease their reliance on magic while maintaining an abundance of resources so it was not a big blow to them. In recent times, their strength has grown significantly. In this case, it would have been better to pick a royal mage from the family which has been conferred the title of prince, but there was barely any aristocrat who dared resist the Guinassus Earl. Originally, comparing just their peerage ranks, the title of prince was higher, but the Earl which controls territory was stronger in terms of power relations, not to mention that the Guinassus family were a special lot too. Miss Katharina who was the center of attention of the other aristocrats stepped up on the stage upon being called. She enrolled as a mage. From managing his territory peacefully to having a mage successor, it can be said that the Guinassa soul has nothing to fret about. As the freshman representative, Miss Katharina started to recite from memory, about the joys and aspirations of being a freshman. Silver hair in a vertical winding hairstyle golden eyes, strong willed eyes with large brows pointing upwards. TN, check out the table of contents for a picture that contains her. During the speech, she widened her smile on her pretty face, while looking down at the other students with a trace of ridicule, though that may all just be my imagination, a stereotypical example of a mage, no rather, the epitome of an aristocrat, looking down on people who cannot use magic looking down on all things that are inferior to herself. That must have been how she had lived her life. This is a common thing for other aristocrats and mages. In her case, she is in fact stronger than these others and since others are mostly beneath her, she became hard to deal with. Looking at the principal and chairperson Baldinger, who incidentally has graying hair, it was patently clear that he was disappointed. Principal Baldinger is the third prince of the previous king. However, because he was not a mage, at age 15, his name was removed from the royal family register and he became known as Baldinger the Merchant Earl. He was tasked with managing the school but, since everything to do with education is under the jurisdiction of the king, he was simply a nominal supervisor. Nevertheless, he was a man with a nimble head so somehow, he is in a quiet struggle to dispossess rights regarding management of the school from the king. It seems that he wants to reform the structure of the school, which has mages at its center and in doing so, spur society to change as well. From the foolish looking smile he makes every day, you will not be to tell that he is such an ambitious man. At the very least, if the principal was part of the talented mages that lived with the king or someone else with the same ability as the principal was with the current king, perhaps this society could be preserved slightly longer. I wonder if the principal is expecting anything from Miss Katharina who is now presenting her speech. Without a doubt, he must have been scheming to obtain a young power with authority, so that he could make a personal request to the king and if luck is on his side, he might be able to gain the full rights to manage the school. However, seeing that it was evident that she had been already tainted by the colors of aristocracy, her shoulders drooped. To the very end, the problematic Miss Katharina did not let go of her haughty smile as she ended her address. She went down the stage glamorously. As Miss Katharina returned to her seat, the principal also managed to recover herself to call out the name of the next student representative. It was compulsory for majors to be enrolled so they did not do written tests but for the other students. They absolutely must pass their entrance examinations to enter the school.
The entrance exam was an ordinary written exam on refinement and culture. The second student to be called was a non-mage student and was the top scorer in the entrance exams. Continuing, from the category of normal entrance examinations, freshman representative, New Ruby Fallen stepped forward. Among the freshmen, a commotion ensued. New Ruby Fallen became rather famous prior to the school entrance ceremony. She was from the cursed, magic-forsaken land of Ruby Fallen, which for some reason or another did not produce any mages. There was a rumor spreading that there was this mysterious girl who appeared from nowhere and had an unknown background, yet she was adopted. Sometimes, a non-aristocratic parent might give birth to a mage and in that scenario, it is common for the territorial lord to adopt that mage but for a non-mage to have be specially adopted, and to add on, to have her take the school examinations too. All these were anomalies. The school entrance written examinations were generally difficult for someone who has not been learning properly from young and so, even for this year, there were probably many aristocratic children who failed even though they had started their education from young. The school is managed with the funds from the national budget. Hence, the tuition fees and examinations fees were all free but there were expenses to be spent and effort put in in the journey to reach the capital and living in the capital before the announcement of the results. Add in the possibility of failing and you have the considerations one should make before taking the examination. It was normal for children who show no promise to not take the examinations at all. And yet, a horsebone of a child came from nowhere to challenge the examinations. Furthermore, she became the top scorer. TN. Japanese idiom to describe a person with doubtful origin in a derogatory manner. From the start, the land of Ruby Fallen was subject to numerous controversies but I hear that the surrounding aristocrats have become quite sensitive to the puzzling actions that have taken place this time. Paying no heed to the din the students were making, she went up on stage after her name, New Ruby Fallen was called. She greeted everyone with simplicity and smiled with an odd sense of composure one would not expect from a ten-year-old child. Like Miss Katharina, she started talking about the hopes and delights of entering school. Her strong yellowish blonde hair went all the way down to her chest area and the tips of her hair curled around. She had a small nose, thin lips and strong eyes with hazel-colored pupils. I could see that she has the characteristics of a new Zui face but all I could focus on was her erect back and the way her chin draws back in perfect balance to the raised corners of her mouth, completed with her every movement in refinement. Breathtaking, tn, yu Zui means thin, yu Zui face is used to refer to a person with facial features lacking in definition. Meanings of yu Zui face can vary depending on the person. It could be having a small nose, single eyelid or having white skin, etc. Despite being the mysterious freshman and the buzz topic for everyone, that aura of hers was. Most students entering through normal entrance examinations have little self-esteem. That can be understood from how they grew up being compared to mages by their family and relatives. In general, the normal students hold some psychological entanglements with regards to mages and most would be bound by this entanglement becoming submissive to mages. Also, there are students who isolate themselves in their own shells. However, the non-mage girl who was standing on stage now emitted no such self-deprecation or any sort of gloomy emotion. New Ruby Fallen finished her speech and descended from the stage. When she was going up on stage, the students were still talking among themselves but now, it became still as death. The students could sense it too, that she was releasing a strange aura. And then, I started to weigh my thoughts about her, on whether I should welcome her or be vigilant against her. Opening speech by our present student's representative. Third year student, Henry Castagas Fomtel, stepped forward. After the principal called out his name, the auditorium started a big ruckus than earlier. White skin, light blonde hair and pale purple eyes. His straight hair went down all the way under his chest, typical of a mage, a young nobleman who has inherited the good looks and features of the royalty. He was studying in this school and is the most famous student. Also, he was the son of the previous king, in other words, little brother from another mother, and was a stellar mage. The current king has unfortunately been unable to have a child with the capabilities to be a mage. For that reason, it is said that Henry would be the king in the next term. 
His superb ability to handle magic was rarely seen in the present age. In addition, he has no flaws and his conduct could not be criticized whatsoever. He does not hold any contempt for people who cannot use magic and has a gentle nature. Thus, he was the student that Principal Borujinia had the greatest expectations for. That was why the fourth and fifth year students were ignored in the selection for a representative to do this address. Principal Borujinia was pinning his hopes in the possibility that he holds doubt about the current magic supremacy ideology and governance, and might be able to rouse the king to bring change. He has that kind of influencing power. Furthermore, if he were unable to persuade the king, he was a man that was a candidate for the king in the next term too. No points lost for winning him over. Yet, as of present, it has not been going as smoothly as the principal had calculated and to this day, not only has he not gained his approval, he has not been able to actively engage in intricate discussions with him, it seems. I suppose the reason for this is that there were many people who wished to become closer to him to use him. He was being vigilant. Moreover, if he appealed to him directly, there was a chance that Prince Henry might be opposed to his ideas and he could be dismissed from the role of principal because of that. Besides, to keep a close watch on the happenings at school, the king has placed a mage, who is under his close influence, as the vice principal. It was not that the king has any suspicion on the principal. It was purely just that the current king, or more like, the kings up to now fundamentally do not trust anyone except for mages. Even if it was a brother from a different mother, as long as they were not mages, they found no worth in putting any faith in them. Anyways, from the very start, Principal Borugenia did not consider forcibly convincing Prince Henry. He thinks from the point of view of an educator. Therefore, he prefers that Prince Henry realize for himself through his time at school. And he placed his hopes that the capable prince would be able to gain this insight himself. And for me, I am a teacher who can only cling on to that very same hope. That is because I am the only man in this society from now on who harbors such fears, taking no notice of both the principal and my expecting gaze. The prince who was adept at magic, finished his speech and stepped down from the stage with an unperturbed expression. Loading. Freshman Arc 1 Heart Pumping School Entrance Ceremony. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Giving a speech is tiring. My shoulders stiffened from all the tension. Furthermore, the venue was somewhat like a concert hall so I got excessively nervous. I have been worried that my voice will not be loud enough for this larger place but it seems like the wind spirits sand did a good job and made my voice get through. Wind spirits are really handy. Also, it felt like the all-important speech went down successfully. Much satisfied. Several days ago, I had been with Kuoka Arsen, spending time to discover the best angle to bring out my maximum beauty. It was worth the time. Thank you, Kuoka Arsen. Thanks to you. My debut as a student was a huge success. Supposed to be. My uniform was sufficiently cute too. Rather than calling it a uniform, it was just a normal fashion attire to me. Indigo blue sleeved long dress. The collar was white and there was a silk ribbon under my chest area. For the aristocrats in this world, wearing silk or wool clothes is their fundamentals so this uniform was without exception, made with expensive materials. These clothes would fetch a very good price and yet, each time a student promotes an academic level, they are given three attires for free, as one would expect from the generosity of the royal school. Male students wore a white shirt, navy blue vest and pants. They have a jacket too but it seems that instead, the grey robe is worn by the majority of the people. Many prefer to put on clothes that give off the appearance of a mage. It must be because the school was meant for mages I guess. Tools are needed when certain magic is used. Hence, mages typically wear robes that have many pockets to store various things. As for the female uniform, the long skirt has several pockets. A fair bit of things can be placed inside too. Thus, even if the girls did not wear the robe, it would probably be fine. And most importantly, the robe was uncool so the ladies couldn't bear it. Even after the end of the school entrance ceremony, 
There was an orientation to get us freshmen accustomed to the school so we could not leave the auditorium yet. We are now taking a small break. The first half of the orientation would be on explaining about the library. I pretended to be listening elegantly but I could not contain the excitement in my heart. In this country, the library can only be found in the capital's campus. It was the only library in this country. The library was a place where only students and aristocrats can enter. In order to emphasize its value, the library was built on ground that had an elevation of 50 meters. And, not far from the library was the castle where the king lived. It was a building that was built on land another extra 100 meters higher. Incidentally, the ground elevation of the capital was naturally about 50 meters higher. In this world, the greatness and awesomeness of one could be expressed through height. Since I was a student, I can enter such an awesome library. To enter school, I had studied but the contents of my study materials were, how shall I put it, all of it was fishy, especially on things related to history, they were beyond the levels of dubious. Still, if I could visit the library, I am looking forward to learning more things in greater detail. Absent-mindedly, I looked around the surroundings and realized that the ladies and gentlemen freshmen have already made their own cliques. Likely they were fellow acquaintances from the same hometown. Unfortunately, I came to the capital separately from the other children who hail from Ruby Fallen. Thus, I essentially recognize nobody. For starters, we were supposed to make a quick provincial tour around the agricultural lands finish up the proceedings to be adopted under a territorial lord, and begin heading towards the capital while studying at relaxed pace. However, thanks to the Tigasaku cult, our plans were substantially derailed. Tigasaku the missionary went around announcing during our farmland tour, the divine messenger has arrived. Besides providing support for their agricultural activities, he went on to give speeches to the farmers. I told him countless of times that, stop, I am not a messenger from the heavens. I am the same as everyone, a human. My repeated insistence on this was misunderstood as, oh, kind words from Usama. Usama is claiming that she is the same as us humans, just like how there are no differences between all things born in this world. Like that, he exposed me to the world like a criminal. Anything I say would transform into kind words and so, I gave up trying to stop him and waited for the end of his speech which carried a mood that had a crucifix stuck to it. O oh, untainted peasants, I pray eternally that you do not get conned by the Tigasaku cult. With all his speeches, our journey to the capital was delayed and we could not synchronize our departure timing with the other children. This being my very first school life in this life, it was a somewhat dispiriting scenario. That's cause I want to make some friends, if possible girls too. When I was with Alec Boss and the gang, I often hear them talking about their time as students. Stories such as when Boss and friends were peeping at the girls' washroom and Bashu-san messed up, angering their teacher or when Gay i san attempted to train his muscles by removing his chair and doing squats on an air chair while trembling throughout the day's lessons. Somehow, hearing them reminiscing together about their times together, I get extremely envious of them. I too want to have friends like that whom I can talk together with about the old times. Still, there should be freshmen who have gotten drunk in love with my splendid speech earlier. They should be gathering by my side during the short break. I just need to maintain my graceful smile while waiting on my seat. It should be an easy job. While hiding my restlessness, I waited at my seat and for some reason, I could hear footsteps rushing in my direction. They finally came, huh? I stayed alert with a posed look. You, eh? Not a girl's voice? He is dot dot oh. Isn't this Alan Sama? Long time no see. I stood up instinctively. Alan has grown taller. Since we are already on this topic, I will let you know that my height has not changed much but I feel that I have become more adult-like compared to last time. His black hair was at the length of a bobbed haircut originally but now... It has grown to his shoulders and was tied together as one ponytail. Nostalgic pea green pupils. I start to remember Kane Bout Charma, Irene San, and Claude San. I smiled and called out Alan's name. For some reason, he stopped on the spot and he became dazed. The next moment, his face became stern looking. You dot dot why? Sending us just that letter. You, seriously? Why? Alan glared at me while shouting loudly. 
His face was flushed red, and he looked like he was about to cry. A, hey, are you going to cry? Why, are you angry? I had thought we might be making a very touching embrace and had stiffened my outstretched arms for a second. Calm down Mr. Allen. Whoa, whoa. I had mentioned in the letter didn't I didn't I send a letter addressed to Irene San when I became an adopted daughter of Ruby Fallen. I became apologetic that they might be worrying and searching for me so I decided to write to them about my survival, that I had been adopted by Ruby Fallen, and to inform that I am going to school. Was my letter so clumsily written I wonder dot dot compared to writing anything at all, and forming them was better choice though. Hey. Mr. Allen's abrupt shouts are attracting the scrutinizing stares from the other freshmen nearby. Allen Sama, please, calm down. Let's go somewhere else. I grabbed Allen's sleeve without waiting for his reaction and brought him out of the auditorium, turning right at the corner and moving to a place under the shadow of a pillar where it seems that nobody would walk by. Allen Sama, um dot dot have you calmed down? I said and peered into his eyes. Unlike before. He looked like he was in bewilderment, and his eyes opened wide in surprise. Still, he looked like he was about to cry. The letter I wrote dot dot did I do something disrespectful? If it was disrespectful on my part, I sincerely apologize. No dot dot that's not it. Despite his face being flushed with anger earlier, he was now looking down and making a showbon face dot what is going on, Mr. Allen, aren't you being too emotionally unstable? However. A nostalgic angel's voice descended upon the confused me. Ryu Allen C. Kane Sama Showing himself at the most critical juncture, the followist Kane Sama Impressive. His follow technique remains unchanged after all these years. In fact, considering his timing earlier dot dot he has improved further. Kane Sama center smiled in my direction and opened his arms while calling me Ryu. I jumped into his chest and gave him a reunion hug. He has grown amazingly taller. I fit snugly into Kane Anizama's chest. He had muscles in that area and the area which I buried my head into was firm. His reddish-brown hair has gotten shorter and his childishness has faded away. He has become a somewhat masculine young man. You, you have grown and become increasingly beautiful at that. Ah, I'm glad you are safe. Dot dot thankfully. I have worried you. Kane Sama has not changed. No. It seems like you have grown to be more and more like a man. I am very glad to have met you again. Huh? That thing on your wrist. Is it the ornament that I made for you last time? Kane Sama looked at the good luck bracelet that was on my wrist and was delighted. It was the good luck bracelet that I had received from Kane Sama before I departed from the rainforest mansion. To prevent it from getting damaged, I had conscientiously taken care of it but either way, I had been living in the mountains. So it was damaged to some extent and right now, it would not be strange for it to break any time soon. Yes, I intended to take good care of it but it has torn slightly. It is alright, it is something that can be broken any time anyway. This time, when I return home, I will make another one for you. Kane Sama revealed his sparkling white teeth while saying, as expected of an Ikerman, he has dazzling white teeth while having these impressions. Alan became more and more showbon. Omega comma as Kane Sama and I were embracing one another. R. Grap. Is he worried that his Anna Chan will be taken away? Kane Sama noticed my concerned glance at Alan and broke our embrace. He opened his arms to Alan instead. Alan too, congratulations on entering the school. Yep, with a nod. Alan gave his brother a light hug with a dampened spirit. D don't be so demoralized. My fault. Sorry for hugging Anasama first. Alan, have you cooled down? Haven't you got something to say to you? Have you said it properly? Kane Sama told his little brother with a sweet looking gaze. Alan reacted with a sudden moment of realization and faced me with trepidation. A, hey, why are you looking at me with those eyes? A face like how a small animal would make when facing its predator. Dot dot I won't bite though. You, earlier. I was in the wrong for that outburst. I had been lost in thoughts, and was in a disarray. I was astonished at Alan's apology and responded to him by telling him it was okay. Once again, Alan started to look down in demoralization. And, after hesitating for a short moment, Alan opened his mouth again. Also, sorry, I could not help you then. Seriously, I wanted to apologize at the start, 
I could not help because I was powerless. You must have had a hard time alone, yet I could not do anything. I might have caused you to be helpless then. I have always wanted to apologize for that. My body stiffened on hearing Alan repentance, or more like confession. That is. How should I put it? You have been worried for me, right? Standing in front of me was Alan who looked gloomy. Was he angry at me because he was so worried? To think that he had been so worried for me, and I had a choice to go back to Alan and the other members of the rainforest too. The option I had chosen for myself was not to go back, the path which I had picked. It isn't so that I have regrets for it now, but, I had forgotten that I would cause others to feel sad for me. It was just that I thought I was just a passing memory to Alan and the others, that was how I imagined it, perhaps. I was under that kind of impression. Nonetheless, I am sorry Alan, the one that should be sorry is me. It is I who should feel that way. Sorry. I have made you worried. It is all fine now, I said and awkwardly opened my arms and gave Alan a hug. I could feel that Alan was crying, he was sniffling. I am really sorry, Alan, I'm glad. I was a helper for the entrance ceremony and was at the auditorium when I heard from Henry Sama that my little brother had raised his voice, so I rushed out and it worth the effort. I must return soon. The explanation session would begin shortly so you two return to the auditorium too. He nodded with satisfaction seeing as we have reconciled. Alan and I broke off our embrace and we sent Kane Sama off. I glanced at Alan who was next to me, and it looked like he had stopped crying but for some reason, he looked as though his spirit was broken. Alan Sama, shall we head back to the auditorium? To the dispirited Alan. I did not know what I should be saying to him and it was indeed true that our recess was ending so I had suggested that we return to the auditorium. I turned at the curve and was about to enter the auditorium when I felt that Alan was not following me from behind. I turned back to look. There were no signs of Alan appearing from the corner. To check on Alan, I went back to the corner and heard someone sobbing. I paused myself before the turn. If only I could be like Kane and Izama. I had shouted at you despite not having any such intentions. And I was planning to apologize first and then tell her that I would protect her and that she be relieved too. Dot dot I am the worst. Why am I so uncool? Dot I want to grow up faster. Alan was talking to himself. He must be unconsciously muttering to himself since he said so in a very soft voice. In that instant, I wanted to say something but... I realized that those must be words that he did not want anyone to hear so I acted as though I heard nothing and went back quietly to the auditorium. Loading TSRV 2C2. Freshman Arc 2 Stalking Boy Alan. MCP Alert. Hope you all enjoy this chapter smile also. Thank you Tracy for donating again. Loading. Tensaishu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. The school entrance ceremony and orientation ended without a hitch and the next day's lessons began. The very first lesson was magic history lesson. It appears that magic history lesson would be conducted every day for one period. Every day, for that one period, from the first years to the fifth years. Almost everyone will be gathered at the auditorium to take the magic history lesson. Incidentally, there are no fixed seating arrangements so everyone is free to pick their own seats. After the end of this lesson, year threes and above would attend their own subject lessons so they would move separately to their own classrooms. For now, the magic history lesson was, rather than an actual history lesson of this country, was more about learning the greatness of the current great mages. Simply put, it was lesson where mages would be patting themselves on the back, calling one another, Suki ee ee. It gave me the creeps. Various thoughts flitted through my head but for now, I need to use the toilet. The lesson is about to begin so I need to hurry. I stood up and Alan who had set up encampment beside me, turned to look at me. Where are you going? I am going to pick flowers. I chuckled as I gave my response in a ladylike manner but it did not seem to get through to Alan. Why are you going to pick flowers at this time? Lessons are starting soon. He replied with a serious look. The washroom. I am going to the washroom. That was definitely unacceptable for a lady I thought as I replied with indignation but Alan did not notice one bit and nodded. Ah, I got it. For some reason, 
he stood up too. And while I walked off, Alan followed me too. T this guy is following me, as expected, he did not follow me all the way inside the female's toilet but after I took care of my business, wiped my hands with a handkerchief and came out of the toilet, Alan suddenly appeared and declared proudly, good, let's go back, he was waiting nearby, no way, this kid is terrifying, since our reunion at the school entrance ceremony, Alan has been concerned for me beyond the point of necessity, even this morning, when I was leaving the dormitory for school, Alan was waiting outside with linked arms. I have no idea when he came but as though it was natural for me to appear from the dorm, he said, let's go, and it became such that we went to the auditorium together. It was the front of the girls' dormitory, so it was natural that the percentage of girls was high. I could feel all their painful stares. Oh no, oh no, could he be her boyfriend, such a cute couple, you foo foo. The warm stares from the upperclassmen and Nisama hinted at that. After following me to the auditorium, Alan did not leave me alone, not even for one second. We were allowed to freely to choose our seats but Alan called out to me as though it was normal. Let's sit over here, and we sat next to one another. It was true that I have not made any friends and that sitting together made me happy but somehow, the gaze from Alan was painful. It could be said that he was monitoring me or guarding me or something. In addition, there was that incident during the school entrance ceremony, and I could not grasp the sense of distance between us. Alan's was looking at me as though I was a frightened little animal. And now, the current Mr. Alan was waiting for me before the girl's toilet. A Alan Sama. It is okay not to follow me at times like this. I timidly told Alan but he did not seem to be have a listening ear and pompously replied, Mew is in a dangerous position so there is no helping about that. Let's go back quickly. Alan started to walk off. Is there actually any danger in going to the toilet? Don't tell me that there is something like a toilet hangakosan monster in this world, an anecdote that was about a cute child being brought into another world. Still. The real problem is not Hangako san but the current Alan san, who was scarier. Later, we had lunch together as I continued to be frightened by Alan sama who has been acting weird. Thankfully, Kane sama came for lunch too and I was saved by the somewhat soothing of the atmosphere. After getting involved in this and that, the fourth period lesson ended. Only the first and second year mages have to attend their magic lesson on the fifth period. Therefore, from the fifth period onwards, Mr. Allen who was a mage had to go separate ways with me. Allen stood up to prepare to move but before that, he took fleeting glances at me while having a half-baked expression on him. Do not worry, Allen boy, I am fine. So please go for your lessons quickly. That was what I told him with my eyes. Nevertheless, it did not get through. Mew, I need to go but are you fine being alone? He asked to confirm it. Yes, I am totally fine. In fact, I am more worried for you. I am all right. Rather than that, Alan, you need to go now or you will be late. Please hurry. I said as I pushed him on his back, half trying to drive him out. Alan looked back and told me with a solemn expression. Well then, you can rest a shot as soon as the lesson end, I will come back. So please wait here. After the fifth period ends, I would be going back to my dorm though. Also, I have plans too. Today, I was going to leave the campus and have a meal with Ku Oka Arsen. Ah, I have plans after school so I can't do that. I will be returning to the girls dorm now. I replied and pushed Alan into the mage crowd. I immediately dashed back to my seat and covered my head. No way. What should I do? Alan is too scary. Dash besides Alan acting all weird, school life went on peacefully. It was my first time living in a dormitory but my preparations for a new life was perfect and the moving was smooth. Well, that was because I hardly have any luggage. I lived alone in a room that had a size of 8 Tatami mats. The room mainly had a desk and a bed. The toilet and shower room were communal, for food. There was a cafeteria in the campus so eating can be done there. Also, there were people who chose to eat outside the campus after having obtained approval. For me, I often go outside to have dinner though not daily, rather than calling it eating out. It was actually eating at Kuoka Arsen House who had moved into the capital. At first, I have been worried for Kuoka Arsen who went to look for a job in the capital. She marched into the capital, 
searching for an Okama bar but she could not find anything like it in the city. If she continued being unable to find an Okama bar, Ku Oka Arson would be left adrift in the streets. Those were my thoughts as I despaired but it appears that Ku Oka Arson had already decided to start a business in her own trade, a drug store. She had set up her store without problems successfully, and now, she is living in the capital in her home come working area. Hence, my days consisted of whenever lessons end and I obtain the exit permit, either commuting back and forth to Ku Oka Arson's place or not. That was how my one month went. But recently, the pursuer had been trying harder to get in my way. The pursuer I am talking about is Alan. A premier stalking boy he is. Alan was essentially, never more than a few steps away from me. No matter where I go, he would definitely follow. Excuse me. Following a lady like that. Aren't you just a stalker? I came down to that conclusion but because of me, I had worried him and I felt somewhat indebted. And due to that. I was unable to confront him about it for the month. Nevertheless, the fifth period was always a special class for mages hence, we were separated then, and I would usually return to the dorm after that, hence it was only up to the fourth period that the tailing spirit would follow me, therefore, one way or another, I could leave the campus for now but recently, it feels like he had noticed me leaving the campus, and started to follow me more persistently. Today, after school, when I was about to visit Ku Oka Arson's place, and was right about to step out of the campus, at the front of the gate, a boy that looked like Alan came into sight. He was lying in wait with a dazzling stance. H huh? Has the magic lesson already ended? That's too early though. Was it because I had been delayed for too long while renewing the exit permit? Secretly, in an attempt to evade detection, I tiptoed to the gate when... Oi, you. Someone called out to me. I who had been tiptoeing, immediately raised my back and turned round and beamed at Alan. Well, Alan Sama, how do you do? How was your day? Somehow, your smile looks rigid. You didn't try to ignore me after spotting me, right? To his sharp interrogation, I could only deny vehemently. Impossible, impossible, that is impossible, and laughed in a Lady Sama-like manner. Oh oh ho. Oh. To get my way through, then that is fine, but if you are going outside, I'm sure I told you before that I am going together with you today, you will let me go with you. Finally, it has come to this huh? Alan's exit permit dangled from a string around his neck, his setup was flawless, there will not be anything awesome even if you follow me, it will only be boring for you, because I'm just having a meal at the person from Ruby Fallen who is taking care of me. It's not like I am following you because it is interesting. It might be bright now but won't it become darker later when you are coming back? If Ryu is alone, it will be dangerous. I am tagging along too. Ku, if you say it like that, then there is nothing I can retort with. No way I can flip the table on him when he is stalking as he was worried for me. It will be fine. Public safety in these parts is good and the person from Ruby Fallen would escort me back. Additionally, if I suddenly brought Alan Sama with me, that person would be shocked. I have been freeloading at Truby Fallen. I don't wish to further trouble them. If you feel so ashamed, why don't you come back to Rainforest? No, no, it is not that I feel ashamed. I am treated very kindly. As I said so and so, I started to think that I am already at my limits in trying to shake off Alan. Probably, if it was Ku Oka Arsen, she would not find a friend or two bothersome, and in fact, happily welcome them. However, I would not like that. I did not want him to meet too often with Ku Oka Arsen. I mean, it is rare for me to have family time, and the way I act when I am with my family and when I am with my henchmen is somewhat different. Also, Ku Oka Arsen said that she would want to sample my boyfriends too. Alan is absolutely not my boyfriend but despite appearances, he does have a fairly well looking face. He is a child so for now. I believe that Ku Oka Arsen would not move her fingers on him but I still have to take precautions. Alan boy, I am thinking for you when I try to dissuade you from going with me. I wish I could voice that argument. Nevertheless, no matter how I convince him otherwise, I did not seem to be able to throw him off from his hot pursuit with a heavy, imposing stance. Whatever, I am going to, Alan boy said as he grabbed my right arm and walked out. <laughs> Nothing more can be done. 
Guess I have to bring him to Kuo Carson's place then. If anything happens, don't blame me. Don't look for me when you get eaten. Loading TSRV 2C3, Freshman Arc 3 imagining that I would cry when I am left alone. Here we go again. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. Opening the door of the small drug store that Kuoka Asuna was running, I found her in the midst of serving a customer. So far as it goes, this is a service industry so Kuoka Asuna stopped her wiggling like how she always does and wore a white shirt with beige pants like clothes a man would wear. Her hair was tied to the back and her appearance was immaculate. In truth, when we entered the capital or when we were renting the room, there were people who took a visibly hostile attitude towards her and neat tone. I was tremendously indignant at their behavior towards Kuoka Asn. In my fit of resentment, I wanted to carry out my revenge by secretly applying grease on those odious jerks but Kuoka Asn found out midway and I had to give up on the revenge. Still, due to that, for her normal day-to-day -day life, Kuoka Asn hit her and he style the best she could. With that, the first impression of how she gives to others does not give away the fact that she is an anee but sometimes she negligently reverts to her usual anee tone. However, as a receptionist, she does not engage in that kind of conversation which would reveal that much thus, for the time being, she is doing fine. I gave a bow to the customer in the store and went into the inner room with Alan. Is this a drugstore? The person at the store is Ryu's caretaker, is he your attendant? As soon as we entered the room, Alan Boy showered me with questions in succession. I was thinking in my mind, now, now, just wait because I am going to pour some tea now, so please, please wait. As I prepared the tea, I was thinking of how I should reply him. I have a feeling that explaining everything in detail would lead to many other dilemmas later so I am going with it lightly. And so, I presented the tea to Alan and the furrow on his brow which has been there for some time relaxed. It has been such a long time since I received tea poured by you. R. True. When I was a maid, I had been serving tea every day. Perhaps after reminiscing about the past, Alan had regained his spirit somewhat and looked happy. The Alan Bout charmer from that time was immensely sweet. Always calling me boss here and boss there, following me around like poop following a goldfish. Now, he has not changed much from being goldfish feces but, he has become a mere stalker. Ah, how appalling. W what? I have never called you as boss obviously, don't say that. Oh, it has been a long time since I've seen Alan's fury. Everything about his cheeky face is nostalgic. Ara, but isn't Alan my henchman? Wah, don't get too conceited. It was temporary. It was only temporary that I became a henchman. I was no longer a henchman soon after due to the problem of ability. What is that problem of ability anyways? What ability are you talking about? That's my first time hearing it. However, nothing much has changed since you are still following me from behind all the time. You are unable to change your disposition of being a henchman huh? Totally not. Right now, it is more like I am the boss while you is the henchman huh? Well, fine by me if the pretend play of boss henchman system no longer exists. But. I cannot accept overturning of the entire seniority relationship. I have been feeling guilty about making him worried so I have been keeping quiet for some time now. But, this much I cannot allow. In the first place, you have been worried for me so you have become a stalker. In spite of being a henchman and being worried for your boss, you are 10 years too early. Just as my emotions ran wild and I was about to let loose the pepper bombs that I had stocked in my skirt. The door to the room opened. New Chan, what's up? Are you with a friend today? Kuoka asked opened the door and asked. Kuoka dot dot Kusan. How's business? Let's see. Business would die down soon so I guess I would be closing even though it is still early. Additionally, Ryu brought back a friend for the first time too. Kuoka Asn spoke while concealing her any tone. It was probably since I had unconsciously switched to calling her Kusan. Still. I had already explained to Alan that she was someone like an attendant and she also spoke like a man so I was somewhat relieved. Yes, he is. I believe I have mentioned before though, Alan Sama from the Rainforest Earl family, pleased to meet you, 
I am Alan from the Rainforest Toll family. I am good friends with Miss Ryu. Alan bowed excessively politely. His salutations were slightly stiff, probably due to his lack of experience. His movements were clumsy too. You are an aristocrat so please be diligent and practice greeting others. Ku Oka Arsen told him them it is okay not to humble himself that much and returned the greeting while smiling warmly. Nice to meet you. I am Kuki. I came to the capital from Ruby Fallen with you. Please continue to take care of you from hereafter. Ku Oka Arsen said in an eloquent male like conduct. Thankfully, after seeing Alan, she did not suddenly grab him and eat him. Phew. Maybe Alan couldn't qualify for the preliminaries. He was a kid after all. Ryu, I would be preparing dinner from here on. It won't be anything impressive, but it is okay for Alan Cunt to have dinner here. Ku Oka Arsen suggested. Alan thanked him without reserve, thus. Alan would be joining us for dinner. At times like this, one should appear hesitant and restrained. Mr. Alan, that is the way of the Japanese. Well, Alan wasn't a Japanese though. Um, I'll help too. I exclaimed and got off from my seat but Ku Oka Arsen shook her head and stopped me. Since your friend is here today, it is fine. I am just about to be done anyways. She said, and headed towards the door. Alan, who was next to me. Observed Ku Oka Arsen as he went for the door while pressing his fingers on his chin. He doesn't seem like a bad person. He commented loftily and nodded. Who do you think you are? He is an extremely good person. He took great care of me so please refrain from using such disrespectful words. That'll depend on how he acts. Yeah, who are you to say that? Alan was certainly Alan. The nebulous tinge of the shitty brat feeling had been dearly missed. Like you know. A leopard cannot change its spots. When I reunited with Alan at the school entrance ceremony, Alan made a showbon Omega comma face out of the blue and looked like he was in the slumps. It seems like he was bothered by the fact that I had been abducted by the bandits and was worried for me. In my time with Boss and the rest, it was likely that Alan had imagined me to be a fragile girl, and the me without him by my side, was always alone and crying. That is why. When I am not by his side for even a moment, he becomes anxious and that connects with his stalking activities. With that kind of notion, my relationship with Alan has become somewhat awkward since our reunion. I had the weak of point of feeling guilty towards him and so, I totally could not treat him the same way as before. Still, right now, it feels like I have returned in time. Yes, my rationality is sound. Alan was indeed a healthy brat and I can stay relieved, as his position is that of my henchman. Though he had babbled some nonsense about him not being a henchman but rather, he being the boss. Hey, Alan Sama, why don't we have another duel right now? Just as how as it was like before dot dot the loser becomes the henchman. Eh? But, you are a girl aren't you dot dot not to mention that I have practicing my swordsmanship and I can use magic too. There is no way you can match up to me. Yearning for the old times, I made that proposal enthusiastically, yet this brat nonchalantly rejected it. What did you just say? Is your brain okay? That was the kind of feeling he gave off while rebuffing me. His eyes were telling me that there was no way that I'll be a match for him. Even though he was just Alan. How impudent. This one over here was raised in the mountains you know. Or more precisely, he was only treating me like a girl now and putting on airs that he was a gentleman who won't raise his hand on girls but hey, didn't you pick a fight with me when I was a little five year old girl? Damn, I cannot allow this. Honestly, I suggested this duel mainly just for the kicks but I feel that I cannot allow Alan to continue throwing his weight around. I have to show Alan his rightful henchman position. Ara, no way. Could Alan Sama be afraid of losing to me? What are you saying? After finally meeting you dot dot like, somewhat, I could get good vibes but, it is definitely a no. With great dismay, Alan looked at me with his A's colored in shock. So, Sue, vexing, and what did he mean by good vibes? Say it clearly. R, oh no, not like that, I need to calm down. The other party is Alan. I need to compose myself. There should be countless of methods to cleverly get through this deadlock. You are just saying that because you are afraid aren't you? I can understand. Since you were defeated with a swift attack, when I was five. After losing, you were on the cusp of breaking into tears too. I was totally and not crying. Nice. He had taken the bait. Easy. 
Now just one more push. Ara, is that so? But from the impression I got from my memory, Alan was always a wimpy boy that was half crying. There is no way that is true. What is wrong with me in your memory? That being so, with a duel, please do show me a strong Alan Sama. If you have truly gotten strong enough to beat me, I would even be your henchman too. That said, Alan was taken slightly aback and muttered to himself, henchman. He casted his eyes down for a moment and then, shifted his eyes to meet mine. Hey, if you became my henchman, wouldn't you promise never to go outside when I am not around? Alan asked seriously. Oh, oh, from the orders he would give me if I become a henchman was, kind of like, it can be seen that he is a very restrictive guy. The future of Alan Boy was exceedingly worrying. I am greatly apologetic if the reason that he ended being so restrictive was because he had been traumatized due to the bandits abducting me. That's so, isn't it? I may not fulfill that promise, but I will try to the best of my abilities, I replied vaguely, and it appeared to not be a problem as Alan linked his arms and nodded as he appeared to be in thought. And now I shall pass this gravely decision. That was how he gestured. Next, he opened his mouth. All right. I got it. This duel. I accept. Okie dokie. Fufu. How nostalgic. The venue and time would be decided by me so I shall let you know some time later. I plan on using the courtyard of the campus. Is that acceptable? I grinned and made the final confirmation with him. Alan proudly acknowledged it by saying that it does not matter. All right. Looks like I will be busy making the preparations soon. I feel bad for Alan but I will show no mercy. It would be good if I could convey that I'll be fine even without you worrying for me. I think I'll have to crush the very concept of you would cry when she is left alone that has been lingering in Alan's mind. Loading TSRV 2C4, freshman arc 4 oh yeah, I don't have any female friends. Sorry for getting this out late. My motivation kinda wore thin after chugging through work in the day. Could hardly push myself to work on this when I came back at night. Lost quite a bit of momentum on translating and I think it will take some time for me to get back to my previous speed. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. You, I heard? That you are dueling with Alan this time? Kane Sama wore a concerned expression while asking me. This happened when the entire school cohort was present at the auditorium, before the magic history lesson started. The normal Kane Sama would usually be with Henry Sama and it was rare for him to come find me. Henry Sama was the upperclassman representative who did a speech at the school entrance ceremony. Henry Sama was the gentleman acting with glittery nobility when he gave his speech during the entrance ceremony as the representative for the upperclassman. Even though he might be a handsome guy from royalty and was a mage, he committed the crime of overshadowing my beautiful speech and so, he rubs me in the wrong way. The same handsome Kane Sama was often seen together with Henry Sama showing that they were close friends. They became eye candy for the girls around them. That was the same Kane Sama who came to find me regarding the duel. Kane Sama, how do you do? Yes, as you say, Alan and I are going to have a duel. We have not decided on the day but could you as like before, be our judge please? Kane Sama seemed to brood over my request. You, it's best not to do it. Alan has since, trained his body diligently, and polished his magic skills. You will only get yourself injured. He spoke with worry and sat on the seat to my left calmly. As per usual, Alan had set up camp on my right. Towards Kane Sama's arrival, Alan flinched slightly and opened his mouth. See, Kane and Izama. I am not going to injure her at all. Oh, so you are actually afraid of getting me injured? How kind of you, boy. Sorry but I did not plan to show any mercy so please do not hold a grudge. See, from what Alan said, I would be fine. I missed those times and wanted to just have some fun. Please do not treat it as a big deal. I sent a perfect smile to Kane Sama. Kane Sama tilted his head slightly in frustration, but in the end, he gave his approval. I got it. Alan, you is a girl so please do not hurt her. I shall also accept being the judge. In fact, I hope that you two do not duel without my presence. Remember to call me before dueling. Kane Sama softly reminded us while agreeing to be our judge. 
As I have mentioned, I have not fixed a day for the duel and so, I avoided revealing the exact date. For a definite win, I have to make elaborate preparations and the environment has to carefully considered as well. Dash the preparations for the duel went smoothly. All that was left is to wait for the right opportunity, as ever, just like goldfish's feces, or should I say, proudly as goldfish's feces, Mr. Allen followed me everywhere, as I made him wait for me. I realized that there was one big problem. My first objective, the make female friends plan has not inched forward one bit at all. It has already been a month and I expected to have a swarm of friends by now. Why? I ransacked my mind for the possible reasons and the only imaginable candidate was Alan. I was always accompanied by my child and there were no opportunities for others to talk to me I suppose. However, as much as I hate to admit it, Alan had shrewdly found himself a male friend, a spirit user, Ritzkun. Even now, Ritzkun was seating next to Alan, a sweet-looking boy with bright brown trimmed hair. During the magic lesson for mages in the fifth period, the rest of the regular students would attend a lesson to learn the greatness of the mages who have been cordial towards non-mages, and so, Alan and I went our separate ways. During that magic lesson, the cheeky Alan managed to get himself a friend. Compared to me who have been hankering for a friend to this extent, Alan managed to beat me to it despite being a stalker. I wonder if it is because of something I lack, even though I possess such elegance. The first period's lesson ended and the only people left in the auditorium were the first years. I looked around gently but what I got were just the, shit, our eyes met. Reaction from the other students. What is it? What is with everyone? There isn't a myth that says that staring at my eyes would cause them to turn into stone, right? Like, I wish this was just my hallucination but, were the other students really vigilant against me? Or in other words, I could feel fear in their eyes, but I don't remember doing anything that warrants that kind of reaction. Could it be that I am too beautiful? Indeed, I devoted myself to improving my image with Kuoka Arsene's guidance but even for my hair. It was just norm oil that gave it some gloss though. I didn't think that my gorgeousness was so captivating that it got to the level of scary. In my opinion, there were more beautiful people in our surroundings too, maybe they were misled by how I behaved or something. After the first period ended, Kane Sama gave a bright smile and said, Ciao. Before leaving the auditorium, Kane Sama belonged to the Knights faculty and was a fourth year student. He moved to the training grounds together with the other seniors who were in the Knights course. I would have to make my decision for my course when I become a third year student. There are four different kinds of courses. The Knights course, Cleric course, Merchant course and the Magic course. It was compulsory for people who can use magic to take the magic course but the others are able to make their own choices. I have yet to come down to a decision. Since I have already acquired healing techniques from Kuoka Arsene, I do not feel like taking the cleric course. I want to join the magic course but I can't. Therefore, the only remaining choices were the knight's course and the merchant course. The merchanting course was about brushing up on arithmetic skills and it seems that the first year and second in the course would all be on learning the fundamentals. Throughout the course, no specific skill would be taught to the levels of mastery but it feels that it was an internship for the real life, learning the ways of a cook, a seamstress and all other kinds of practical skills. That was where its charms lie. Kawimayu Aniki picked up the skill of making coins in this course and from it, learned to make a dagger in the process. However, it was mainly about learning the fundamentals and nothing but the fundamentals so it was, you know, kinda. In contrast, there is the knight's course, and I kinda feel that building up the physical body was better. One's muscles could never betray oneself, as the name suggests. Sword techniques would be taught in the knight's course. Sometimes, horse riding skills, weapon maintenance skills or even dissecting animals skills would be learned but, the course was technically, all about building physical strength. It was a course filled with muscle heads. Kuoka Arsene prefers muscle heads so she suggested that I join the knight's course. I still have two years to choose so I still had lots of time to consider. In these two years, we would be learning the basics such as arithmetics, writing, reading, history and geography, 
These were all nearly part of the scope of the entrance examinations but the mages did not have to take the examination to enter the school and hence, in order to ensure the field was leveled, the school introduced this form of general education. There were spots of illiterate children among the mages, though it was still rare just a while ago, during magic history lesson. There was a student that had been selected by the teacher to read the text in the textbook but the female student was not able to read it fluently and had been nervous throughout. She was a cute student by the name of Charlotte, a freshman, just like me. Coincidentally, she was from a pioneering settlement in the Guayanasis region. She was not born from a family of aristocrats and thus, when she was proven to be a mage, she could only pick up the basics of reading words before enrolling in school. Hence, she entered school without studying extensively. As such, there were rumors that said she got in through connections. TN, not sure what it really means, exact sentence. Since we shared the same roots, I set my sights on making her my friend. She had olive brown hair that was tied into two pigtails, had black pupils and further compounded by her Japanese-like outfit. I could sense a deep affinity with her. My hair was blonde in color though. I wonder if I should try to talk to her, maybe we could be friends. Be but, I am nervous, would saying something like that from the start be okay? Excuse me, I would like to be your friend. That would come across as amazingly sudden I guess. If you are willing, would you like me to coach you in your studies? Saying that would obviously make me sound too arrogant. A ra, Charlotte San. You have once again lost face during lesson time? How embarrassing that you can't even read words adequately. Could you stop doing that? You will make everyone think that this year's batch of students are all idiots. Just as I was worried endlessly, Katrina Guinassis from the top most influential clique among the current first years, brushed me aside and spoke directly to Miss Charlotte. An eye-catching beauty with silver winding hair, she spoke with such intensity. The Guinassus region that is currently governed by her family was a region known for its affluence and power. The Ruby Fallen Territory was next to it and could be called its neighbor. I want to get along with her as well. Nevertheless, hold up, Miss Katrina, the child you spoke to was the very person that I had wanted to talk to. She was the very person who I had wanted to talk to after I had practiced in my head the very person who I hallucinated talking to practice after practice. Such a low move to snatch her like that. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Rai Rika Shavi 2 C5, Freshman Arc 5 I am right behind you now. Gonna have some free time now cause my leave was approved so I am gonna go full steam on TLing for now. Tune in for more soon. D also my thanks to Rigoberto for donating smile. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Rai Rikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. E.M., I am sorry. Miss Charlotte shifted her eyes down in fear and apologized. Seeing her apologize, the girl standing beside Miss Katrina knitted her brows. Charlotte San, you did not even look at Katrina Sama when she was talking, that's so rude. Her mole under her left eye. Her wavy pale brown hair, her shapely nose coupled with her bewitching voice accentuated her appeal. If I remember correctly, that attractive girl was Miss Sarum. She was also from the Guinassus territory just like Miss Katrina and Miss Charlotte. She was the daughter of a knight earl and isn't a mage, just a normal student like me. In the one in ten thousand chance that I become friends with Miss Charlotte, if it is possible. I want to become closer to her during the fifth period when we are in a different classroom. I sent an intense glance to her stealthily. That will do, Sarum San. It seems like she still has problem with the language, saying anything to her at this point is just futile. It is uncertain if she actually understands what we are saying. And then, Miss Katrina went on and on with her harsh words on Miss Charlotte. Recently, Miss Katrina has been preoccupied with Miss Charlotte. She spoke at length with her during break time. I wonder what her aim was. I think if she wanted to be her friend, she could have treated her more kindly but that's coming from me who is stuck at level 1 in making friends. Perhaps, being that aggressive was the way to go. As I pondered, my intense laser eyes were still being transmitted to them. And finally, Miss Serum caught sight of me. Kaya, 
Miss Serum flinched for some unknown reason and while holding on to Miss Katrina's arm, she seemed to be whispering to her. Next, Miss Katrina looked at me. Kaya, our eyes met one another. Her clique was at the top of the hierarchy among the freshmen. Since I made eye contact at her who has such exceptional people relations skills, maybe a friend invitation would come right now. As I continued to harbor expectations, Miss Katrina made a stoic expression and hand in hand with Miss Serum. They walked to seats further away from me. Why? While the reality that I did not even qualify for the preliminaries was hammering down in my head, I faced downwards and engaged in a staring contest with the desk. Weird. It's weird that my friend making skills were unbelievably low. Adding up my previous lifespan, I easily exceed 20 years of age and yet I have yet to figure the way to make female friends. Even when I was at Garagari village, when I was before girls, I became stiff and frozen. It appears that I somehow had become a precocious girl, and got cold feet. As I sighed, I looked at Alan who was seating beside me. He was happily chatting with Ritzkun. Even Alan had been able to make a friend and as for me. However, Alan can be considered my friend, right? He is more of a stalker rather than a friend or more like, he is totally a stalker but, strictly speaking, he can be seen as my friend. Still, I think treating friends as sloppily like how Alan does is not good. They are girls after all. I mean, up until now, to me. I have varied my way of interacting with people depending if they are of lower rank, Alan, or of higher rank, Kane Sama, Kuoka Asn, Boss, Irene San and other adults, but if it was someone of equal standing, I am unclear on how to behave and act. How does everybody make friends so easily I wonder? I regret dearly on neglecting relations with friends in my previous life, don't dwell so deeply into it. If you want some friends then just say so, it's you chance bad habit to worry endlessly to yourself and making assumptions. Why are you indecisive about it huh? After classes, I had managed to shake off Alan. Currently, I am having dinner as a family without any outsiders and opening my heart to Kuoka Asn about my predicament. She ruthlessly replied to the cowardly me. But, I am not sure if it is okay to just talk to them like that. I said while losing my nerve. Kuoka Asn let out a huge sigh. Anything is okay. Did you even try to properly greet them? Also, you could compliment their hairstyle or just talk about anything that comes to mind. Greetings ha dot dot speaking of which, the only acquaintances I have are Alan and Kane Sama B but, I don't know if I my greeting would sound strange and when I hesitate like that, I miss my timing to greet them, says me who continued to find excuses. If I really must say, so far, I have only been passively trying to make friends and it seems impossible to make any friends at this rate so I began to seriously consider Kuoka Arsene's advice to start a conversation with others. I will try to talk to them this time. Still, it is very bizarre, that it is not proceeding as per planned. Under normal circumstances, most of the girls should be charmed by me and would form infinitely long queues from my seat, waiting for their turn. That should have happened, I was all ready to deal with them one by one, and judge them each with grace and refinement. That was the plan. R, Yu Chan, what made you think like that? I mean, I took great care of my hair and made it dazzling and all. Upon seeing it, the other girls should all be flocking to me and asking me how I did it, as though they were ants pleading for sweets. Also, I am smart so they should also be asking me for help in studies swarming me just like how the flies do too. W -wa, you look down on girls who attend school. In fact, you casually made a fool of them with all those similes. Where have I gone wrong with your upbringing? Kuoka asked and grieved like the painting. The scream. He he. I was joking. I will try harder. Thank you for hearing me out, Kuoka asked. I said and laughed embarrassingly. Kuoka asked was like, this child really and stroked my head. Well, that wasn't completely a lie, but I had expected that with my potential, even if I stayed passive, I should have been able to make many friends. Eh he, I think it won't do any good to say too much but Wu Chan entered school through special circumstances, and it could be that the other children are cautious of you. I believe once they know that Wu Chan is a wonderful child, they would naturally make friends with you, so please, 
try to talk to them okay? I nodded with a great amount of effort, and enjoyed the rest of the dinner time with Kuoka Asen slowly. After being satisfied with dinner time, the sun had already set and it was about time to return to the dorm. Time to prepare for going back. I really wished we were living together. It was now a problem of time before I could visit the library and not be able to go to Kuoka Asen's place during then. I shuddered as I held this thought while opening the door at the entrance way. Are, you, going back now? Let's go together. From the dimly lit and gloomy outside, the stalking boy Alan was on standby. I quietly shut the door. What was that? An illusion. I saw something like Alan but how could it be? I I am possible. If it wasn't figure of Alan outside the door, then don't tell me. Mary San, a monster that was said to appear and vanish sporadically in my previous world. There was a chance that Mary San was delivering a letter which says, I am right at the front of your house now. To the mailbox. Still, Mary San, using a letter won't bring out that kind of realism, you know? What is it, Yu Chan? Just as soon as I opened the door, I shut the door. Ku Oka Arsen questioned my irrational actions. Oh, outside. There is a Mary San, I muttered, immediately after, from the door in question, donk donk knocking sounds came, no way, creepy, leaving the jittering me by the side, Ku Oka Arsen placed her hand on the doorknob and opened it, Ara, you are from before, you must be Alan Kun, am I right? She was assuming an any tone for the first half but quickly changed back to a male style while confirming the person at the door, hello, I am here to pick you up. Alan responded braggingly, Darn, a Alan's stalking level is dangerously high. Had I been followed? Was he waiting outside the whole time? Involuntarily, I thought about Mary San who was most renowned in the stalking realm for a fleeting moment. Rather than bothering about making friends and all, I need take care of this guy as soon as possible. I have a feeling that it would get too dangerous later. No, wait. It has already gotten the dangerous. Loading. TSRV 2C6. Freshman Arc 6 Duel and Reconciliation. Really nothing much to say. Here you go. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. The next morning, after waking up and opening up the window, a comforting breeze blew in. A breeze that blew away all encounters with yesterday's dangerous stalker. Great, a good weather. Let's settle it today. The duel. I kept all sorts of secret weapons inside my uniform skirt and crammed my leather shoulder bag full with other tools too. While it's morning, let's settle the duel today. I shouted with a lively spirit. The fifth period ended, and we met up at a rear garden found in the inner parts of the campus. There were a total of three of us, the duelists Alan and I, and the judge, Kane Sama. From here on, a divine duel shall begin. And so, this time too, the person to have his butt fall to the ground or fall to his knees would lose. Is that agreeable? Also, is it accurate for me to say that any tools and equipment can be used? Yes, I said to reaffirm the settings for the duel and explain the rules too. Alan nodded in assent. If Alan has any required items, please get them ready as well. Alan looked on at my bag that was blatantly packed full with things, and made a slight frown while nodding. From the pocket of his robe, he took out a fist-sized crystal. As he sung his chants, the crystal that he was holding on to transformed into a shield. Ho ho. A shield huh? He must have had put some thought into it. Really? He must been really considerate if he were to not bring out any sword-like weapons or the like here. Well, I'm not going easy on him though. And did another check on the contents inside my bag. For now, I shall change the position of some of the tools. All right. Now it is perfect. And now, it looks like my preparations are also completed. Can we begin? I said. After securing an upwind position in the garden, Alan seemed to conscious of his reason for defeat when he was five. He stole looks at me here and there and took up position relatively far from me. A gap of roughly ten meters opened between us. After confirming that we are both fully prepared, Kane Sama said, Start! While signaling with the wave of his hand, as soon as the signal was given, I grabbed the pepper bombs from my bag and flung them towards Alan. 
the secret weapon I had wanted to use during the battle against Ryuki-san, a cylinder made from baked soil and packed with fine pepper powder. Bearing in mind that a distance of 10 meters was child's play in the face of my throwing skills, I aimed and threw them at Alan without rest. Just in case I did not manage to hit his head, I continued to throw them with all I had. Nevertheless, Alan seemed to have foresaw that I would throw something at him and used the shield he had prepared beforehand to block whatever I threw at him. The pepper bombs merely struck his shield and did not hit Alan directly. Shattered pieces of clay scattered everywhere in front of him. Next, a cloud of sand like powder danced in the air. Alan grinned, appearing to have lowered his guard as he thought he had defended against everything. Just as he was about to chant again, I instantly thought, ah. It is over and relaxed my hand that was in my bag. Alan who had an elated expression a second ago shut his eyes and yelled, My eyes, my eyes. Gu, gu, kual cowering over. Waiting after the pepper powder cloud dispersed, I went to where Alan was and pushed him down while he was squatting. A success in getting him to fall on his butt. Alan's face reddened and looked to be in pain so I gave him water and eye medication to gargle in his throat and wash his eye. Behind me was Kane Sama who was worried for Alan who was in distress suddenly. Hey Alan, what in the world? The pepper powder that I had thrown when inhaled deeply, would cause throat pain. Also, it had gotten into his eyes I believe. It was because this place is in a downwind position. I had considered the possibility where Alan dodges the pepper bombs and moves away but as soon as they struck his shield and fell. I did not have to pull any other tricks since my very first move had him checkmated. Having this match decided so quickly made all my preparations unnecessary. There were several other mini traps laid, such as a pit where being stepped upon would cause a snake to jump out or a coal drop hidden among the weeds, not to mention the various other things in my bag that I have kept up my sleeve. Still, ending it this early was a fairly good outcome. After washing up his eye with the eye medication that I had concocted for treating the effects of the pepper bomb, Alan could somewhat open his eye. It was painful to watch his tears fall from his reddened eyes. Sorry, Alan. That was childish. Pepper bombs are dangerous huh? Please be good and copy what I did. I patted Alan on his back and made him drink medicine to help with the inflammation. Alan Sama, are you alright? Can you speak? I spoke as such but was met with vacant eyes from Alan as he looked downwards. Again, I lost right? He spoke in a hoarse voice but hearing him say something was reassuring. Trying to beat your boss him. You are still 10 years early. Is that so? You is really awesome, said Alan as he hanged his head in despondency. R. Alan is feeling more dejected than I had expected. Wasn't this not a better outcome than allowing an unfettered boy's pride be on display like our cricket chirps? Yet, I had to prevent his stalking activities, or more like it. I could no longer ignore his actions. I am glad that Alan Sama has always been concerned with me, but please, have a little more faith in me. I am, after all, Alan Sama's boss. You don't have to still, ahem, protect me every day, but I am uneasy about it. Still, I dot dot know I cannot always keep watch beside you. You don't have to be uneasy about it either. Especially so since this is the capital and the security here is superb. It's not like I am going to be kidnapped or the like. Also, I can look after myself. I replied and glared intensely at Alan who had been listlessly hanging his head down. I got it. That, if it is you, no matter what happens, you would be fine. That you would be able to solve your problems alone. I got it in my head already. Just like how you managed to live on well after being kidnapped by the bandits, even being adopted by an earl too. At this point, Alan held his tongue back. Somehow, he seemed like it was difficult for him to continue and he started mumbling. Later, he again opened his mouth while facing downwards. He lost the vigor he had a moment ago, and was dispirited yet again. When I heard that you had been kidnapped by the bandits, I thought I was the only one who could save you. I was sure you was waiting for my rescue and practiced tirelessly for that, and that was when we got news that you were safe. Still, I never once believed that you was okay until I saw you in person. I was convinced that you would be in despair, all worn out, waiting for my rescue. In the end, the actual you became prettier, and was not actually waiting for my help at all. I did not know what to do after that. Once again, 
he held back his tongue abruptly, stopping to look at me. Earlier, his eyes became moist in order to expel the pepper but it has gotten even wetter now. Ah, it must be my fault. I made someone worried for me because all I focused on was how to stop my suffering and was selfishly thinking only about myself. I wanted to apologize and was about to open my mouth but Alan stopped my lips with his hand. Wrong. I am the worst. You being in good health should have been of the greatest priority and yet, I became spiteful when I saw you in the pink of health. That was when I became aware. Dot you can be angry at me, you. I was always, hoping and expecting for a depressed and worn out you. And, that was the you which I wanted to save in a cool way. Dot dot I'm the worst huh? In the end, all I think about is myself, he said as he brought the hand that was on my lips down. Finally, large beads of tears fell from his eyes. T that is not true. Weren't you angry at me when we reunited? Wasn't that because you were genuinely concerned for me? In fact, I should be the worst since I made you worried. Anyways, having some of these corrupt thoughts should be okay shouldn't it? I wanted to lift the spirits of Alan whose spirits seemed to have fallen to the depths of hell and called out to him but Alan did not meet my eyes. Now that I think about it, I had been the same when I watched over you in school. Maybe I had wanted to prove that my hopeless self was non-existent by showing more concern to you. Nope, I am sure that is the case. All of this, was for my own sake. Stop thinking so deeply into it. Hearing everything from you, I still do not think at all that Alan is the worst. In the first place, what is that you are saying? That you reflected and understood on your own that? In the end, you were overly self-centric, isn't that great? Also, what's wrong with being narcissistic? Well, I cannot really say I can commend you on your stalking activities but, isn't it natural for everyone to hold such guilty feelings? As my words quickly lost their strength, Alan revealed a vague smile. Still, that wasn't a smile of a person who forgave himself. Please, I beg of you, please forgive yourself. If you don't, I, I would. And next, I had a sudden realization. Throughout, I have not mentioned a word for Alan. I have come this far, with my cuteness. I did not convey anything at all to him. I veiled my vulgar emotions of embarrassment and shame, and all I did was demonstrate my strength and flashiness. Who was I trying to pretend to be? Having corrupt thoughts should be okay. What is that you are saying? Isn't it natural for everyone to hold such guilty feelings? The things that I said to Alan were all the words which I had wanted to direct to myself. Moreover, I raised my voice in an attempt to win over my powerlessness. Alan was really incredible. Gazing at me even those eyes were the ones which wanted to look away, and then being able to express everything he wanted to say. Whereas for me, all I did was ready myself and blabber about all those nonsense. I was the one at wrong. I was the one that was being self-centered. Alan Sama, and the feelings of the rest, I did not contemplate them at all. I had placed my emotions at the forefront. Dot dot that I would hurt someone, I never considered them at all. In addition, I buried my egoistic self, and acted all innocently, imagining naively that we can get along well like that. I was the one who cared about no one but myself. If Alan Sama is saying that he is the worst, I should be the one that is the worst. I confessed all in one breath, and tried to maintain eye contact with Alan but my vision grew blurry and my eyes could not focus. All of a sudden, someone from behind ran straight and collided with my back. Timidly, I moved over and noticed that that was Kane Sama. Ah, I had carelessly forgotten about his existence. Kane Sama face turned red, tears bursting forth from his eyes while he embraced both Alan and I. Oh right. These two are brothers. The way their faces are hinged with red were very similar. My mind drifted to the trivialities. Alan, you. I dot dot no. When I was not around, both of you have grown so honestly. Thank you, thank you. Out of nowhere, Kane Sama broke into tears as he expressed his magnificent gratitude. He proceeded to face both of us and hug us. Alan and you, it is all right. Just as I have previously said, the thing known as human progress into adulthood through mutually hurting one another. Each and every time we hurt ourselves and hurt others, if we stood still and stopped advancing, we would not be able to grow at all. The two of you are good kids, I can guarantee that. Now, wipe off your tears on my chest, and reconcile with one another. K.
Kane Sama voiced out as tears streamed down from his cheeks. Be before that, Kane Sama offered us himself for us to dry our tears with our tears and, additionally, our mucus all over him. Won't that lay waste to the Ikerman? Was Kane Sama always like that? I was probably too tense earlier but being confused by my first time seeing Kane Sama being emotional, I had become more relaxed and could not help but find the sweet Kane Sama, face filled with tears and mucus, amusing. I feel bad for Kane Sama but, I seem to have accidentally let out a, bu fu u, giggle. However, breaking into laughter here would definitely be seen as being unable to read the mood so I stifled the laugh as much as I could. At the same time, I tried to take a glimpse at Alan, who was being embraced by Kane Sama. Alan was looking up at Kane Sama with a flabbergasted look. Our eyes met in the midst of it. Something is telling me inside my chest, that Alan is equally as refreshed and clear-headed like how I am right now. By verbalizing my confession, I might have been trying to seek out forgiveness. Releasing the cap over my sinful self and inferior self, I was able to apologize and cleanse myself by doing so. At the very end, even that might have been an act of selfishness to reinvigorate myself. Still, I am glad I was able to say it. You, even you had regrets and cried as I did. It looks like I am not the only kid here. Though Kane Sama was bawling his eyes out, I was still able to clearly hear Alan's voice due to the small distance between us. That was obvious. Even I am a human. Because I remember my previous life, I imagined that I was somewhat of an adult already but perhaps, I died in my previous life not knowing anything at all. I had never felt this feeling before in my previous life. Alan and I both narrowed our eyes and laughed. By narrowing our eyes, more tears fell from our eyes but right next to us was the chest that had been loaned to us for wiping. No worries there. And that was how we were able to reconcile with one another. Loading TSRV 2C7, Freshman Arc 7A lesson where only praises are sung for mages. Enjoy smile sorry it's a short chapter so I might work on chapter 8 pretty soon. Loading. Tensaishu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. A splendid morning. Did it represent a morning of aspirations? Yesterday's misgivings with Alan melted away as I stepped out of the dormitory all buoyant and cheerfully. The same as always, Alan had planted himself near the dormitory. Shouldn't the stalking have stopped? A hey Alan Sama. How do you do? I was sure I told you that I did not need an escort. Surely waiting for you here is okay, you didn't tell me to not do this anyways, he said, and walked to my side nonchalantly. After reconciling our differences and tidying up things yesterday, I was sure we made clear that I was the boss and he was the henchman. My things were my things whereas his stuff were also mine too. Whatever I said was absolute, these were the teachings I had conveyed. <laughs> Maybe as my underling. Welcoming the boss was a natural course of action, it's not like I will always be leaving at the same time, so it is best not to wait for me in front of the girl's dorm. The other elder sisters will be casting weird looks at you too. I got it. That was immediate response from him but did he really get it? Speaking of which, Mew, are you still using the dagger I gave you back then? R, Alan's dagger is it? It was an essential component for the flourishing of the wild boar fats extraction business. Wait up. It should be in my room. There were sword lessons in the knight's course anyways so it wasn't like it was an offense to bring a sword into the dorm. Among the seniors who were in the knights, some of them carried swords around with them. As a basic rule, carrying swords is forbidden but if permission has been obtained, it was considered okay under the school rules. Still. There were hardly any ladies who were fond of carrying swords around them in school. I too had left my dagger in my room. The exception was that I had concealed Kawamayuaniki's dagger underneath my skirt, in case of any emergencies. I did not obtain permission for it but I had made sure to never let it be found out so it should all right. That being said, having the god-killing sword found on me would be a very vexing affair for me so it was my personal secret that I carried it around in the school campus. I was afraid of leaving it out of sight and thus, preferred to have it right next to my skin while I was moving around. I have improved on my making skills. I will try to make something else this time. Alan made a smile as he suggested. I responded with, is that so? 
and gave a vague smile. A sword that would crumble under magic? Al an innocent smile surely did not contain any other intentions though, but we learned that during magic history lesson 2. When the world was attacked by evil monsters, the noble magicians created holy swords with their magic, and ordinary humans who were granted these swords acquired hero-like strength. With their newfound powers, they were able to mow down the evil monsters. It was mainly about the magicians trusting humans and leaving their backs to them while the people swore their allegiance to the magicians. In the later stages of the tale, when they were subjugating the last boss, their holy swords apparently broke, and once again, the noble magicians bestowed them with power. It was interesting that it was like an exhilarating adventurer's story as the heroes crushed the evil monsters with a holy sword, renewed. Like tension enveloping them. And from this adventurer's tale, came the birth of mages creating swords and bestowing them to humans as a token of trust. However, isn't it strange that those swords can be erased by magic here? Yeah? Whenever the mages feel like it, they could remove the existence of the sword here? Yeah? Receiving such a sword, how can this be called a story of trust? The first period and fifth period class was magic history every day. It was a lesson about praising the mages from start to end, and since I hold memories from my past life, it felt completely about brainwashing us to me. To the other children, it was a lesson to hear about fun stories and was rather popular among them. From the beginning, when I heard from Kawamayu Anaki that these swords can be erased by magic, my reaction was that mages were crazy scary and I don't want to get involved with them. In any case, I want to learn about the real history of this world, what path this world has trodden on, how the people who live in this world feel about it, and where this world is headed for. You? What are you in a daze for? We have already reached the auditorium. Shall we sit over there for today? What? I wasn't in a daze right now. I am thinking of something really complex and important, and in a stylish way to boot, tch, I clicked my tongue being unable to put up with it and as I turned away to ignore Alan, Miss Charlotte appeared in corner of my eye, a spirit user of commoner origins, was she reviewing vocabulary, she seemed to be sinking her teeth at the desk with all her might, alone too, Alan Sama, I am planning to sit somewhere else, so following me here is good enough, well then, farewell. Turning away from Alan who seemed to be in a fit and ignoring him, I went towards where Miss Charlotte was. I walked near to her seat and she lifted her face at me with surprise. How do you do? Miss Charlotte, may I have this seat beside you? R. Why yes. Why you may. Do so. Miss Charlotte gladly gave her consent while stuttering. I was en nervous. I could feel my heart beating everywhere as I sat down while maintaining my elegance. Alan chased me from behind and asked someone else in a complaining manner, is this seat taken? Hence, Alan shrewdly secured the seat behind me. Hey, I thought I banned stalking activities, wasn't the words of the boss absolute. Once this lesson is over, I would definitely need to roast him thoroughly. Accidentally, my eyes flitted over to Miss Charlotte's direction and as I have seen earlier, she was indeed intensely reading from the textbook and learning words from it a studious worker eh? Miss Charlotte, feel free to ask me anything if you have any doubts about anything. I presented a smile trying to convey my kind intentions as far as possible. Miss Charlotte replied with an equally brilliant smile back at me, or, oh, so cute. Yes, thank you very much. Um, there is something I wish to quickly clarify. Miss Charlotte started to ask the questions that she wasn't able to ask when she was studying alone. I was considering what else can be done if we reached the limits of our conversation, since it was basically all about study but in the end, after we paused from our conversation, there was no sense of awkwardness at all. The morning lessons were over, and it was finally the noon break that everyone was on everyone's mind. We talked quite a bit before noon break so that technically means that Miss Charlotte and I are friends now right? Comma as I was in great excitement. I couldn't stop my rough breathing as I spoke to Miss Charlotte. Miss Charlotte, it is the afternoon break time, if it is okay with you, want to go together? I asked in an extraordinary smile but Miss Charlotte, wore an extremely despondent expression. Sorry, you Sama. I have other plans for noon time, Katrina Sama is calling for me. W what you say, 
you have an appointment made before them. What is that? Does that mean all the fun we had till now, was all for naught? Were you playing with me? Somehow or another, I suppressed the rumbles inside me. I see, that is unfortunate. Let's have a meal together next time then. It's not like I really wanted so dash. I am actually perfectly fine. I tried to give such an impression by reacting as such. And so, I went for lunch with Mr. Allen who was behind me. Uck. Still, no way I'll lose. Loading. TSRV 2C8. Freshman Arc 8 Fury of Allen. Thank you Tracy for the donation. I should be working on our Abrus Records chapter next smile. Loading. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com. It became such that I had lunch at the cafeteria with Alan as well as Ritzkun. For now, I tried knocking the words into Alan, telling him to stop stalking me but he didn't seem to understand and lightly replied, Un, all right all right. I still worry. Hey, you. You don't have to use Sama when addressing me. Call me as you like. Alan started speaking proudly again even after taking a tongue lashing from his boss. <laughs> Who is this henchman? Change please. Which reminds me, I still have the habit of including Sama from the days of being a maid. Furthermore, this was essentially an aristocratic school so most of the girls and boys here do not pay any attention when being addressed with Sama. However, Fellow children who were on good terms with one another often dropped that way of calling, and preferred to address one another by nicknames instead. He must be longing for that I suppose. Ah, I see. I understand. If anything is fine then Brat should be okay right? No way. Why do you have to use such a nasty name? Alan vetoed it with full force. Eh? I can't. Really? Then, how about henchman? No, such a demanding henchman. Ha. Huh. That leaves me with no choice, then will Alan kiddo do? You obviously won't need that kiddo, just don't drop the honorifics when referring to me, you got that, what's with that, if you wanted me to do that, you should said so from the very start, and you did tell me to call you whatever I wanted to, okay, okay, Alan, is that fine, w why do you sound so reluctant, Alan complaining actually looks quite amusing, just as I prepared my reply to Alan, Ritzkun spoke up. Somehow, it feels like both of you have changed. Something happened yesterday. The innocent and naive Ritzkun was unusually sharp today. Yes, yesterday there was a big reconciliation event. Ah, yesterday. Alan murmured softly and sent a meaningful look in my direction. Yesterday, you and I ascended up the stairs of adulthood. Ak, ak. I choked on my potato soup. What kind of metaphor are you using? Are you doing that on purpose? Just look at Ritzkun. His face has gone all red. Please do not use such a weird way of describing things. We simply had a fight and we made up after that. W what? Was that it? I misunderstood because of Alan's abstract explanation. Having managed to clear the misunderstanding for the young innocent boy, I heaved a sigh of relief. Playing with a young boy with a pure heart like that isn't good, Alan. However, the Alan in question did not seem to understand as he tilted his head. Weird misunderstanding? What misunderstanding? Eh? Do I have to spell it out? Or are you really do this on purpose? Are you the type to gain satisfaction in making cute children say disgusting stuff? I, I also do not understand. I just heard some things from my elder brother. The young innocent boy's face went all red again as he blurted out in a panic. No. Let's stop here. Please stop going further into this topic. Ritzkun, stay. Alan understood less and less of what Ritzkun was talking about, but appeared to be more and more interested. From the way Alan was acting, I guess he wasn't trying to sexually harass me intentionally, he really has no idea. Speaking of which, I heard from Oka Asama that there was this education for males in order to become adults. Is that it? Oi, what is wrong with you today? So you are able to read the atmosphere today huh? If we continue expanding on this topic, I am afraid this would be forever be marked in black for Alan one day. I think it was called sexual education. In the past, Ryu was designated to help me with that education but Ryu disappeared and Oka Asama became troubled. Was yesterday's turn of events considered sexual education? Am I right? Alan flashed his all-proud grin as he looked at me. I see, so you really want to make this black history happen. 
I got it wrong. Sexual education is a completely different thing. Later, it isn't such a good thing to continue discussion about this. You will feel embarrassed about it one day. Look, Ritzkan already looks like a boiled octopus. Embarrassment? Why? But, it was true that yesterday's events, if it wasn't you and I, we wouldn't have been able to overcome it. When you disappeared and Claude Ajayzama went in search for you, he went to buy another woman from a human employment agency and Oka Asama said that the job would be left to her. Is that it? Oh, more realities about Claude Sand that I do not want to hear about. In this country, the so-called human employment agency was a place where humans were traded for cash. In short, a slave firm. Hearing about this slave trading business did irk me but the ethics in this world and my previous world weren't the same. People in this world do not get upset on matters like this. This kind of business was completely natural in big cities like the royal capital. It wasn't the kind of illegal store where the owners can be incriminated for it, it was an entirely legal business. I see, did they come to the capital thinking that I might have been sold to such a place by the bandit head honcho? Despite having been cared for by Claude San and causing him to worry for me, upon hearing that he bought a woman, I frankly hope that he forgives me for not saying sorry. I know for a fact that he visited such places to find me but despite knowing so, I hope he doesn't get angry at the narrow-minded me. B by the way, how old is the woman that Claude San bought? This was important, it would shed light on his paedophilia. If I remember correctly, they were 14, 17 and 23 years old. I hear they are helping Claude Ogerson with work. What? There were more than one of them. And here I thought there was only one. TN. Note that in Japanese plurality has to be inferred by the listener unless they are mentioned like now. Mr. Claude, while he didn't buy children, he still chose young women. I will definitely not be needed in such an unbelievable harem. But since there weren't any children with him, should I feel happy that he was healthy, comma, dot, 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 wait. There was this 14-year-old so doesn't that make him hopeless? She would still be considered a minor by this world's standards. Is that so? Well. When the time comes, someone from that bunch will be responsible for your education, so let's put an end to this discussion. I said so to put an end to this topic. End of block 1.